Epictetus. Translated by W. A. Oldfather. Book 1. Arian to Lucius Gellius, greeting, I have not composed these words of Epictetus as one might be said to compose books of this kind, nor have I of my own act published them to the world, indeed, I acknowledge that I have not composed them at all. But whatever I heard him say I used to write down, word for word, as best I could, endeavouring to preserve it as a memorial, for my own future use, of his way of thinking and the frankness of his speech. They are, accordingly, as you might expect, such remarks as one man might make offhand to another, not such as he would compose for men to read in after time. This being their character, they have fallen, I know not how, without my will or knowledge, into the hands of men. Yet to me it is a matter of small concern if I shall be thought incapable of composing a work, and to Epictetus of no concern at all if anyone shall despise his words. Seeing that even when he uttered them he was clearly aiming at nothing else but to incite the minds of his hearers to the best things. If, now, these words of his should produce that same effect, they would have, I think, just that success which the words of the philosophers ought to have, but if not, let those who read them be assured of this, that when Epictetus himself spoke them, the hearer could not help but feel exactly what Epictetus wanted him to feel. If, however, the words by themselves do not produce this effect, perhaps I am at fault, or else, perhaps, it cannot well be otherwise. Farewell. Chapter 1. Of the things which are under our control and not under our control. Among the arts and faculties in general you will find none that is self-contemplative, and therefore none that is either self-approving or self-disapproving. How far does the art of grammar possess the power of contemplation? Only so far as to pass judgment upon what is written. How far the art of music? Only so far as to pass judgment upon the melody. Does either of them, then, contemplate itself? Not at all. But if you are writing to a friend and are at a loss as to what to write, the art of grammar will tell you, yet whether or no you are to write to your friend at all, the art of grammar will not tell. The same holds true of the art of music with regard to melodies, but whether you are at this moment to sing and play on the lyre. Or neither sing nor play. It will not tell. What art or faculty, then, will tell? That one which contemplates both itself and everything else. And what is this? The reasoning faculty, for this is the only one we have inherited which will take knowledge both of itself what it is, and of what it is capable, and how valuable a gift it is to us and likewise of all the other faculties. For what else is it that tells us gold is beautiful? For the gold itself does not tell us. Clearly it is the faculty which makes use of external impressions. What else judges with discernment the art of music, the art of grammar, the other arts and faculties, passing judgment upon their uses and pointing out the seasonable occasions for their use? Nothing else does. As was fitting, therefore, the gods have put under our control only the most excellent faculty of all and that which dominates the rest, namely, the power to make correct use of external impressions. But all the others they have not put under our control. Was it indeed because they would not? I for one think that had they been able they would have entrusted us with the others also, but they were quite unable to do that. For since we are upon earth and trammeled by an earthy body and by earthy associates, how was it possible that, in respect of them, we should not be hampered by external things? But what says Zeus? Epictetus, had it been possible I should have made both this paltry body and this small estate of thine free and unhampered. But as it is let it not escape thee this body is not thine own, but only clay cunningly compounded. Yet since I could not give thee this, we have given thee a certain portion of ourself, this faculty of choice and refusal, of desire and aversion, or, in a word, the faculty which makes use of external impressions, if thou care for this and place all that thou hast therein, thou shalt never be thwarted, never hampered, shalt not groan, shalt not blame, shalt not flatter any man. What then? Are these things small in thy sight? Far be it from me. Art thou, then, content with them? I pray the gods I may be. But now, although it is in our power to care for one thing only and devote ourselves to but one, we choose rather to care for many things, and to be tied fast to many, even to our body and our estate and brother and friend and child and slave. Wherefore, being tied fast to many things, we are burdened and dragged down by them. That is why, if the weather keeps us from sailing, we sit down and fidget and keep constantly peering about. What wind is blowing? We ask. Boreas. What have we to do with it? When will Zephyrus blow? When it pleases, good sir, or rather when Aeolus pleases. For God has not made you steward of the winds, but Aeolus. 
What then? We must make the best of what is under our control, and take the rest as its nature is. How, then, is its nature? As God wills. Must I, then, be the only one to be beheaded now? Why, did you want everybody to be beheaded for your consolation? Are you not willing to stretch out your neck as did a certain Lateranus at Rome, when Nero ordered him to be beheaded? For he stretched out his neck and received the blow, but, as it was a feeble one, he shrank back for an instant, and then stretched out his neck again. Yes, and before that, when Epaphroditus, a freedman of Nero, approached a certain man and asked about the ground of his offence, he answered, If I wish anything, I will speak to your master. What aid, then, must we have ready at hand in such circumstances? Why? What else than the knowledge of what is mine, and what is not mine, and what is permitted me, and what is not permitted me? I must die, must I, then, die groaning too? I must be fettered, and wailing too? I must go into exile, does anyone, then, keep me from going with a smile and cheerful and serene? Tell your secrets. I say not a word, for this is under my control. But I will fetter you. What is that you say, man? Fetter me? My leg you will fetter, but my moral purpose not even Zeus himself has power to overcome. I will throw you into prison. My paltry body, rather. I will behead you. Well, when did I ever tell you that mine was the only neck that could not be severed? These are the lessons that philosophers ought to rehearse, these they ought to write down daily, in these they ought to exercise themselves. Thrasia used to say, I would rather be killed today than banished tomorrow. What, then, did Rufus say to him? If you choose death as the heavier of two misfortunes, what folly of choice? But if as the lighter, who has given you the choice? Are you not willing to practice contentment with what has been given you? Wherefore, what was it that Agrippinus used to remark? I am not standing in my own way. Word was brought him, your case is being tried in the Senate. Good luck betide. But it is the fifth hour now, he was in the habit of taking his exercise and then a cold bath at that hour, let us be off and take our exercise. After he had finished his exercise someone came and told him, you have been condemned. To exile, says he, or to death. To exile. What about my property? It has not been confiscated. Well, then, let us go to Arisha and take our lunch there. This is what it means to have rehearsed the lessons one ought to rehearse, to have set desire and aversion free from every hindrance and made them proof against chance. I must die. If forthwith, I die, and if a little later, I will take lunch now, since the hour for lunch has come, and afterwards I will die at the appointed time. How? As becomes the man who is giving back that which was another's. Chapter 2. How may a man preserve his proper character upon every occasion? To the rational being only the irrational is unendurable, but the rational is endurable. Blows are not by nature unendurable. How so? Observe how, Lacedaemonians take a scourging once they have learned that it is rational. But is it not unendurable to be hanged? Hardly, at all events whenever a man feels that it is rational he goes and hangs himself. In short, if we observe, we shall find mankind distressed by nothing so much as by the irrational, and again attracted to nothing so much as to the rational. Now it so happens that the rational and the irrational are different for different persons, precisely as good and evil, and the profitable and the unprofitable, are different for different persons. It is for this reason especially that we need education, so as to learn how, in conformity with nature, to adapt to specific instances our preconceived idea of what is rational and what is irrational. But for determining the rational and the irrational, we employ not only our estimates of the value of external things, but also the criterion of that which is in keeping with one's own character. For to one man it is reasonable to hold a chamber pot for another, since he considers only that, if he does not hold it, he will get a beating and will not get food. Whereas, if he does hold it, nothing harsh or painful will be done to him, but some other man feels that it is not merely unendurable to hold such a pot himself, but even to tolerate another's doing so. If you ask me, then, shall I hold the pot or not? I will tell you that to get food is of greater value than not to get it, and to be flayed is of greater detriment than not to be, so that if you measure your interests by these standards, go and hold the pot. Yes, but it would be unworthy of me. That is an additional consideration, which you, and not I, must introduce into the question. For you are the one that knows yourself, how much you are worth in your own eyes and at what price you sell yourself. 
For different men sell themselves at different prices. Wherefore, when Florus was debating whether he should enter Nero's festival, so as to make some personal contribution to it, Agrippina said to him, Enter. And when Florus asked, Why do you not enter yourself? He replied, I? Why, I do not even raise the question. For when a man once stoops to the consideration of such questions, I mean to estimating the value of externals, and calculates them one by one, he comes very close to those who have forgotten their own proper character. Come, what is this you ask me? Is death or life preferable? I answer, life. Pain or pleasure? I answer, pleasure. But unless I take a part in the tragedy I shall be beheaded. Go, then, and take a part, but I will not take a part. Why not? Because you regard yourself as but a single thread of all that go to make up the garment. What follows, then? This, that you ought to take thought how you may resemble all other men, precisely as even the single thread wants to have no point of superiority in comparison with the other threads. But I want to be the red, that small and brilliant portion which causes the rest to appear comely and beautiful. Why, then? Do you say to me? Be like the majority of people? And if I do that, how shall I any longer be the red? This is what Helvidius Priscus also saw, and, having seen, did. When Vespasian sent him word not to attend a meeting of the Senate, he answered, It is in your power not to allow me to be a member of the Senate, but so long as I am one I must attend its meetings. Very well then, but when you attend, hold your peace. Do not ask for my opinion and I will hold my peace. But I must ask for your opinion. And I must answer what seems to me right. But if you speak, I shall put you to death. Well, when did I ever tell you that I was immortal? You will do your part and I mine. It is yours to put me to death, mine to die without a tremor, yours to banish, mine to leave without sorrow. What good, then, did Priscus do, who was but a single individual? And what good does the red do the mantle? What else than that it stands out conspicuous in it as red? And is displayed as a goodly example to the rest. But had Caesar told another man in such circumstances not to attend the meetings of the Senate, he would have said, I thank you for excusing me. A man like that Caesar would not even have tried to keep from attending, but would have known that he would either sit like a jug. Or, if he spoke, would say what he knew Caesar wanted said, and would pile up any amount more on the top of it. In like manner also a certain athlete acted, who was in danger of dying unless his private parts were amputated. His brother, and he was a philosopher, came to him and said, Well, brother, what are you going to do? Are we going to cut off this member, and step forth once more into the gymnasium? He would not submit, but hardened his heart and died. And as someone asked, how did he do this? As an athlete, or as a philosopher? As a man, replied Epictetus, and as a man who had been proclaimed at the Olympic Games and had striven in them, who had been at home in such places, and had not merely been rubbed down with oil in Beto's wrestling school. But another would have had even his neck cut off, if he could have lived without his neck. This is what we mean by regard for one's proper character, and such is its strength with those who in their deliberations habitually make it a personal contribution. Come then. Epictetus, shave off your beard. If I am a philosopher, I answer, I will not shave it off, but I will take off your neck. If that will do you any good, take it off. Someone inquired, how, then, shall each of us become aware of what is appropriate to his own proper character? How comes it, replied he, that when the lion charges, the bull alone is aware of his own prowess and rushes forward to defend the whole herd? Or is it clear that with the possession of the prowess comes immediately the consciousness of it also? And so, among us too, whoever has such prowess will not be unaware of it. Yet a bull does not become a bull all at once, any more than a man becomes noble, but a man must undergo a winter training, he must prepare himself and must not plunge recklessly into what is inappropriate for him. Only consider at what price you sell your freedom of will. If you must sell it, man, at least do not sell it cheap. But the great and preeminent deed, perhaps, befits others. Socrates and men of his stamp. Why then? Pray, if we are endowed by nature for such greatness, do not all men, or many, become like him? What, do all horses become swift, all dogs keen to follow the scent? What then? Because I have no natural gifts, shall I on that account give up my discipline? Far be it from me. Epictetus will not be better than Socrates, but if only I am not worse, that suffices me. 
for I shall not be a Milo, either, and yet I do not neglect my body, nor a Croesus, and yet I do not neglect my property, nor, in a word, is there any other field in which we give up the appropriate discipline merely from despair of attaining the highest. Chapter 3. From the thesis that God is the father of mankind how may one proceed to the consequences? If a man could only subscribe heart and soul, as he ought, to this doctrine, that we are all primarily begotten of God, and that God is the father of men as well as of gods, I think that he will entertain no ignoble or mean thought about himself. Yet, if Caesar adopts you no one will be able to endure your conceit, but if you know that you are a son of Zeus, will you not be elated? As it is, however, we are not, but inasmuch as these two elements were commingled in our begetting, on the one hand the body, which we have in common with the brutes, and, on the other, reason and intelligence, which we have in common with the gods, some of us incline toward the former relationship, which is unblessed by fortune and is mortal, and only a few toward that which is divine and blessed. Since, then, it is inevitable that every man, whoever he be, should deal with each thing according to the opinion which he forms about it, these few, who think that by their birth they are called to fidelity, to self-respect, and to unerring judgment in the use of external impressions, cherish no mean or ignoble thoughts about themselves, whereas the multitude do quite the opposite. For what am I? A miserable, paltry man. Say they. And, lo, my wretched. Paltry flesh. Wretched indeed but you have also something better than your paltry flesh. Why then abandon that and cleave to this? It is because of this kinship with the flesh that those of us who incline toward it become like wolves, faithless and treacherous and hurtful, and others like lions, wild and savage and untamed, but most of us become foxes, that is to say, rascals of the animal kingdom. For what else is a slanderous and malicious man but a fox, or something even more rascally and degraded? Take heed, therefore, and beware that you become not one of these rascally creatures. Chapter 4. Of Progress. He who is making progress, having learned of the philosophers that desire is for things good and aversion is toward things evil, and having also learned that serenity and calm are not attained by a man save as he succeeds in securing the objects of desire and as he avoids encountering the objects of aversion such a one has utterly excluded desire from himself, or else deferred it to another time and feels aversion only toward the things which involve freedom of choice. For if he avoids anything that is not a matter of free choice, he knows that some time he will encounter something in spite of his aversion to it, and will come to grief. Now if it is virtue that holds out the promise thus to create happiness and calm and serenity, then assuredly progress toward virtue is progress toward each of these states of mind. For it is always true that whatsoever the goal toward which perfection in anything definitely leads, progress is an approach thereto. How comes it, then, that we acknowledge virtue to be a thing of this sort, and yet seek progress and make a display of it in other things? What is the work of virtue? Serenity. Who, then, is making progress? The man who has read many treatises of Chrysippus? What, is virtue no more than this to have gained a knowledge of Chrysippus? For if it is this, progress is confessedly nothing else than a knowledge of many of the works of Chrysippus. But now, while acknowledging that virtue produces one thing. We are declaring that the approach to virtue, which is progress, produces something else. So and so, says someone, is already able to read Chrysippus all by himself. It is fine headway, by the gods, that you are making, man. Great progress this. Why do you mock him? And why do you try to divert him from the consciousness of his own shortcomings? Are you not willing to show him the work of virtue, that he may learn where to look for his progress? Look for it there, wretch, where your work lies. And where is your work? In desire and aversion, that you may not miss what you desire and encounter what you would avoid, in choice and in refusal, that you may commit no fault therein, in giving and withholding assent of judgment, that you may not be deceived. But first come the first and most necessary points. Yet if you are in a state of fear and grief when you seek to be proof against encountering what you would avoid, how, pray, are you making progress? Do you yourself show me? Therefore, your own progress in matters like the following. Suppose, for example, that in talking to an athlete I said, show me your shoulders, and then he answered, look at my jumping weights. Go to, you and your jumping weights. What I want to see is the effect of the jumping weights. Take the treatise upon choice and see how I have mastered it. It is not that I am looking into, you slave, but how you act in your choices and refusals, your desires and aversions, 
how you go at things, and apply yourself to them, and prepare yourself, whether you are acting in harmony with nature therein, or out of harmony with it. For if you are acting in harmony, show me that, and I will tell you that you are making progress, but if out of harmony, begone, and do not confine yourself to expounding your books, but go and write some of the same kind yourself. And what will you gain thereby? Do you not know that the whole book costs only five denarii? Is the expounder of it, then, think you, worth more than five denarii? And so never look for your work in one place and your progress in another. Where, then, is progress? If any man among you, withdrawing from external things, has turned his attention to the question of his own moral purpose, cultivating and perfecting it so as to make it finally harmonious with nature, elevated, free, unhindered, untrammeled, faithful, and honourable, and if he has learned that he who craves or shuns the things that are not under his control can be neither faithful nor free, but must himself of necessity be changed and tossed to and fro with them, and must end by subordinating himself to others, those, namely, who are able to procure or prevent these things that he craves or shuns, and if, finally, when he rises in the morning he proceeds to keep and observe all this that he has learned, if he bathes as a faithful man, eats as a self-respecting man. Similarly, whatever the subject matter may be with which he has to deal, putting into practice his guiding principles, as the runner does when he applies the principles of running, and the voice trainer when he applies the principles of voice training. This is the man who in all truth is making progress, and the man who has not travelled at random is this one. But if he has striven merely to attain the state which he finds in his books and works only at that, and has made that the goal of his travels, I bid him go home at once and not neglect his concerns there, since the goal to which he has travelled is nothing, but not so that other goal to study how a man may rid his life of sorrows and lamentations, and of such cries as woe is me. And wretch that I am! and of misfortune and failure, and to learn the meaning of death, exile, prison, hemlock, that he may be able to say in prison, dear Crito, if so it pleases the gods, so be it, rather than, alas, poor me, an old man, it is for this that I have kept my grey hairs. Who says such things? Do you think that I will name you some man held in small esteem and of low degree? Does not Priam say it? Does not Oedipus? Nay more. All kings say it. For what are tragedies but the portrayal in tragic verse of the sufferings of men who have admired things external? If indeed one had to be deceived into learning that among things external and independent of our free choice none concerns us, I, for my part, should consent to a deception which would result in my living thereafter serenely and without turmoil, but as for you, you will yourself see to your own preference. What, then, does Chrysippus furnish us? that you may know, he says, that these things are not false from which serenity arises and tranquility comes to us, take my books and you shall know how conformable and harmonious with nature are the things which render me tranquil. Oh the great good fortune! Oh the great benefactor who points the way! To Triptolemus, indeed, all men have established shrines and altars, because he gave us as food the fruits of cultivation, but to him who has discovered, and brought to light, and imparted to all men the truth which deals, not with mere life, but with a good life. Who among you has for that set up an altar in his honour, or dedicated a temple or a statue, or bows down to God in gratitude for him? But because the gods have given us the vine or wheat, for that do we make sacrifice, and yet because they have brought forth such a fruit in a human mind, whereby they purpose to show us the truth touching happiness, shall we fail to render thanks unto God for this? Chapter 5. Against the Academics. If a man, says Epictetus, resists truths that are all too evident, in opposing him it is not easy to find an argument by which one may cause him to change his opinion. The reason for this is neither the man's ability nor the teacher's weakness, nay. When a man who has been trapped in an argument hardens to stone, how shall one any longer deal with him by argument? Now there are two kinds of petrifaction, one is the petrifaction of the intellect, the other of the sense of shame, when a man stands in array, prepared neither to assent to manifest truths nor to leave the fighting line. Most of us dread the deadening of the body and would resort to all means so as to avoid falling into such a state, but about the deadening of the soul we care not at all. Indeed, by Zeus, even in the case of the soul itself, if a man be in such a state that he cannot follow an argument step by step, or even understand one, we regard him too as being in a bad way, but if a man's sense of shame and self-respect be deadened, this we go so far as to call strength of character. Do your senses tell you that you are awake? No, he answers, any more than they do when in dreams I have the impression that I am awake. Is there, then, no difference between these two impressions? 
None. Can I argue with this man any longer? And what cautery or lancet shall I apply to him, to make him realize that he is deadened? He does realize it, but pretends that he does not, he is even worse than a corpse. One man does not notice the contradiction he is in a bad way, another man notices it, indeed, but is not moved and does not improve he is in a still worse state. His self-respect and sense of shame have been lopped off, and his reasoning faculty has been I will not say cut away, but brutalized. Am I to call this strength of character? Far from it, unless I am so to describe the strength that lewd fellows have, which enables them to say and do in public anything that comes into their heads. Chapter 6 of providence. From everything that happens in the universe it is easy for a man to find occasion to praise providence. If he has within himself these two qualities, the faculty of taking a comprehensive view of what has happened in each individual instance. And the sense of gratitude. Otherwise, one man will not see the usefulness of what has happened, and another, even if he does see it, will not be grateful therefore. If God had made colors, but had not made the faculty of seeing them, of what good had it been? None at all. But, conversely, if he had made the faculty, but in making objects, had made them incapable of falling under the faculty of vision, in that case also of what good had it been? None at all. What then, if he had even made both of these, but had not made light? Even thus it would have been of no use. Who is it, then, that has fitted this to that and that to this? And who is it that has fitted the sword to the scabbard, and the scabbard to the sword? No one? Assuredly from the very structure of all made objects we are accustomed to prove that the work is certainly the product of some artificer, and has not been constructed at random. Does, then, every such work reveal its artificer, but do visible objects and vision and light not reveal him? And the male and the female, and the passion of each for intercourse with the other, and the faculty which makes use of the organs which have been constructed for this purpose, do these things not reveal their artificer either? Well, admit it for these things, but the marvellous constitution of the intellect whereby, when we meet with sensible objects, we do not merely have their forms impressed upon us, but also make a selection from among them, and subtract and add, and make these various combinations by using them. Yes. And, by Zeus. Pass from some things to certain others which are in a manner related to them is not even all this sufficient to stir our friends and induce them not to leave the artificer out of account? Else let them explain to us what it is that produces each of these results, or how it is possible that objects so wonderful and so worm-like should come into being at random and spontaneously. What then? Is it in the case of man alone that these things occur? You will, indeed, find many things in man only, things of which the rational animal had a peculiar need, but you will also find many possessed by us in common with the irrational animals. Do they also, then, understand what happens? No. For use is one thing, and understanding another. God had need of the animals in that they make use of external impressions, and of us in that we understand the use of external impressions. And so for them it is sufficient to eat and drink and rest and procreate. And whatever else of the things within their own province the animals severally do, while for us. To whom he has made the additional gift of the faculty of understanding, these things are no longer sufficient, but unless we act appropriately, and methodically, and in conformity each with his own nature and constitution, we shall no longer achieve our own ends. For of beings whose constitutions are different, the works and the ends are likewise different. So for the being whose constitution is adapted to use only, mere use is sufficient, but where a being has also the faculty of understanding the use, unless the principle of propriety be added, he will never attain his end. What then? Each of the animals God constitutes, one to be eaten, another to serve in farming, another to produce cheese, and yet another for some other similar use, to perform these functions what need have they to understand external impressions and to be able to differentiate between them? But God has brought man into the world to be a spectator of himself and of his works. And not merely a spectator. But also an interpreter. Wherefore, it is shameful for man to begin and end just where the irrational animals do, he should rather begin where they do, but end where nature has ended in dealing with us. Now she did not end until she reached contemplation and understanding and a manner of life harmonious with nature. Take heed, therefore, lest you die without ever having been spectators of these things. But you travel to Olympia to behold the work of Phadias, and each of you regards it as a misfortune to die without seeing such sights, yet when there is no need to travel at all, but where Zeus is already, and is present in his works, will you not yearn to behold these works and know them? 
Will you decline, therefore, to perceive either who you are, or for what you have been born, or what that purpose is for which you have received sight? But some unpleasant and hard things happen in life. And do they not happen at Olympia? Do you not swelter? Are you not cramped and crowded? Do you not bathe with discomfort? Are you not drenched whenever it rains? Do you not have your fill of tumult and shouting and other annoyances? But I fancy that you hear and endure all this by balancing it off against the memorable character of the spectacle. Come, have you not received faculties that enable you to bear whatever happens? Have you not received magnanimity? Have you not received courage? Have you not received endurance? And what care I longer for anything that may happen, if I be magnanimous? What shall perturb me, or trouble me, or seem grievous to me? Shall I fail to use my faculty to that end for which I have received it, but grieve and lament over events that occur? Yes, but my nose is running. What have you hands for, then, slave? Is it not that you may wipe your nose? Is it reasonable, then, that there should be running noses in the world? And how much better it would be for you to wipe your nose than to find fault? Or what do you think Heracles would have amounted to, if there had not been a lion like the one which he encountered, and a hydra, and a stag, and a boar, and wicked and brutal men? Whom he made it his business to drive out and clear away? And what would he have been doing had nothing of the sort existed? Is it not clear that he would have rolled himself up in a blanket and slept? In the first place, then, he would never have become Heracles by slumbering away his whole life in such luxury and ease, but even if he had, of what good would he have been? What would have been the use of those arms of his and of his prowess in general, and his steadfastness and nobility, had not such circumstances and occasions roused and exercised him? What then? Ought he to have prepared these for himself, and sought to bring a lion into his own country from somewhere or other, and a boar, and a hydra? This would have been folly and madness. But since they did exist and were found in the world, they were serviceable as a means of revealing and exercising our heracles. Come then, do you also, now that you are aware of these things. Contemplate the faculties which you have. And, after contemplating, say, bring now, O Zeus, what difficulty thou wilt, for I have an equipment given to me by thee, and resources wherewith to distinguish myself by making use of the things that come to pass, but no, you sit trembling for fear something will happen, and lamenting, and grieving, and groaning about other things that are happening. And then you blame the gods. For what else can be the consequence of so ignoble a spirit but sheer impiety? And yet God has not merely given us these faculties, to enable us to bear all that happens without being degraded or crushed thereby, but as became a good king and in very truth a father he has given them to us free from all restraint, compulsion, hindrance, he has put the whole matter under our control without reserving even for himself any power to prevent or hinder. Although you have these faculties free and entirely your own, you do not use them, nor do you realize what gifts you have received. And from whom? But you sit sorrowing and groaning, some of you blinded toward the giver himself and not even acknowledging your benefactor, and others. Such is their ignoble spirit turning aside to fault-finding and complaints against God. And yet, though I can show you that you have resources and endowment for magnanimity and courage, do you, pray, show me what resources you have to justify fault-finding and complaining. Chapter 7. Of the use of equivocal premises, hypothetical arguments and the like. Most men are unaware that the handling of arguments which involve equivocal and hypothetical premises, and, further, of those which derive syllogisms by the process of interrogation, and, in general, the handling of all such arguments, has a bearing upon the duties of life. For our aim in every matter of inquiry is to learn how the good and excellent man may find the appropriate course through it and the appropriate way of conducting himself in it. Let them say, then, either that the good man will not enter the contest of question and answer, or that, once he has entered, he will be at no pains to avoid conducting himself carelessly and at haphazard in question and answer, or else. If they accept neither of these alternatives, they must admit that some investigation should be made of those topics with which question and answer are principally concerned. For what is the professed object of reasoning? To state the true, to eliminate the false, to suspend judgment in doubtful cases. Is it enough, then, to learn this alone? It is enough, says one. Is it, then, also enough for the man who wants to make no mistake in the use of money to be told the reason why you accept genuine drachmas and reject the counterfeit? It is not enough. What, then, must be added to this? Why, what else but the faculty that tests the genuine drachmas and the counterfeit and distinguishes between them? 
Wherefore, in reasoning also the spoken word is not enough, is it? On the contrary, is it not necessary to develop the power of testing the true and the false and the uncertain and of distinguishing between them? It is necessary. What else besides this is proposed in reasoning? Pray accept the consequence of what you have properly granted. Come, is it enough, then, in this case also merely to know that this particular thing is true? It is not enough, but one must learn in what way a thing follows as a consequence upon certain other things, and how sometimes one thing follows upon one, and at other times upon several conjointly. Is it not, then, necessary that a man should also acquire this power, if he is to acquit himself intelligently in argument, and is himself not only to prove each point when he tries to prove it, but also to follow the argument of those who are conducting a proof, and is not to be misled by men who quibble as though they were proving something? There has consequently arisen among us, and shown itself to be necessary, a science which deals with inferential arguments and with logical figures and trains men therein. But of course there are times when we have with sound reasoning granted the premises. And the inference from them is so and so, and, in spite of its being false, it is nonetheless the inference. What, then, should I do? Accept the fallacy? And how is that possible? Well, should I say, it was not sound reasoning for me to grant the premises? Nay, but this is not permissible either. Or, this does not follow from what has been granted? But that is not permissible, either. What, then, must be done in these circumstances? Is it not this, that the fact of having borrowed is not enough to prove that one is still in debt, but we must add the circumstance that one abides by the loan that is, has not paid it and just so our having once granted the premises is not enough to compel us to accept the inference, but we must abide by our acceptance of the premises? And what is more, if the premises remain until the end what they were when they were granted, there is every necessity for us to abide by our acceptance of them. And to allow the conclusion that has been drawn from them. For from our point of view and to our way of thinking this inference does not now result from the premises. Since we have withdrawn from our previous assent to the premises, it is necessary, therefore, to inquire into premises of this kind and into such change and equivocal modification of them, whereby, at the very moment the question is put, or the answer made, or the deduction drawn, or at some other similar stage in the argument, the premises take on modified meanings and give occasion to the unthinking to be disconcerted, if they do not see what follows in consequence. Why is it necessary? In order that in this matter we may not behave unsuitably, nor at haphazard, nor confusedly. And the same holds true of hypotheses and hypothetical arguments. For it is necessary at times to postulate some hypothesis as a sort of stepping stone for the subsequent argument. Are we, therefore, to grant any and every hypothesis that is proposed, or not every one? And if not every one, what one? And when a man has granted an hypothesis, must he abide forever by it and maintain it? Or are there times when he should abandon it and accept only the consequences which follow from it without accepting those which are opposed to it? Yes. But someone says, if you once admit an hypothesis that involves a possibility, I will compel you to be drawn onto an impossibility. Shall the prudent man refuse to engage with this person, and avoid inquiry and discussion with him? Yet who but the prudent is capable of using argument and skillful in question and answer, and, by Zeus, proof against deceit and sophistic fallacies? But shall he argue, indeed, and then not take pains to avoid conducting himself recklessly and at haphazard in argument? And if he does not, how will he any longer be the sort of man we think he is? But without some such exercise and preparation in formal reasoning, how will he be able to maintain the continuity of the argument? Let them show that he will be able, and all these speculations become mere superfluity, they were absurd and inconsistent with our preconception of the good man. Why are we still indolent and easygoing and sluggish, seeking excuses whereby we may avoid toiling or even late hours, as we try to perfect our own reason? If, then, I are in these matters, I have not murdered my own father, have I? Slave, pray where was there in this case a father for you to murder? What, then, have you done, you ask? You have committed what was the only possible error in the matter. Indeed this is the very remark I made to Rufus when he censured me for not discovering the one omission in a certain syllogism. Well, said I, it isn't as bad as if I had burned down the capital. But he answered, slave, the omission here is the capital. Or are there no other errors than setting fire to the capital and murdering one's father? 
but to make a reckless and foolish and haphazard use of the external impressions that come to one, to fail to follow an argument, or demonstration, or sophism in a word, to fail to see in question and answer what is consistent with one's position or inconsistent is none of these things an error. Chapter 8. That the reasoning faculties, in the case of the uneducated, are not free from error. In as many ways as it is possible to vary the meaning of equivalent terms. In so many ways may a man also vary the forms of his controversial arguments and of his enthymemes in reasoning. Take this syllogism, for instance, if you have borrowed and have not repaid, you owe me the money, now you have not borrowed and have not repaid, therefore you do not owe me the money. And no man is better fitted to employ such variations skillfully than the philosopher. For if, indeed, the enthymeme is an incomplete syllogism, it is clear that he who has been exercised in the perfect syllogism would be no less competent to deal with the imperfect also. Why, then, do we neglect to exercise ourselves and one another in this way? Because, even now, without receiving exercise in these matters, or even being, by me at least, diverted from the study of morality, we nevertheless make no progress toward the beautiful and the good. What, therefore, must we expect, if we should take on this occupation also? And especially since it would not merely be an additional occupation to draw us away from those which are more necessary, but would also be an exceptional excuse for conceit and vanity. For great is the power of argumentation and persuasive reasoning, and especially if it should enjoy excessive exercise and receive likewise a certain additional ornament from language. The reason is that, in general, every faculty which is acquired by the uneducated and the weak is dangerous for them, as being apt to make them conceited and puffed up over it. For by what device might one any longer persuade a young man who excels in these faculties to make them an appendage to himself instead of his becoming an appendage to them? Does he not trample all these reasons underfoot, and strut about in our presence, all conceited and puffed up, much less submitting if any one by way of reproof reminds him of what he lacks and wherein he has gone astray? What then? Was not Plato a philosopher? Yes, and was not Hippocrates a physician? But you see how eloquently Hippocrates expresses himself. Does Hippocrates, then, express himself so eloquently by virtue of his being a physician? Why, then, do you confuse things that for no particular reason have been combined in the same man? Now if Plato was handsome and strong, ought I to sit down and strive to become handsome, or become strong, on the assumption that this is necessary for philosophy, because a certain philosopher was at the same time both handsome and a philosopher? Are you not willing to observe and distinguish just what that is by virtue of which men become philosophers, and what qualities pertain to them for no particular reason? Come now, if I were a philosopher, ought you to become lame like me? What then? Am I depriving you of these faculties? Far be it from me. No more than I am depriving you of the faculty of sight. Yet, if you inquire of me what is man's good, I can give you no other answer than that it is a kind of moral purpose. Chapter 9. How from the thesis that we are akin to God may a man proceed to the consequences? If what is said by the philosophers regarding the kinship of God and men be true. What other course remains for men but that which Socrates took when asked to what country he belonged? Never to say I am an Athenian, or I am a Corinthian, but I am a citizen of the universe? For why do you say that you are an Athenian, instead of mentioning merely that corner into which your paltry body was cast at birth? Or is it clear you take the place which has a higher degree of authority and comprehends not merely that corner of yours, but also your family and, in a word, the source from which your race has come, your ancestors down to yourself, and from some such entity call yourself Athenian, or Corinthian? Well, then, anyone who has attentively studied the administration of the universe and has learned that the greatest and most authoritative and most comprehensive of all governments is this one, which is composed of men and God, and that from him have descended the seeds of being, not merely to my father or to my grandfather, but to all things that are begotten and that grow upon earth, and chiefly to rational beings. Seeing that by nature it is theirs alone to have communion in the society of God. Being intertwined with him through the reason. Why should not such a man call himself a citizen of the universe? Why should he not call himself a son of God? And why shall he fear anything that happens among men? What? Shall kinship with Caesar or any other of them that have great power at Rome be sufficient to enable men to live securely, proof against contempt, and in fear of nothing whatsoever, but to have God as our maker, and father, and guardian? Shall this not suffice to deliver us from griefs and fears? And wherewithal shall I be fed, asks one, if I have nothing? 
And how of slaves, how of runaways, on what do they rely when they leave their masters? On their lands, their slaves, or their vessels of silver? No, on nothing but themselves, and nevertheless food does not fail them. And shall it be necessary for our philosopher, forsooth, when he goes abroad, to depend upon others for his assurance and his refreshment, instead of taking care of himself, and to be more vile and craven than the irrational animals, every one of which is sufficient to himself, and lacks neither its own proper food nor that way of life which is appropriate to it and in harmony with nature? As for me, I think that the elder man ought not to be sitting here devising how to keep you from thinking too meanly of yourselves or from taking in your debates a mean or ignoble position regarding yourselves, he should rather be striving to prevent there being among you any young men of such a sort that, when once they have realized their kinship to the gods and that we have these fetters as it were fastened upon us, the body and its possessions, and whatever things on their account are necessary to us for the management of life, and our tarrying therein. They may desire to throw aside all these things as burdensome and vexatious and unprofitable and depart to their kindred. And this is the struggle in which your teacher and trainer, if he really amounted to anything, ought to be engaged, you, for your part, would come to him saying, Epictetus, we can no longer endure to be imprisoned with this paltry body, giving it food and drink, and resting and cleansing it, and, to crown all. Being on its account brought into contact with these people and those. Are not these things indifferent indeed, nothing to us? And is not death no evil? And are we not in a manner akin to God, and have we not come from Him? Suffer us to go back whence we came, suffer us to be freed at last from these fetters that are fastened to us and weigh us down. Here are despoilers and thieves, and courts of law, and those who are called tyrants, they think that they have some power over us because of the paltry body and its possessions. Suffer us to show them that they have power over no one. And thereupon it were my part to say, Men, wait upon God when he shall give the signal and set you free from this service, then shall you depart to him, but for the present endure to abide in this place, where he has stationed you. Short indeed is this time of your abiding here, and easy to bear for men of your convictions. For what tyrant, or what thief? Or what courts of law are any longer formidable to those who have thus set at naught the body and its possessions? Stay, nor be so unrational as to depart. Some such instruction should be given by the teacher to the youth of good natural parts. But what happens now? A corpse is your teacher and corpses are you. As soon as you have fed your fill today, you sit lamenting about the morrow, wherewithal you shall be fed. Slave, if you get it, you will have it, if you do not get it, you will depart, the door stands open. Why grieve? Where is there yet room for tears? What occasion longer for flattery? Why shall one man envy another? Why shall he admire those who have great possessions, or those who are stationed in places of power, especially if they be both strong and prone to anger? For what will they do to us? As for what they have power to do, we shall pay no heed thereto, as for the things we care about, over them they have no power. Who, then, will ever again be ruler over the man who is thus disposed? How did Socrates feel with regard to these matters? Why? How else than as that man ought to feel who has been convinced that he is akin to the gods? If you tell me now, says he, we will acquit you on these conditions, namely, that you will no longer engage in these discussions which you have conducted hitherto, nor trouble either the young or the old among us, I will answer, you make yourselves ridiculous by thinking that, if your general had stationed me at any post, I ought to hold and maintain it and choose rather to die ten thousand times than to desert it, but if God has stationed us in some place and in some manner of Life we ought to desert that. This is what it means for a man to be in very truth a kinsman of the gods. We, however, think of ourselves as though we were mere bellies, entrails, and genitals, just because we have fear, because we have appetite, and we flatter those who have power to help us in these matters, and these same men we fear. A certain man asked me to write to Rome in his behalf. Now he had met with what most men account misfortune, though he had formerly been eminent and wealthy. He had afterwards lost everything and was living here. And I wrote in humble terms in his behalf. But when he had read the letter he handed it back to me, and said, I wanted your help, not your pity, my plight is not an evil one. So likewise Rufus was wont to say, to test me, your master is going to do such and such a thing to you. And when I would say in answer, Tease but the lot of man, he would reply. What then? Am I to go on and petition him, when I can get the same result from you? For, in fact, it is foolish and superfluous to try to obtain from another that which one can get from oneself. 
Since, therefore, I am able to get greatness of soul and ability of character from myself, am I to get a farm? And money, or some office, from you? Far from it. I will not be so unaware of what I myself possess. But when a man is cowardly and abject, what else can one possibly do but write letters in his behalf as we do in behalf of a corpse, please to grant us the carcass of so-and-so and a pint of poultry blood? For really, such a person is but a carcass and a pint of poultry blood, and nothing more. But if he were anything more he would perceive that one man is not unfortunate because of another. Chapter 10. To those who have set their hearts on preferment at Rome. If we philosophers had applied ourselves to our own work as zealously as the old men at Rome have applied themselves to the matters on which they have set their hearts, perhaps we too should be accomplishing something. I know a man older than myself who is now in charge of the grain supply at Rome. When he passed this place on his way back from exile. I recall what a tale he told as he inveighed against his former life and announced for the future that. When he had returned to Rome, he would devote himself solely to spending the remainder of his life in peace and quiet, for how little is yet left to me. And I told him, you will not do it, but when once you have caught no more than a whiff of Rome you will forget all this. And if also admission to court should be granted, I added that he would rejoice, thank God and push his way in. If you find me, Epictetus, said he, putting so much as one foot inside the court, think of me what you will. Well. Now, what did he do? Before he reached Rome, letters from Caesar met him, and as soon as he received them, he forgot all those resolutions of his, and ever since he has been piling up one property after another. I wish I could stand by his side now and remind him of the words that he uttered as he passed by here, and remark, how much more clever a prophet I am than you. What then? Do I say that man is an animal made for inactivity? Far be it from me. But how can you say that we philosophers are not active in affairs? For example, to take myself first, as soon as day breaks I call to mind briefly what author I must read over. Then forthwith I say to myself, and yet what difference does it really make to me how so and so reads? The first thing is that I get my sleep. Even so, in what are the occupations of those other men comparable to ours? If you observe what they do, you will see. For what else do they do but all day long cast up accounts, dispute? Consult about a bit of grain a bit of land, or similar matters of profit. Is it, then, much the same thing to receive a little petition from someone and read, I beseech you to allow me to export a small quantity of grain, and this one, I beseech you to learn from Chrysippus what is the administration of the universe, and what place therein the rational animal has, and consider also who you are, and what is the nature of your good and evil. Is this like that? And does it demand the like kind of study? And is it in the same way shameful to neglect the one and the other? What then? Is it we philosophers alone who take things easily and drowse? No, it is you young men far sooner. For, look you, we old men, when we see young men playing, are eager to join in the play ourselves. And much more, if I saw them wide awake and eager to share in our studies, should I be eager to join, myself, in their serious pursuits. Chapter 11. A Family Affection. When an official came to see him, Epictetus after making some special inquiries about other matters. Asked him if he had children and a wife, and when the other replied that he had, Epictetus asked the further question, what, then, is your experience with marriage? Wretched, he said. To which Epictetus, how so? For men do not marry and beget children just for this surely, to be wretched, but rather to be happy. And yet, as for me, the other replied, I feel so wretched about the little children, that recently when my little daughter was sick and was thought to be in danger, I could not bear even to stay by her sick bed, but I up and ran away, until someone brought me word that she was well again. What then, do you feel that you were acting right in doing this? I was acting naturally, he said. But really, you must first convince me of this, that you were acting naturally, said he, and then I will convince you that whatever is done in accordance with nature is rightly done. This is the way, said the man, all, or at least most, of us fathers feel. And I do not contradict you either, answered Epictetus, and say that it is not done, but the point at issue between us is the other, whether it is rightly done. For by your style of reasoning we should have to say of tumours also that they are produced for the good of the body, just because they occur, and in brief, that to err is in accordance with nature, just because practically all of us, or at least most of us, do err. Do you show me, therefore, how your conduct is in accordance with nature? 
I cannot, said the man, but do you rather show me how it is not in accordance with nature, and not rightly done? And Epictetus said, well, if we were inquiring about white and black objects, what sort of criterion should we summon in order to distinguish between them? The sight, said the man. And if about hot and cold, and hard and soft objects, what criterion? The touch. Very well, then, since we are disputing about things which are in accordance with nature and things which are rightly or not rightly done, what criterion would you have us take? I do not know, he said. And yet, though it is, perhaps, no great harm for one not to know the criterion of colours and odours, and so, too, of flavours, still do you think that it is a slight harm for a man to be ignorant of the criterion of good and evil things, and of those in accordance with nature and those contrary to nature? On the contrary, it is the very greatest harm. Come, tell me, are all the things that certain persons regard as good and fitting, rightly so regarded? And is it possible at this present time that all the opinions which Jews, and Syrians, and Egyptians and Romans hold on the subject of food are rightly held? And how can it be possible? But, I fancy, it is absolutely necessary, if the views of the Egyptians are right, that those of the others are not right, if those of the Jews are well founded, that those of the others are not. Yes, certainly. Now where there is ignorance, there is also lack of knowledge and the lack of instruction in matters which are indispensable. He agreed. You, then, said he, now that you perceive this, will henceforth study no other have learned the criterion of what is in accordance with nature, you shall apply that criterion and thus determine each special case. But for the present I can give you the following assistance toward the attainment of what you desire. Does family affection seem to you to be in accordance with nature and good? Of course. What then? Is it possible that, while family affection is in accordance with nature and good, that which is reasonable is not good? By no means. That which is reasonable is not, therefore, incompatible with family affection? It is not, I think. Otherwise, when two things are incompatible and one of them is in accordance with nature, the other must be contrary to nature, must it not? Even so, said he. Whatever, therefore, we find to be at the same time both affectionate and reasonable, this we confidently assert to be both right and good. Granted, said he. What then? I suppose you will not deny that going away and leaving one's child when it is sick is at least not reasonable. But we have yet to consider whether it is affectionate. Yes, let us consider that. Were you, then, since you were affectionately disposed to your child, doing right when you ran away and left her? And has the mother no affection for her child? On the contrary, she has affection. Ought then the mother also to have left her child, or ought she not? She ought not. What of the nurse? Does she love her child? She does, he said. Ought, then, she also to have left her? By no means. What about the school attendant? Does not he love the child? He does. Ought, then, he as well to have gone away and left her, so that the child would thus have been left alone and helpless because of the great affection of you her parents and of those in charge of her, or, perhaps, have died in the arms of those who neither loved her nor cared for her? Far from it. And yet is it not unfair and unfeeling, when a man thinks certain conduct fitting for himself because of his affection, that he should not allow the same to others who have as much affection as he has? That were absurd. Come, if it had been you who were sick, would you have wanted all your relatives, your children and your wife included, to show their affection in such a way that you would be left all alone and deserted by them? By no means. And would you pray to be so loved by your own that, because of their excessive affection, you would always be left alone in sickness? Or would you, so far as this is concerned, have prayed to be loved by your enemies rather, if that were possible, so as to be left alone by them? And if this is what you would have prayed for, the only conclusion left us is that your conduct was, in the end, not an act of affection at all. What, then, was the motive nothing at all which actuated you and induced you to leave your child? And how can that be? But it was a motive like that which impelled a certain man in Rome to cover his head when the horse which he backed was running. And then, when it won unexpectedly, they had to apply sponges to him to revive him from his faint. What motive, then, is this? 
the scientific explanation, perhaps, is not in place now, but it is enough for us to be convinced that, if what the philosophers say is sound, we ought not to look for the motive anywhere outside of ourselves, but that in all cases it is one and the same thing that is the cause of our doing a thing or of our not doing it, of our saying things, or of our not saying them, of our being elated, or of our being cast down, of our avoiding things, or of our pursuing them the very thing. Indeed, which has even now become a cause of my action and of yours, yours in coming to me and sitting here now listening, mine in saying these things. And what is that? Is it, indeed, anything else than that we wanted to do this? Nothing. And supposing that we had wanted to do something else, what else would we be doing than that which we wanted to do? Surely, then, in the case of Achilles also, it was this that was the cause of his grief not the death of Patroclus, for other men do not act this way when their comrades die, but that he wanted to grieve. And in your case the other day, the cause of your running away was just that you wanted to do so, and another time, if you stay with her, it will be because you wanted to stay. And now you are going back to Rome, because you want to do so, and if you change your mind and want something else, you will not go. And, in brief, it is neither death, nor exile, nor toil, nor any such thing that is the cause of our doing, or of our not doing, anything, but only our opinions and the decisions of our will. Do I convince you of this, or not? You convince me, said he. Of such sort, then, as are the causes in each case, such likewise are the effects. Very well. Then, whenever we do anything wrongly, from this day forth we shall ascribe to this action no other cause than the decision of our will which led us to do it, and we shall endeavour to destroy an excise that cause more earnestly than we try to destroy an excise from the body its tumours and abscesses. And in the same way we shall declare the same thing to be the cause of our good actions. And we shall no longer blame either slave, or neighbour, or wife, or children, as being the causes of any evils to us, since we are persuaded that, unless we decide that things are thus and so, we do not perform the corresponding actions, and of our decision, for or against something, we ourselves, and not things outside of ourselves, are the masters. Even so, he said. From this very day, therefore, the thing whose nature or con condition we shall investigate and examine will be neither our farm, nor our slaves, nor our horses, nor our dogs, but only the decisions of our will. I hope so, he said. You see, then, that it is necessary for you to become a frequenter of the schools. That animal at which all men laugh. If you really desire to make an examination of the decisions of your own will and that this is not the work of a single hour or day you know as well as I do. Chapter 12. Of Contentment. Concerning gods there are some who say that the divine does not so much as exist, and others, that it exists, indeed, but is inactive and indifferent, and takes forethought for nothing, and a third set, that it exists and takes forethought, though only for great and heavenly things and in no case for terrestrial things, and a fourth set, that it also takes forethought for things terrestrial and the affairs of men, but only in a general way, and not for the individual in particular, and a fifth set, to which Odysseus and Socrates belonged, who say nor when I move am I concealed from thee. We must, therefore, first of all inquire about each of these statements, to see whether it is sound or not sound. For if gods do not exist, how can it be an end to follow the gods? And if they exist? Indeed, but care for nothing, how even thus will that conclusion be sound? But if, indeed, they both exist and exercise care, yet there is no communication from them to men. Yes, and, by Zeus, to me personally. How even in this case can our conclusion still be sound? The good and excellent man must, therefore, inquire into all these things, before he subordinates his own will to him who administers the universe, precisely as good citizens submit to the law of the state. And he that is being instructed ought to come to his instruction with this aim, how may I follow the gods in everything, and how may I be acceptable to the divine administration, and how may I become free? since he is free for whom all things happen according to his moral purpose, and whom none can restrain. What then? Is freedom insanity? Far from it, for madness and freedom are not consistent with one another. But I would have that which seems best to me happen in every case, no matter how it comes to seem so. You are mad, you are beside yourself. Do you not know that freedom is a noble and precious thing? but for me to desire at haphazard that those things should happen which have at haphazard seemed best to me, is dangerously near being, not merely not noble, but even in the highest degree shameful. For how do we act in writing? Do I desire to write the name Dio as I choose? No, but I am taught to desire to write it as it ought to be written. 
What do we do in music? The same. And what in general, where there is any art or science? The same, otherwise knowledge of anything would be useless, if it were accommodated to every individual's whims. Is it, then, only in this matter of freedom, the greatest and indeed the highest of all, that I am permitted to desire at haphazard? By no means, but instruction consists precisely in learning to desire each thing exactly as it happens. And how do they happen? As he that ordains them has ordained. And he has ordained that there be summer and winter, and abundance and dearth, and virtue and vice, and all such opposites, for the harmony of the whole, and he has given each of us a body, and members of the body, and property and companions. Mindful, therefore, of this ordaining we should go to receive instruction. Not in order to change the constitution of things. For this is neither vouchsafed us nor is it better that it should be. But in order that, things about us being as they are and as their nature is, we may, for our own part, keep our wills in harmony with what happens. For, look you, can we escape from men? And how is it possible? But can we, if they associate with us, change them? And who vouchsafes us that power? What alternative remains, then, or what method can we find for living with them? Some such method as that, while they will act as seems best to them, we shall none the less be in a state conformable to nature. But you are impatient and peevish, and if you are alone, you call it a solitude, but if you are in the company of men, you call them schemers and brigands, and you find fault even with your own parents and children and brothers and neighbours. But you ought, when staying alone, to call that peace and freedom, and to look upon yourself as like the gods, and when you are in the company of many, you ought not call that a mob, nor a tumult. Nor a disgusting thing. But a feast and a festival, and so accept all things contentedly. What, then, is the punishment of those who do not accept? To be just as they are. Is one peevish because he is alone? Let him be in solitude. Is he peevish with his parents? Let him be an evil son and grieve. Is he peevish with his children? Let him be a bad father. Throw him into prison. What sort of prison? Where he now is. For he is there against his will, and where a man is against his will, that for him is a prison. Just as Socrates was not in prison, for he was there willingly. Alas, that I should be lame in my leg. Slave, do you, then, because of one paltry leg blame the universe? Will you not make a free gift of it to the whole? Will you not relinquish it? Will you not gladly yield it to the giver? And will you be angry and peevish at the ordinances of Zeus, which he defined and ordained together with the fates who spun in his presence the thread of your begetting? Do you not know how small a part you are compared with the whole? That is, as to the body, for as to the reason you are not inferior to the gods, nor less than they, for the greatness of the reason is not determined by length nor by height but by the decisions of its will. Will you not, therefore, set what is for you the good in that wherein you are equal to the gods? Wretched man that I am, such a father and such a mother as I have. Well, was it permitted you to step forward and make selection, saying, let such and such man have intercourse with such and such woman at this hour, that I may be born? It was not permitted you, but your parents had to exist first, then you had to be born as you were born. Of what kind of parents? Of such as they were. What then? Since they are such, is no remedy given you? Again, supposing that you were ignorant of the purpose for which you possess the faculty of vision, you would be unfortunate and wretched if you closed your eyes when men brought some color before them, but in that you have greatness of mind and ability for use for every one of the things may happen to you, and know it not, are you not yet more unfortunate and wretched? Things proportionate to the faculty which you possess are brought before you. But you turn that faculty away at the very moment when you ought to keep it wide open and discerning. Do you not rather render thanks to the gods that they have allowed you to be superior to all the things that they did not put under your control, and have rendered you accountable only for what is under your control? As for parents, the gods have released you from accountability, as for brothers, they have released you, as for body, they have released you, and for property, death, life. Well, for what have they made you accountable? for the only thing that is under your control the proper use of impressions. Why, then, do you draw upon yourself that for which you are not responsible? This is to make trouble for yourself. Chapter 13. How may each several thing be done acceptably to the gods? Now when someone asked him how it is possible to eat acceptably to the gods, he said, if it is done justly and graciously and fairly and restrainedly and decently. Is it not also done acceptably to the gods? 
And when you have asked for warm water and the slave does not heed you, or if he does heed you but brings in tepid water, or if he is not even to be found in the house, then to refrain from anger and not to explode, is not this acceptable to the gods? How, then, can a man bear with such persons? Slave, will you not bear with your own brother, who has Zeus as his progenitor and is, as it were, a son born of the same seed as yourself and of the same sowing from above, but if you have been stationed in a like position above others, will you forthwith set yourself up as a tyrant? Do you not remember what you are, and over whom you rule that they are kinsmen, that they are brothers by nature, that they are the offspring of Zeus? But I have a deed of sale for them, and they have none for me. Do you see whither you bend your gaze, that it is to the earth, that it is to the pit, that it is to these wretched laws of ours, the laws of the dead, and that it is not to the laws of the gods that you look? Chapter 14. That the deity oversees all men. Now when someone asked him how a man could be convinced that each thing which he does is under the eye of God, do you not think, he answered, that all things are united in one? I do, said the other. Very well, do you not think that what is on earth feels the influence of that which is in heaven? I do, he replied. For how else comes it that so regularly, as if from God's command, when he bids the plants flower, they flower, when he bids them put forth shoots, they put them forth. When he bids them bear their fruit, they bear it, when to ripen, they ripen, when again he bids them drop their fruit and let fall their leaves and gather themselves together and remain quiet and take their rest, they remain quiet and take their rest. And how else comes it that at the waxing and waning of the moon and at the approach and recession of the sun we see among the things that are on earth so great an alteration and change to the opposite? But are the plants and our own bodies so closely bound up with the universe, and do they so intimately share its affections, and is not the same much more true of our own souls? But if our souls are so bound up with God and joined together with Him, as being parts and portions of His being, does not God perceive their every motion as being a motion of that which is His own and of one body with Himself? And yet you have power to think about the divine dispensation and about each several item among things divine. And at the same time also about human affairs. And you have the faculty of being moved by myriads of matters at the same time both in your senses and in your intelligence, and at the same time you assent to some, while you dissent from others, or suspend judgment about them, and you guard in your own soul so many impressions derived from so many and various matters, and, on being moved by these impressions, your mind falls upon notions corresponding to the impressions first made, and so from myriads of matters you derive and retain. Arts, one after the other, and memories. All this you do, and is God not able to oversee all things and to be present with all and to have a certain communication from them all? Yet the sun is capable of illuminating so large a portion of the universe, and of leaving unilluminated only the small space which is no larger than can be covered by the shadow that the earth casts, and is he who has created the sun, which is but a small portion of himself in comparison with the whole, and causes it to revolve. Is he not able to perceive all things? And yet, Says one, I cannot follow all these things at one and the same time. But does anyone go so far as to tell you this, namely, that you possess a faculty which is equal to that of Zeus? Yet nonetheless he has stationed by each man's side as guardian his particular genius, and has committed the man to his care, and that too a guardian who never sleeps and is not to be beguiled. For to what other guardian, better and more careful, could he have committed each one of us? Wherefore, when you close your doors and make darkness within, remember never to say that you are alone, for you are not alone, nay, God is within, and your own genius is within. And what need have they of light in order to see what you are doing? Yes, and to this God you also ought to swear allegiance, as the soldiers do to Caesar. They are but hirelings, yet they swear that they will put the safety of Caesar above everything, and shall you, indeed, who have been counted worthy of blessings so numerous and so great be unwilling to swear when you have sworn, to abide by your oath. And what shall you swear? Never to disobey under any circumstances, never to prefer charges, never to find fault with anything that God has given, never to let your will rebel when you have either to do or to suffer something that is inevitable. Can the oath of the soldiers in any way be compared with this of ours? Out there men swear never to prefer another in honour above Caesar, but here we swear to prefer ourselves in honour above everything else. Chapter 15 what does philosophy profess? When someone consulted Epictetus as to how he could persuade his brother to cease being angry with him, he replied, philosophy does not profess to secure for man any external possession. Otherwise it would be undertaking something that lies outside its proper subject matter. 
For as wood is the material of the carpenter, bronze that of the statuary, just so each man's own life is the subject matter of the art of living. Well, what about my brother's life? That again is the subject matter of his own art of living, but with respect to your art of living it comes under the category of externals, like a farm, like health, like good repute. Philosophy promises none of these things, but rather, in every circumstance I will keep the governing principle in a state of accord with nature. Whose governing principle? His in whom I am. How? Then, shall I keep my brother from being angry at me? Bring him to me and I will tell him, but I have nothing to say to you on the subject of his anger. And when the man who was consulting him said, What I seek to know is this, how, even if my brother refuses to be reconciled with me, I may yet be in accord with nature, Epictetus replied, nothing great comes into being all at once, why, not even does the bunch of grapes, or a figure. If you say to me now, I want a fig, I shall answer, that requires time. Let the tree blossom first, then put forth its fruit, and finally let the fruit ripen. Now although the fruit of even a fig tree is not brought to perfection all at once and in a single hour, would you still seek to secure the fruit of a man's mind in so short a while and so easily? Do not expect it, not even if I should tell you so myself. Chapter 16. Of Providence. Marvel not that the animals other than man have furnished them, ready prepared by nature, what pertains to their bodily needs. Not merely food and drink, but also a bed to lie on. And that they have no need of shoes, or bedding, or clothing, while we are in need of all these things. For in the case of animals, born not for their own sake, but for service, to have created them in need of other things was not beneficial. Why, consider what it would be for us to have to take thought not for merely ourselves, but also for our sheep and our asses, how they are to be clothed and shod, how they are to find food and drink. But just as soldiers appear before their general, all ready for service, shod, clothed and armed, and it would be shocking if the colonel had to go around and equip his regiment with shoes or uniforms, so also nature has made animals, which are born for service, ready for use, equipped, and in need of no further attention. Consequently one small child with a rod can drive a flock of sheep. But as it is, we first forbear to give thanks for these beasts. Because we do not have to bestow upon them the same care as we require for ourselves. And then proceed to complain against God on our own account. Yet, by Zeus and the gods, one single gift of nature would suffice to make a man who is reverent and grateful perceive the providence of God. Do not talk to me now of great matters, take the mere fact that milk is produced from grass, and cheese from milk, and that wool grows from skin who is it that has created or devised these things? No one, somebody says. Oh, the depth of man's stupidity and shamelessness. Come, let us leave the chief works of nature, and consider merely what she does in passing. Can anything be more useless than the hairs on a chin? Well, what then? Has not nature used even these in the most suitable way possible? Has she not by these means distinguished between the male and the female? Does not the nature of each one among us cry aloud forthwith from afar, I am a man, on this understanding approach me, on this understanding talk with me, ask for nothing further, behold the signs. Again. In the case of women, just as nature has mingled in their voice a certain softer note, so likewise she has taken the hair from their chins. Not so, you say, on the contrary the human animal ought to have been left without distinguishing features, and each of us ought to proclaim by word of mouth, I am a man. Nay, but how fair and becoming and dignified the sign is. How much more fair than the cock's comb, how much more magnificent than the lion's manet. Wherefore, we ought to preserve the signs which God has given, we ought not to throw them away, we ought not, so far as in us lies, to confuse the sexes which have been distinguished in this fashion. Are these the only works of providence in us? Nay, what language is adequate to praise them all or bring them home to our minds as they deserve? Why? If we had sense, ought we to be doing anything else, publicly and privately, than hymning and praising the Deity, and rehearsing His benefits? Ought we not, as we dig and plough and eat, to sing the hymn of praise to God? Great is God, that he hath furnished us these instruments wherewith we shall till the earth. Great is God, that he hath given us hands, and power to swallow, and a belly, and power to grow unconsciously, and to breathe while asleep. This is what we ought to sing on every occasion, and above all to sing the greatest and divinest hymn, that God has given us the faculty to comprehend these things and to follow the path of reason. What then? Since most of you have become blind, ought there not to be someone to fulfill this office for you, and in behalf of all sing the hymn of praise to God? 
Why, what else can I, a lame old man, do but sing hymns to God? If, indeed, I were a nightingale, I should be singing as a nightingale, if a swan. As a swan. But as it is, I am a rational being, therefore I must be singing hymns of praise to God. This is my task, I do it, and will not desert this post, as long as it may be given me to fill it, and I exhort you to join me in this same song. Chapter 17. That the art of reasoning is indispensable. Since it is reason that analyzes and perfects all else, and reason itself ought not to remain unanalyzed, wherewithal shall it be analyzed? Why, clearly, either by itself, or by something else? This latter is assuredly either reason, or it will prove to be something else superior to reason, which is impossible. If it be reason, who again will analyze that reason? For if it analyzes its own self, the reason with which we started can do as much. If we are going to require something else at each step, our process will be endless and unceasing. Yes, says someone, but the cure, of the decisions of our will, is a much more pressing need, than the study of logic. And the like. Do you then wish to hear about this other matter? Very well, listen. But if you say to me, I do not know whether your argument is true or false, and, if I use some ambiguous term, and you should then say, distinguish, I shall bear with you no longer, but shall tell you, nay, but there is a much more pressing need. This is the reason, I suppose, why the Stoic philosophers put logic first, just as in the measuring of grain we put first the examination of the measure. And if we do not define first what a modius is, and do not define first what a scale is, how shall we be able to proceed with measuring or weighing anything? So, in the field of our present inquiry, if we have neglected the thorough knowledge and intellectual mastery of our standard of judgment for all other things, whereby they come to be known thoroughly, shall we ever be able to attain intellectual mastery and thorough knowledge of the rest of the world? And how could we possibly? Yes. We are told. But the modius is made out of wood and bears no fruit. True, but it is something with which we can measure grain. Logic also bears no fruit. Now as for this statement we shall see later, but if one should grant even this, it is enough to say in defense of logic that it has the power to discriminate and examine everything else, and, as one might say, to measure and weigh them. Who says this? Only Chrysippus and Zeno and Cleanthus? Well, does not Antisthenes say it? And who is it that wrote, the beginning of education is the examination of terms? Does not Socrates, too, say the same thing? And of whom does Xenophon write, that he began with the examination of terms, asking about each, what does it mean? Is this, then, your great and admirable achievement the ability to understand and to interpret Chrysippus? And who says that? What, then, is your admirable achievement? To understand the will of nature. Very well, do you understand it all by yourself? And if that is the case, what more do you need? For if it is true that all men are involuntarily, and you have learned the truth, it must needs be that you are doing right already. But, so help me Zeus, I do not comprehend the will of nature. Who, then, interprets it? Men say, Chrysippus. I go and try to find out what this interpreter of nature says. I begin not to understand what he says. And look for the man who can interpret him. Look and consider what this passage means, says the interpreter, just as if it were in Latin. What place is there here, then, for pride on the part of the interpreter? Why, there is no just place for pride even on the part of Chrysippus, if he merely interprets the will of nature, but himself does not follow it, how much less place for pride, then, in the case of his interpreter? For we have no need of Chrysippus on his own account, but only to enable us to follow nature. No more have we need of him who divines through sacrifice, considered on his own account, but simply because we think that through his instrumentality we shall understand the future and the signs given by the gods, nor do we need the entrails on their own account, but only because through them the signs are given, nor do we admire the crow or the raven, but God, who gives his signs through them. Wherefore, I go to this interpreter and diviner and say, Examine for me the entrails. And tell me what signs they give. The fellow takes and spreads them out and then interprets, man, you have a moral purpose free by nature from hindrances and constraint. This stands written here in these entrails. I will prove you that first in the sphere of assent. Can anyone prevent you from assenting to truth? No one at all. Can anyone force you to accept the false? No one at all. Do you see that in this sphere you have a moral purpose free from hindrance, constraint, obstruction? Come, in the sphere of desire and choice is it otherwise? 
And what can overcome one impulse but another impulse? And what can overcome one desire or aversion but another desire or aversion? But, says someone, if a person subjects me to the fear of death, he compels me. No, it is not what you are subjected to that impels you, but the fact that you decide it is better for you to do something of the sort than to die. Once more, then. It is the decision of your own will which compelled you. That is, moral purpose compelled moral purpose. For if God had so constructed that part of his own being which he has taken from himself and bestowed upon us, that it could be subjected to hindrance or constraint either from himself or from some other. He were no longer God, nor would he be caring for us as he ought. This is what I find, says the diviner, in the sacrifice. These are the signs vouchsafed you. If you will. You are free, if you will, you will not have to blame anyone, or complain against anyone, everything will be in accordance with what is not merely your own will, but at the same time the will of God. This is the prophecy for the sake of which I go to this diviner in other words, the philosopher. Not admiring him because of his interpretation, but rather the interpretation which he gives. Chapter 18. That we ought not to be angry with the erring. If what the philosophers say is true, that in all men thought and action start from a single source, namely feeling as in the case of assent the feeling that a thing is so, and in the case of dissent the feeling that it is not so, yes, and, by Zeus, in the case of suspended judgment the feeling that it is uncertain, so also in the case of impulse towards a thing, the feeling that it is expedient for me and that it is impossible to judge one thing expedient and yet desire another. And again, to judge one thing fitting, and yet be impelled to another if all this be true, why are we any longer angry with the multitude? They are thieves, says someone, and robbers. What do you mean by thieves and robbers? They have simply gone astray in questions of good and evil. Ought we, therefore, to be angry with them, or rather pity them? Only show them their error and you will see how quickly they will desist from their mistakes. But if their eyes are not opened, they have nothing superior to their mere opinion. Ought not this brigand, then, and this adulterer to be put to death? You ask. Not at all, but you should ask rather, ought not this man to be put to death who is in a state of error and delusion about the greatest matters, and is in a state of blindness, not, indeed, in the vision which distinguishes between white and black, but in the judgment which distinguishes between the good and the evil? And if you put it this way, you will realize how inhuman a sentiment it is that you are uttering, and that it is just as if you should say, ought not this blind man, then, or this deaf man to be put to death? For if the loss of the greatest things is the greatest harm that can befall a man, while the greatest thing in each man is a right moral purpose, and if a man is deprived of this very thing, what ground is left for you to be angry at him? Why, man, if you must needs be affected in a way that is contrary to nature at the misfortunes of another, pity him rather, but do not hate him, drop this readiness to take offence and this spirit of hatred, do not introduce those words which the multitude of the censorious use, well, then, these accursed and abominable fools. Very well, but how is it that you have so suddenly been converted to wisdom that you are angry at fools? Why, then, are we angry? Because we admire the goods of which these men rob us. For, mark you, stop admiring your clothes, and you are not angry at the man who steals them, stop admiring your wife's beauty, and you are not angry at her adulterer. Know that a thief or an adulterer has no place among the things that are your own. But only among the things that are another's and that are not under your control. If you give these things up and count them as nothing, at whom have you still ground to feel angry? But so long as you admire these things, be angry at yourself and not at the men that I have just mentioned. For consider, you have fine clothes and your neighbor does not, you have a window and wish to air them. He does not know wherein the true good of man consists, but fancies that it consists in having fine clothes, the very same fancy that you also entertain. Shall he not come, then, and carry them off? Why, when you show a cake to gluttonous men and then gulp it down all to yourself, are you not wanting them to snatch it? Stop provoking them. Stop having a window, stop airing your clothes. Something similar happened to me also the other day. I keep an iron lamp by the side of my household gods, and, on hearing a noise at the window, I ran down. I found that the lamp had been stolen. I reflected that the man who stole it was moved by no unreasonable motive. What then? Tomorrow, I say, you will find one of earthenware. Indeed, a man loses only that which he already has. I have lost my cloak. Yes, for you had a cloak. I have a pain in my head. You don't have a pain in your horns, do you? Why, then, are you indignant? 
for our losses and our pains have to do only with the things which we possess. But the tyrant will chain. What? Your leg. But he will cut off. What? Your neck. What, then, will he neither chain nor cut off? Your moral purpose. This is why the ancients gave us the injunction, know thyself. What follows, then? Why, by the gods, that one ought to practice in small things, and beginning with them pass on to the greater. I have a headache. Well, do not say alas. I have an earache. Do not say alas. And I am not saying that it is not permissible to groan, only do not groan in the center of your being. And if your slave is slow in bringing your bandage, do not cry out and make a wry face and say, everybody hates me. Why, who would not hate such a person? For the future put your confidence in these doctrines and walk about erect, free, not putting your confidence in the size of your body, like an athlete, for you ought not to be invincible in the way an ass is invincible. Who, then, is the invincible man? He whom nothing that is outside the sphere of his moral purpose can dismay. I then proceed to consider the circumstances one by one. As I would do in the case of the athlete. This fellow has won the first round. What, then, will he do in the second? What if it be scorching hot? And what will he do at Olympia? It is the same way with the case under consideration. If you put a bit of silver coin in a man's way, he will despise it. Yes, but if you put a bit of a wench in his way, what then? Or if it be in the dark, what then? Or if you throw a bit of reputation in his way, what then? Or abuse, what then? Or praise, what then? Or death, what then? All these things he can overcome. What, then, if it be scorching hot that is, what if he be drunk? What if he be melancholy mad? What if asleep? The man who passes all these tests is what I mean by the invincible athlete. Chapter 19. How ought we to bear ourselves toward tyrants? If a man possesses some superiority, or thinks at least that he does, even though he does not, it is quite unavoidable that this man, if he is uneducated, becomes puffed up on account of it. For example, the tyrant exclaims, I am the mightiest in the world. Very well, what can you do for me? Can you secure for me desire that is free from any hindrance? How can you? Do you have it yourself? Can you secure for me aversion proof against encountering what it would avoid? Do you have it yourself? Or infallible choice? And where can you claim a share in that? Come, when you are on board ship, do you feel confidence in yourself, or in the skilled navigator? And when you are in a chariot, in whom do you feel confidence other than the skilled driver? And how is it in the other arts? The same way. What does your power amount to? Then? All men pay attention to me. Yes, and I pay attention to my little plate and wash it and wipe it out, and for the sake of my oil flask I drive a peg in the wall. What follows, then? Are these things superior to me? No, but they render me some service, and therefore I pay attention to them. Again, do I not pay attention to my donkey? Do I not wash his feet? Do I not curry him? Do you not know that every man pays attention to himself, and to you just as he does to his donkey? For who pays attention to you as to a man? Point him out to me. Who wishes to become like you? Who becomes a zealous follower of yours as men did of Socrates? But I can cut off your head. Well said. I had forgotten that I ought to pay attention to you, as to fever or cholera, and set up an altar to you, just as in Rome there is an altar to the god fever. What is it, then, that disturbs and bewilders the multitude? Is it the tyrant and his bodyguards? How is that possible? Nay. Far from it. It is not possible that that which is by nature free should be disturbed or thwarted by anything but itself. But it is a man's own judgments that disturb him. For when the tyrant says to a man, I will chain your leg, the man who has set a high value on his leg replies, Nay, have mercy upon me, while the man who has set a high value on his moral purpose replies, If it seems more profitable to you to do so, chain it. Do you not care? No, I do not care. I will show you that I am master. How can you be my master? Zeus has set me free. Or do you really think that he was likely to let his own son be made a slave? You are, however, master of my dead body, take it. You mean, then, that when you approach me you will not pay attention to me? No, I pay attention only to myself. 
but if you wish me to say that I pay attention to you too, I tell you that I do so, but only as I pay attention to my pot. This is not mere self-love, such is the nature of the animal man, everything that he does is for himself. Why, even the sun does everything for its own sake, and for that matter. So does Zeus himself. But when Zeus wishes to be rain-bringer, and fruit-giver, and father of men and of gods, you can see for yourself that he cannot achieve these works, or win these appellations, unless he proves himself useful to the common interest, and in general he has so constituted the nature of the rational animal man, that he can attain nothing of his own proper goods unless he contributes something to the common interest. Hence it follows that it can no longer be regarded as unsocial for a man to do everything for his own sake. For what do you expect? That a man should neglect himself and his own interest. And in that case how can there be room for one and the same principle of action for all, namely, that of appropriation to their own needs? What then? When men entertain absurd opinions about what lies outside the province of the moral purpose, counting it good or bad, it is altogether unavoidable for them to pay attention to the tyrant. I would that it were merely the tyrants and not their chamberlains too. And yet how can the man suddenly become wise when Caesar puts him in charge of his chamber pot? How can we forthwith say Felicio has spoken wisely to me? I would that he were deposed from the superintendency of the dunghill, that you may think him a fool again. Epaphroditus owned a certain cobbler whom he sold because he was useless, then by some chance the fellow was bought by a member of Caesar's household and became cobbler to Caesar. You should have seen how Epaphroditus honoured him. How is my good Felicio, I pray you? He used to say. And then if someone asked us, what is your master doing? He was told, he is consulting Felicio about something or other. Why, had he not sold him as being useless? Who, then, had suddenly made a wise man out of him? This is what it means to honour something else than what lies within the province of the moral purpose. He has been honoured with a tribuneship, someone says. All who meet him offer their congratulations, one man kisses him on the eyes, another on the neck, his slaves kiss his hands. He goes home, he finds lamps being lighted. He climbs up the capital and offers sacrifice. Now whoever sacrificed as a thank offering for having had right desire, or for having exercised choice in accordance with nature. For we give thanks to the gods for that wherein we set the good. Today a man was talking to me about a priesthood of Augustus. I say to him, man, drop the matter, you will be spending a great deal to no purpose. But, says he, those who draw up deeds of sale will inscribe my name. Do you really expect, then, to be present when the deeds are read and say, that is my name they have written? And even supposing you are now able to be present whenever anyone reads them, what will you do if you die? My name will remain after me. Inscribe it on a stone and it will remain after you. Come now, who will remember you outside of Nicopolis? but I shall wear a crown of gold. If you desire a crown at all, take a crown of roses and put it on, you will look much more elegant in that. Chapter 20. How the reasoning faculty contemplates itself. Every art and faculty makes certain things the special object of its contemplation. Now when the art or faculty itself is of like kind with what it contemplates, it becomes inevitably self-contemplative, but when it is of unlike kind, it cannot contemplate itself. For example, the art of leatherworking has to do with hides, but the art itself is altogether different from the material of hides, wherefore it is not self-contemplative. Again, the art of grammar has to do with written speech, it is not, therefore, also itself written speech, is it? Not at all. For this reason it cannot contemplate itself. Well then, for what purpose have we received reason from nature? For the proper use of external impressions. What, then, is reason itself? something composed out of a certain kind of external impressions. Thus it comes naturally to be also self-contemplative. Once more, what are the things that wisdom has been given us to contemplate? Things good, bad. And neither good nor bad. What? Then, is wisdom itself? A good. And what is folly? An evil. Do you see, then, that wisdom inevitably comes to contemplate both itself and its opposite? Therefore, the first and greatest task of the philosopher is to test the impressions and discriminate between them, and to apply none that has not been tested. You all see in the matter of coinage, in which it is felt that we have some interest, 
how we have even invented an art, and how many means the tester employs to test the coinage sight, touch, smell, finally hearing, he throws the denarius down and then listens to the sound, and is not satisfied with the sound it makes on a single test, but, as a result of his constant attention to the matter, he catches the tune, like a musician. Thus, where we feel that it makes a good deal of difference to us whether we go wrong or do not go wrong, there we apply any amount of attention to discriminating between things that are capable of making us go wrong. But in the case of our governing principle, poor thing, we yawn and sleep and erroneously accept any and every external impression, for here the loss that we suffer does not attract our attention. When, therefore, you wish to realize how careless you are about the good and the evil, and how zealous you are about that which is indifferent, observe how you feel about physical blindness on the one hand, and mental delusion on the other, and you will find out that you are far from feeling as you ought about things good and things evil. Yes, but this requires much preparation, and much hard work, and learning many things. Well, what then? Do you expect it to be possible to acquire the greatest art with a slight effort? And yet the chief doctrine of the philosophers is extremely brief. If you would know, read what Zeno has to say and you will see. For what is there lengthy in his statement, to follow the gods is man's end, and the essence of good is the proper use of external impressions. Ask, what, then? Is God? And what is an external impression? And what is nature in the individual and nature in the universe? You already have a lengthy statement. If Epicurus should come and say that the good ought to be in the flesh, again the explanation becomes lengthy, and you must be told what is the principal faculty within us, and what our substantial, and what our essential, nature is. Since it is not probable that the good of a snail lies in its shell, is it, then, probable that the good of man lies in his flesh? But take your own case, Epicurus, what more masterful faculty do you yourself possess? What is that thing within you which takes counsel, which examines into all things severally, which, after examining the flesh itself, decides that it is the principal matter? And why do you light a lamp and toil in our behalf, and write such quantities of books? Is it that we may not fail to know the truth? Who are we? And what are we to you? And so the argument becomes lengthy. Chapter 21. To those who would be admired. When a man has his proper station in life, he is not all agape for things beyond it. Man, what is it you want to have happen to you? As for myself, I am content if I exercise desire and aversion in accordance with nature, if I employ choice and refusal as my nature is, and similarly employ purpose and design and assent. Why, then, do you walk around in our presence as though you had swallowed a spit? It has always been my wish that those who meet me should admire me and as they follow me should exclaim, O oh the great philosopher, who are those people by whom you wish to be admired? Are they not these about whom you are in the habit of saying that they are mad? What then? Do you wish to be admired by the mad? Chapter 22. Of our preconceptions. Preconceptions are common to all men, and one preconception does not contradict another. For who among us does not assume that the good is profitable and something to be chosen, and that in every circumstance we ought to seek and pursue it? And who among us does not assume that righteousness is beautiful and becoming? When, then, does contradiction arise? It arises in the application of our preconceptions to the particular cases, when one person says, he did nobly, he is brave, another, no, but he is out of his mind. Thence arises the conflict of men with one another. This is the conflict between Jews and Syrians and Egyptians and Romans, not over the question whether holiness should be put before everything else and should be pursued in all circumstances, but whether the particular act of eating swine's flesh is holy or unholy. This, you will find, was also the cause of conflict between Agamemnon and Achilles. Come. Summon them before us. What do you say, Agamemnon? Ought not that to be done which is proper, and that which is noble? Indeed it ought. And what do you say, Achilles? Do you not agree that what is noble ought to be done? As for me, I agree most emphatically with that principle. Very well, then, apply your preconceptions to the particular cases. It is just there the conflict starts. The one says, I ought not to be compelled to give back Chrysase to her father, while the other says, indeed you ought. Most certainly one of the two is making a bad application of the preconception what one ought to do. Again, the one of them says, very well, if I ought to give back Chrysase, then I ought to take from some one of you the prize he has won, and the other replies, would you, then, take the woman I love? Yes, the woman you love, the first answers. Shall I, then, be the only one? 
but shall I be the only one to have nothing? So a conflict arises. What, then, does it mean to be getting an education? It means to be learning how to apply the natural preconceptions to particular cases, each to the other in conformity with nature, and, further, to make the distinction, that some things are under our control while others are not under our control. Under our control are moral purpose and all the acts of moral purpose, but not under our control are the body, the parts of the body, possessions, parents, brothers, children, country in a word, all that with which we associate. Where, then, shall we place the good? To what class of things are we going to apply it? To the class of things that are under our control? What is not health, then, a good thing, and a sound body, and life? Nay, and not even children, or parents, or country. And who will tolerate you if you deny that? Therefore, let us transfer the designation good to these things. But is it possible, then, for a man to be happy if he sustains injury and fails to get that which is good? It is not possible. And to maintain the proper relations with his associates? And how can it be possible? For it is my nature to look out for my own interest. If it is my interest to have a farm, it is my interest to take it away from my neighbor, if it is my interest to have a cloak, it is my interest also to steal it from a bath. This is the source of wars, seditions, tyrannies, plots. And again, how shall I any longer be able to perform my duty towards Zeus? For if I sustain injury and am unfortunate, he pays no heed to me. And then we hear men saying, What have I to do with him, if he is unable to help us? And again, what have I to do with him, if he wills that I be in such a state as I am now? The next step is that I begin to hate him. Why, then, do we build temples to the gods, and make statues of them, as for evil spirits for Zeus as for a god of fever? And how can he any longer be saviour, and rain-bringer, and fruit-giver? And, in truth, if we set the nature of the good somewhere in this sphere, all these things follow. What, then, shall we do? This is a subject of inquiry for the man who truly philosophizes and is in travail of thought. Says such a man to himself, I do not now see what is the good and what is the evil, am I not mad? Yes, but suppose I set the good somewhere here, among the things that the will controls, all men will laugh at me. Some white-haired old man with many a gold ring on his fingers will come along, and then he will shake his head and say, Listen to me, my son, one ought of course to feel as ophies, but one ought also to keep one's head, this is all nonsense. You learn a syllogism from the philosophers, but you know better than the philosophers what you ought to do. Man, why, then, do you censure me, if I know? What shall I say to this slave? If I hold my peace, the fellow bursts with indignation. So I must say, forgive me as you would lovers, I am not my own master, I am mad. Chapter 23. In answer to Epicurus. Even Epicurus understands that we are by nature social beings. But having once set our good in the husk which we wear, he cannot go on and say anything inconsistent with this. For, he next insists emphatically upon the principle that we ought neither to admire nor to accept anything that is detached from the nature of the good, and he is right in so doing. But how, then, can we still be social beings, if affection for our own children is not a natural sentiment? Why do you dissuade the wise man from bringing up children? Why are you afraid that sorrow will come to him on their account? What, does sorrow come to him on account of his house slave mouse? Well, what does it matter to him if his little mouse in his home begins to cry? Nay he knows, that if once a child is born, it is no longer in our power not to love it or to care for it. For the same reason Epicurus says that a man of sense does not engage in politics either, for he knows what the man who engages in politics has to do since, of course, if you are going to live among men as though you were a fly among flies. What is to hinder you? Yet, despite the fact that he knows this, he still has the audacity to say, let us not bring up children. But a sheep does not abandon its own offspring, nor a wolf, and yet does a man abandon his? What do you wish us to do? Would you have us be foolish as sheep? But even they do not desert their offspring. Would you have us be fierce as wolves? But even they do not desert their offspring. Come now, who follows your advice when he sees his child fallen on the ground and crying? Why, in my opinion, your mother and your father, even if they had divined that you were going to say such things, would not have exposed you. Chapter 24 How should we struggle against difficulties? It is difficulties that show what men are. Consequently, when a difficulty befalls, remember that God, like a physical trainer, has matched you with a rugged young man. 
What for? Someone says. So that you may become an Olympic victor, but that cannot be done without sweat. To my way of thinking no one has got a finer difficulty than the one which you have got. If only you are willing to make use of it as an athlete makes use of a young man to wrestle with. And now we are sending you to Rome as a scout, to spy out the land. But no one sends a coward as a scout, that, if he merely hears a noise and sees a shadow anywhere, he may come running back in terror and report the enemy is already upon us. So now also, if you should come and tell us, the state of things at Rome is fearful, terrible is death, terrible is exile, terrible is reviling, terrible is poverty, flee, sirs, the enemy is upon us. We shall say to you, away, prophesy to yourself. Our one mistake was that we sent a man like you as a scout. Diogenes, who before you were sent forth as a scout, has brought us back a different report. He says, death is not an evil, since it is not dishonorable, he says, ill repute is a noise made by madmen. And what a report this scout has made us about toil and about pleasure and about poverty. He says, to be naked is better than any scarlet robe, and to sleep on the bare ground. He says, is the softest couch. And he offers as a proof of each statement his own courage, his tranquility, his freedom, and finally his body, radiant with health and hardened. There is no enemy near, says he, all is full of peace. How so, Diogenes? Why, look. Says he, I have not been struck with any missile, have I, or received any wound? I have not fled from anyone, have I? This is what it means to be a proper scout, but you return and tell us one thing after another. Will you not go away again and observe more accurately, without this cowardice? What am I to do, then? What do you do when you disembark from a ship? You do not pick up the rudder, do you, or the oars? What do you pick up, then? Your own luggage, your oil flask, your wallet. So now, if you are mindful of what is your own property, you will never lay claim to that which is another's. He says to you, lay aside your broad scarlet hem behold, the narrow hem. Lay aside this also. Behold, the plain toga. Lay aside your toga. Behold, I am naked. But you arouse my envy. Well, then, take the whole of my paltry body. Do I any longer fear the man to whom I can throw my body? But he will not leave me as his heir. What then? Did I forget that none of these things is my own? How, then, do we call them my own? Merely as we call the bed in the in my own. If, then, the innkeeper dies and leaves you the beds, you will have them, but if he leaves them to someone else, he will have them, and you will look for another bed. If, then, you do not find one, you will have to sleep on the ground, only do so with good courage, snoring and remembering that tragedies find a place among the rich and among kings and tyrants, but no poor man fills a tragic role except as a member of the chorus. Now the kings commence in a state of prosperity, hang the palace with garlands, then, about the third or fourth act, comes alas, Sitheran, why didst thou receive me? Slave. Where are your crowns? Where your diadem? Do your guards avail you not at all? When, therefore, you approach one of those great men, remember all this that you are approaching a tragic character, not the actor, but Oedipus himself. Nay, but so and so is blessed, for he has many companions to walk with. So have I, I fall in line with the multitude and have many companions to walk with. But, to sum it all up, remember that the door has been thrown open. Do not become a greater coward than the children, but just as they say, I won't play any longer, when the thing does not please them, so do you also, when things seem to you to have reached that stage, merely say, I won't play any longer, and take your departure, but if you stay, stop lamenting. Chapter 25. Upon the same theme. If all this is true and we are not silly nor merely playing a part when we say, man's good and man's evil lies in moral choice, and all other things are nothing to us, why are we still distressed and afraid? Over the things that we seriously care for no one has authority, and the things over which other men have authority do not concern us. What kind of thing have we left to discuss? Nay, give me directions. What directions shall I give you? Has not Zeus given you directions? Has he not given you that which is your own, unhindered and unrestrained, while that which is not your own is subject to hindrance and restraint? What directions, then, did you bring with you when you came from him into this world, what kind of an order? Guard by every means that which is your own, but do not grasp at that which is another's. Your faithfulness is your own, your self-respect is your own, who, then, can take these things from you? 
Who but yourself will prevent you from using them? But you, how do you act? When you seek earnestly that which is not your own, you lose that which is your own. Since you have such promptings and directions from Zeus, what kind do you still want from me? Am I greater than he, or more trustworthy? But if you keep these commands of his, do you need any others besides? But has he not given you these directions? Produce your preconceptions, produce the demonstrations of the philosophers, produce what you have often heard, and produce what you have said yourself, produce what you have read, produce what you have practiced. How long, then, is it well to keep these precepts and not to break up the game? As long as it is played pleasantly. At the Saturnalia a king is chosen by lot, for it has been decided to play this game. The king gives his commands, you drink, you mix wine, you sing, you go, you come. I obey, so as not to be the one to break up the game. Come, suppose that you are in an evil plight. I do not so suppose, and who is there to compel me so to suppose? Again, we have agreed to play the story of Agamemnon and Achilles. The one who has been appointed to play the part of Agamemnon says to me, go to Achilles, and drag away Briseis. I go. He says, come, and I come. For as we behave in the matter of hypothetical proposals, so we ought to behave in life also. Let it be night. So be it. What then? Is it day? No, for I have accepted the assumption that it is night. Let us suppose that you assume it to be night so be it. But go on and assume that it is night, that is not consistent with the hypothesis. So also in the present case. Let us suppose that you are unhappy. So be it, are you, then, unfortunate? Yes. What then? Are you troubled with ill fortune? Yes. But go on and assume that you are in a wretched plight. That is not consistent with the hypothesis, moreover, there is another who forbids me so to think. How long, then, should we obey such commands? As long as it is beneficial, and that means, as long as I preserve what is becoming and consistent. Further, some men are unduly crabbed and have two sharp tongues and say, I cannot dine at this fellow's house, where I have to put up with his telling every day how he fought in Moesia, I have told you, brother. How I climbed up to the crest of the hill, well now. I begin to be besieged again. But another says, I would rather dine and hear him babble all he pleases. And it is for you to compare these estimates, only do nothing as one burdened, or afflicted, or thinking that he is in a wretched plight, for no one forces you to this. Has some one made a smoke in the house? If he has made a moderate amount of smoke I shall stay, if too much, I go outside. For one ought to remember and hold fast to this, that the door stands open. But some one says, do not dwell in Nicopolis. I agree not to dwell there. Nor in Athens. I agree not to dwell in Athens, either. Nor in Rome. I agree not to dwell in Rome, either. Dwell in Gyra. I agree to dwell there. But to dwell in Gyra seems to me to be like a great quantity of smoke in the house. I leave for a place where no one will prevent me from dwelling, for that dwelling place stands open to every man. And as for the last inner tunic, that is, my paltry body. Beyond that no one has any authority over me. That is why Demetrius said to Nero, you threaten me with death. But nature threatens you. If I admire my paltry body, I have given myself away as a slave, if I admire my paltry property, I have given myself away as a slave, for at once I show thereby to my own hurt what I can be caught with. Just as when the snake draws in his head, I say, strike that part of him which he is protecting, so do you be assured that your master will attack you at that point which you particularly wish to protect. If you remember all this, whom will you flatter or fear any more? But I wish to sit where the senators do. Do you realize that you are making close quarters for yourself, that you are crowding yourself? How else, then, shall I have a good view in the amphitheater? Man, do not become spectator and you will not be crowded. Why do you make trouble for yourself? Or else wait a little while, and when the show is over sit down among the seats of the senators and sun yourself. For in general remember this that we crowd ourselves, we make close quarters for ourselves, that is to say, the decisions of our will crowd us and make us close quarters. Why, what is this matter of being reviled? Take your stand by a stone and revile it, and what effect will you produce? If, then, a man listens like a stone, what profit is there to the reviler? But if the reviler has the weakness of the reviled as a point of vantage, then he does accomplish something. Strip him. Why do you say him? 
Take his cloak and strip that off. I have outraged you. Much good may it do you. This is what Socrates practiced, and that is why he always wore the same expression on his face. But we prefer to practice and rehearse anything rather than how to be untrammeled and free. The philosophers talk paradoxes, you say. But are there not paradoxes in the other arts? And what is more paradoxical than to lance a man in the eye in order that he may see? If anyone said this to a man who was inexperienced in the art of surgery, would he not laugh at the speaker? What is there to be surprised at, then, if in philosophy also many things which are true appear paradoxical to the inexperienced? Chapter 26. What is the rule of life? As someone was reading the hypothetical arguments, Epictetus said, this also is a law governing hypotheses that we must accept what the hypothesis or premise demands. But much more important is the following law of life that we must do what nature demands. For if we wish in every matter and circumstance to observe what is in accordance with nature, it is manifest that in everything we should make it our aim neither to avoid that which nature demands, nor to accept that which is in conflict with nature. The philosophers. Therefore. Exercise us first in the theory where there is less difficulty, and then after that lead us to the more difficult matters, for in theory there is nothing which holds us back from following what we are taught, but in the affairs of life there are many things which draw us away. He is ridiculous, then, who says that he wishes to begin with the latter, for it is not easy to begin with the more difficult things. And this is the defense that we ought to present to such parents as are angry because their children study philosophy. Very well then, father, I go astray, not knowing what is incumbent upon me or what my duty is. Now if this is a thing that can neither be taught nor learned, why do you reproach me? But if it can be taught, teach me, and if you cannot do this, allow me to learn from those who profess to know. Really, what is your idea? That I intentionally fall into evil and miss the good? Far from it. What, then, is the cause of my going astray? Ignorance. Very well. Do you not want me to put away my ignorance? Whom did anger ever teach the art of steering, or music? Do you think, then, that your anger will make me learn the art of living? Only he can so speak who has applied himself to philosophy in such a spirit. But if a man reads upon the subject and resorts to the philosophers merely because he wants to make a display at a banquet of his knowledge of hypothetical arguments, what else is he doing but trying to win the admiration of some senator sitting by his side? For there in Rome are found in truth the great resources, while the riches of Nicopolis look to them like mere child's play. Hence it is difficult there for a man to control his own external impressions, since the distracting influences at Rome are great. I know a certain man who clung in tears to the knees of Epaphroditus and said that he was in misery, for he had nothing left but a million and a half sesterces. What, then, did Epaphroditus do? Did he laugh at him as you are laughing? No, he only said, in a tone of amazement. Poor man, how, then, did you manage to keep silence? How did you endure it? Once when he had disconcerted the student who was reading the hypothetical arguments, and the one who had set the other the passage to read laughed at him, Epictetus said to the latter, you are laughing at yourself. You did not give the young man a preliminary training, nor discover whether he was able to follow these arguments, but you treat him merely as a reader. Why is it, then, he added, that to a mind unable to follow a judgment upon a complex argument we entrust the assigning of praise or blame, or the passing of a judgment upon what is done well or ill? If such a person speaks ill of another, does the man in question pay any attention to him, or if he praises another, is the latter elated? When the one who is dispensing praise or blame is unable, in matters as trivial as these, to find the logical consequence. This, then, is a starting point in philosophy. A perception of the state of one's own governing principle, for when once a man realizes that it is weak, he will no longer wish to employ it upon great matters. But as it is, some who are unable to swallow the morsel by a whole treatise and set to work to eat that. Consequently they throw up, or have indigestion, after that come colics and fluxes and fevers. But they ought first to have considered whether they have the requisite capacity. However, in a matter of theory it is easy enough to confute the man who does not know, but in the affairs of life a man does not submit himself to confutation, and we hate the person who has confuted us. But Socrates used to tell us not to live a life unsubjected to examination. Chapter 27. In how many ways do the external impressions arise, and what aids should we have ready at hand to deal with them?
the external impressions come to us in four ways, for either things are, and seem so to be, or they are not, and do not seem to be, either, or they are, and do not seem to be, or they are not, and yet seem to be. Consequently, in all these cases it is the business of the educated man to hit the mark. But whatever be the thing that distresses us, against that we ought to bring up our reinforcements. If the things that distress us are sophisms of Pyrrho and the Academy, let us bring up our reinforcements against them, if they are the plausibilities of things, whereby we are led to think that certain things are good when they are not, let us seek reinforcements at that point. If the thing that distresses us is a habit, we should try to hunt up the reinforcements with which to oppose that. What reinforcements, then, is it possible to find with which to oppose habit? Why, the contrary habit? You hear the common folk saying, that poor man. He is dead, his father perished, and his mother, he was cut off, yes, and before his time, and in a foreign land. Listen to the arguments on the other side, tear yourself away from these expressions, set over against one habit the contrary habit. To meet sophistic arguments we must have the processes of logic and the exercise and the familiarity with these, against the plausibilities of things we must have our preconceptions clear polished like weapons, and ready at hand. When death appears to be an evil, we must have ready at hand the argument that it is our duty to avoid evils, and that death is an inevitable thing. For what can I do? Where shall I go to escape it? Suppose that I am Sarpedon the son of Zeus, in order that I may nobly say, as he did, seeing that I have left my home for the war, I wish either to win the prize of valour myself, or else to give someone else the chance to win it, if I am unable to succeed in something myself. I shall not begrudge another the achievement of some noble deed. Granted that such an act as Sarpedon's is beyond us, does not the other alternative fall within the compass of our powers? And where can I go to escape death? Show me the country, show me the people to whom I may go, upon whom death does not come, show me a magic charm against it. If I have none, what do you wish me to do? I cannot avoid death. Instead of avoiding the fear of it, shall I die in lamentation and trembling? For the origin of sorrow is this to wish for something that does not come to pass. Therefore, if I can change externals according to my own wish, I change them, but if I cannot, I am ready to tear out the eyes of the man who stands in my way. For it is man's nature not to endure to be deprived of the good, not to endure to fall into the evil. Then, finally, when I can neither change the circumstances, nor tear out the eyes of the man who stands in my way, I sit down and groan. And revile whom I can. Zeus and the rest of the gods, for if they do not care for me, what are they to me? Yes, you say, but that will be impious of you. What, then, shall I get that is worse than what I have now? In short, we must remember this that unless piety and self-interest be conjoined, piety cannot be maintained in any man. Do not these considerations seem urgent? Let the follower of Pyrrho or of the academy come and oppose us. Indeed I, for my part, have no leisure for such matters, nor can I act as advocate to the commonly received opinion. If I had a petty suit about a mere bit of land, I should have called in someone else to be my advocate. With what evidence, then, am I satisfied? With that which belongs to the matter in hand. To the question how perception arises, whether through the whole body, or from some particular part, perhaps I do not know how to give a reasonable answer, and both views perplex me but that you and I are not the same persons. I know very certainly. Whence do I get this knowledge? When I want to swallow something, I never take the morsel to that place but to this, when I wish to take bread I never take sweepings, but I always go after the bread as to a mark. And do you yourselves, who take away the evidence of the senses, do anything else? Who among you when he wishes to go to a bath goes to a mill instead? What then? Ought we not to the best of our ability hold fast also to this maintain, that is, the commonly received opinion, and be on our guard against the arguments that seek to overthrow it? And who disputes that? But only the man who has the power and the leisure should devote himself to these studies, while the man who is trembling and perplexed and whose heart is broken within him, ought to devote his leisure to something else. Chapter 28. That we ought not to be angry with men, and what are the little things and the great among men? What is the reason that we assent to anything? The fact that it appears to us to be so. It is impossible, therefore, to assent to the thing that appears not to be so. Why? Because this is the nature of the intellect to agree to what is true, to be dissatisfied with what is false, and to withhold judgment regarding what is uncertain. What is the proof of this? Feel, if you can, that it is now night. That is impossible. 
Put away the feeling that it is day. That is impossible. Either feel or put away the feeling that the stars are even in number. That is impossible. When, therefore, a man assents to a faucet, rest assured that it was not his wish to assent to it as false, for every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth, as Plato says, it only seemed to him that the false was true. Well now, in the sphere of actions what have we corresponding to the true and the false here in the sphere of perceptions? Duty and what is contrary to duty, the profitable and the unprofitable, that which is appropriate to me and that which is not appropriate to me, and whatever is similar to these. Cannot a man, then, think that something is profitable to him, and yet not choose it? He cannot. How of her who says? Now, now, I learn what horrors I intend, but passion overmastereth sober thought. It is because the very gratification of her passion and the taking of vengeance on her husband she regards as more profitable than the saving of her children. Yes, but she is deceived. Show her clearly that she is deceived. And she will not do it, but so long as you do not show it. What else has she to follow but that which appears to her to be true? Nothing. Why, then, are you angry with her, because the poor woman has gone astray in the greatest matters, and has been transformed from a human being into a viper? Why do you not, if anything, rather pity her? As we pity the blind and the halt, why do we not pity those who have been made blind and halt in their governing faculties? Whoever, then, bears this clearly in mind, that the measure of man's every action is the impression of his senses, now this impression may be formed rightly or wrongly, if rightly, the man is blameless, if wrongly, the man himself pays the penalty, for it is impossible that the man who has gone astray, is one person, while the man who suffers is another. Whoever remembers this, I say, will not be enraged at anyone, will not be angry with anyone, will not revile anyone, will not blame, nor hate, nor take offence at anyone. So you conclude that such great and terrible things have their origin in this the impression of one's senses? In this and nothing else. The Iliad is nothing but a sense impression and a poet's use of sense impressions. There came to Alexander an impression to carry off the wife of Menelaus, and an impression came to Helen to follow him. Now if an impression had led Menelaus to feel that it was again to be deprived of such a wife, what would have happened? We should have lost not merely the Iliad, but the Odyssey as well. Then do matters of such great import depend upon one that is so small, but what do you mean by matters of such great import? Wars and factions and deaths of many men and destructions of cities? And what is there great in all this? What, nothing great in this? Why, what is there great in the death of many oxen and many sheep and the burning and destruction of many nests of swallows or storks? Is there any similarity between this and that? A great similarity. Men's bodies perished in the one case, and bodies of oxen and sheep in the other. Petty dwellings of men were burned, and so were nests of storks. What is there great or dreadful about that? Or else show me in what respect a man's house and a stork's nest differ as a place of habitation. Is there any similarity between a stork and a man? What is that you say? As far as the body is concerned, a great similarity, except that the petty houses of men are made of beams and tiles and bricks, but the nest of a stork is made of sticks and clay. Does a man, then, differ in no wise from a stork? Far from it, but in these matters he does not differ. In what wise, then, does he differ? Seek and you will find that he differs in some other respect. See whether it be not in his understanding what he does, see whether it be not in his capacity for social action, in his faithfulness, his self-respect, his steadfastness, his security from error, his intelligence. Where, then, is the great evil and the great good among men? Just where the difference is, and if that element wherein the difference lies be preserved and stands firm and well fortified on every side, and neither his self-respect, nor his faithfulness, nor his intelligence be destroyed, then the man also is preserved, but if any of these qualities be destroyed or taken by storm, then the man also is destroyed. And it is in this sphere that the great things are. Did Alexander come to his great fall when the Hellenes assailed Troy with their ships, and when they were devastating the land, and when his brothers were dying? Not at all, for no one comes to his fall because of another's deed, but what went on then was merely the destruction of storks' nests. Nay, he came to his fall when he lost his self-respect, his faithfulness, his respect for the laws of hospitality, his decency of behaviour. When did Achilles come to his fall? When Patroclus died. Far from it, but when Achilles himself was enraged, when he was crying about a paltry damsel, when he forgot that he was there, not to get sweethearts, but to make war. 
These are the falls that come to mankind, this is the siege of their city, this is the raising of it when their correct judgments are torn down, when these are destroyed. Then when women are driven off into captivity, and children are enslaved, and when the men themselves are slaughtered, are not all these things evils. Where do you get the justification for adding this opinion? Let me know also. No, on the contrary, do you let me know where you get the justification for saying that they are not evils? Let us turn to our standards, produce your preconceptions. For this is why I cannot be sufficiently astonished at what men do. In a case where we wish to judge of weights, we do not judge at haphazard, where we wish to judge what is straight and what is crooked, we do not judge at haphazard, in short, where it makes any difference to us to know the truth in the case, no one of us will do anything at haphazard. Yet where there is involved the first and only cause of acting aright or erring, of prosperity or adversity, of failure or success, there alone are we haphazard and headlong. There I have nothing like a balance, there nothing like a standard, but some sense impression comes and immediately I go and act upon it. What, am I any better than Agamemnon or Achilles are they because of following the impressions of their senses to do and suffer such evils, while I am to be satisfied with the impression of my senses? And what tragedy has any other source than this? What is the Atreus of Euripides? His sense impression. The Oedipus of Sophocles? His sense impression. The Phoenix? His sense impression. The Hippolytus? His sense impression. What kind of a man, then, do you think he is who pays no attention to this matter? What are those men called who follow every impression of their senses? Madmen. Are we, then, acting differently? Chapter 29 of steadfastness. The essence of the good is a certain kind of moral purpose, and that of the evil is a certain kind of moral purpose. What, then, are the external things? They are materials for the moral purpose, in dealing with which it will find its own proper good or evil. How will it find the good? If it does not admire the materials. For the judgments about the materials, if they be correct, make the moral purpose good, but if they be crooked and awry, they make it evil. This is the law which God has ordained, and he says, if you wish any good thing, get it from yourself. You say, no, but from someone else. Do not so, but get it from yourself. For the rest, when the tyrant threatens and summons me, I answer whom are you threatening? If he says, I will put you in chains, I reply, he is threatening my hands and my feet. If he says, I will behead you, I answer, he is threatening my neck. If he says, I will throw you into prison, I say. He is threatening my whole paltry body, and if he threatens me with exile, I give the same answer. Does he, then, threaten you not at all? If I feel that all this is nothing to me. Not at all, but if I am afraid of any of these threats, it is I whom he threatens. Who is there left, then, for me to fear? The man who is master of what? The things that are under my control? But there is no such man. The man who is master of the things that are not under my control? And what do I care for them? Do you philosophers, then, teach us to despise our kings? Far from it. Who among us teaches you to dispute their claim to the things over which they have authority? Take my paltry body, take my property, take my reputation, take those who are about me. If I persuade any to lay claim to these things, let some man truly accuse me. Yes, but I wish to control your judgments also. And who has given you this authority? How can you have the power to overcome another's judgment? By bringing fear to bear upon him, he says, I shall overcome him. You fail to realize that the judgment overcame itself, it was not overcome by something else, and nothing else can overcome moral purpose, but it overcomes itself. For this reason too the law of God is most good and most just, let the better always prevail over the worse. Ten are better than one, you say. For what? For putting in chains, for killing, for dragging away where they will, for taking away a man's property. Ten overcome one, therefore. In the point in which they are better. In what, then, are they worse? If the one has correct judgments, and the ten have not. What then? Can they overcome in this point? How can they? But if we are weighed in the balance, must not the heavier draw down the scales? So that a Socrates may suffer what he did at the hands of the Athenians? Slave, why do you say Socrates? Speak of the matter as it really is and say, that the paltry body of Socrates may be carried off and dragged to prison by those who were stronger than he, and that someone may give hemlock to the paltry body of Socrates, and that it may grow cold and die? 
Does this seem marvelous to you? Does this seem unjust? For this do you blame God? Did Socrates, then, have no compensation for this? In what did the essence of the good consist for him? To whom shall we listen, to you or to Socrates himself? And what does he say? Enitus and Melitus can kill me, but they cannot hurt me. And again, if so it is pleasing to God, so let it be. But do you prove that one who holds inferior judgments prevails over the man who is superior in point of judgments? You will not be able to prove this, no, nor even come near proving it. For this is a law of nature and of God, let the better always prevail over the worse. Prevail in what? In that in which it is better. One body is stronger than another body, several persons are stronger than one, the thief is stronger than the man who is not a thief. That is why I lost my lamp, because in the matter of keeping awake the thief was better than I was. However, he bought a lamp for a very high price, for a lamp he became a thief, for a lamp he became faithless, for a lamp he became beast-like. This seemed to him to be profitable. Very well, but now someone has taken hold of me by my cloak and pulls me into the marketplace, and then others shout at me, Philosopher, what good have your judgments done you? See, you are being dragged off to prison, see, you are going to have your head cut off. And what kind of introduction to philosophy could I have studied, which would prevent me from being dragged off, if a man who is stronger than I am should take hold of my cloak? Or would prevent me from being thrown into the prison, if ten men should hustle me and throw me unto it? Have I, then? Learn nothing else? I have learned to see that everything which happens, if it be outside the realm of my moral purpose, is nothing to me. Have you, then, derived no benefit from this principle for the present case? Why, then, do you seek your benefit in something other than that in which you have learned that it is? Well, as I sit in the prison I say, the fellow who shouts this at me neither understands what is meant, nor follows what is said, nor has he taken any pains at all to know what philosophers say, or what they do. Don't mind him. But come out of the prison again. If you have no further need of me in the prison, I shall come out, if you ever need me there again, I shall go back in. For how long? For so long as reason chooses that I remain with my paltry body, but when reason does not so choose, take it in good health to you. Only let me not give up my life irrationally, only let me not give up my life faint-heartedly, or from some casual pretext. For again, God does not so desire, for he has need of such a universe, and of such men who go to and fro upon earth. But if he gives the signal to retreat, as he did to Socrates, I must obey him who gives the signal, as I would a general. What then? Must I say these things to the multitude? For what purpose? Is it not sufficient for a man himself to believe them? For example, when the children come up to us and clap their hands and say, Today is the good Saturnalia, do we say to them, All this is not good? Not at all, but we too clap our hands to them. And do you too? Therefore, when you are unable to make a man change his opinion, realize that he is a child and clap your hands to him, but if you do not want to do this, you have merely to hold your peace. All this a man ought to remember, and when he is summoned to meet some such difficulty, he ought to know that the time has come to show whether we are educated. For a young man leaving school and facing a difficulty is like one who has practiced the analysis of syllogisms, and if someone propounds him one that is easy to solve, he says, nay, rather propound me one that is cunningly involved, so that I may get exercise from it. Also the athletes are displeased with the youths of light weight, he cannot lift me, says one. Yonder is a sturdy young man. Oh no, but when the crisis calls, he has to weep and say, I wanted to keep on learning. Learning what? If you do not learn these things so as to be able to manifest them in action, what did you learn them for? I fancy that someone among these who are sitting here is in travail within his own soul and is saying, Alas, that such a difficulty does not come to me now as that which has come to this fellow. Alas, that now I must be worn out sitting in a corner, when I might be crowned at Olympia. When will someone bring me word of such a contest? You ought all to be thus minded. But among the gladiators of Caesar there are some who complain because no one brings them out, or matches them with an antagonist, and they pray God and go to their managers, begging to fight in single combat, and yet will no one of you display a like spirit. I wanted to sail to Rome for this very purpose and to see what my athlete is doing, what practice he is following in his task. I do not want, says he, this kind of a task. What, is it in your power to take any task you want? You have been given such a body, such parents, such brothers, such a country, such a position in it, and then do you come to me and say, change the task for me? 
What? Do you not possess resources to enable you to utilize that which has been given? You ought to say, it is yours to set the task, mine to practice it well. No, but you do say, do not propose to me such and such a hypothetical syllogism, but rather such and such a one, do not urge upon me such and such a conclusion, but rather such and such a one. A time will soon come when the tragic actors will think that their masks and buskins and the long robe are themselves. Man, all these things you have as a subject matter and a task. Say something, so that we may know whether you are a tragic actor or a buffoon, for both of these have everything but their lines in common. Therefore, if one should take away from him both his buskins and his mask, and bring him on the stage as a mere shade of an actor, is the tragic actor lost, or does he abide? If he has a voice, he abides. And so it is in actual life. Take a governorship. I take it and having done so I show how an educated man comports himself. Lay aside the laticlave. And having put on rags come forward in a character to correspond. What then? Has it not been given me to display a fine voice? In what role, then, do you mount the stage now? As a witness summoned by God. God says, Go you and bear witness for me, for you are worthy to be produced by me as a witness. Is any of those things which lie outside the range of the moral purpose either good or evil? Do I injure any man? Have I put each man's advantage under the control of any but himself? What kind of witness do you bear for God? I am in sore straits, O Lord, and in misfortune, no one regards me, no one gives me anything, all blame me and speak ill of me. Is this the witness that you are going to bear, and is this the way in which you are going to disgrace the summons which he gave you, in that he bestowed this honour upon you and deemed you worthy to be brought forward in order to bear testimony so important? But the one who has authority over you declares, I pronounce you impious and profane. What has happened to you? I have been pronounced impious and profane. Nothing else? Nothing. But if he had passed judgment upon some hypothetical syllogism and had made a declaration, I judge the statement, if it is day, there is light, to be false, what has happened to the hypothetical syllogism? Who is being judged in this case, who has been condemned? The hypothetical syllogism, or the man who has been deceived in his judgment about it? Who in the world, then, is this man who has authority to make any declaration about you? Does he know what piety or impiety is? Has he pondered the matter? Has he learned it? Where? Under whose instruction? And yet a musician pays no attention to him, if he declares that the lowest string is the highest, nor does a geometrician, if the man decides that the lines extending from the center to the circumference of a circle are not equal, but shall the truly educated man pay attention to an uninstructed person when he passes judgment on what is holy and unholy, and on what is just and unjust? How great is the injustice committed by the educated in so doing? Is this? Then, what you have learned here? Will you not leave to others, mannequins incapable of taking pains, the petty quibbles about these things, so that they may sit in a corner and gather in their petty fees, or grumble because nobody gives them anything, and will you not yourself come forward and make use of what you have learned? For what is lacking now is not quibbles, nay, the books of the Stoics are full of quibbles. What, then, is the thing lacking now? The man to make use of them, the man to bear witness to the arguments by his acts. This is the character I would have you assume, that we may no longer use old examples in the school, but may have some example from our own time also. Whose part is it, then, to contemplate these matters? The part of him who devotes himself to learning, for man is a kind of animal that loves contemplation. But it is disgraceful to contemplate these things like runaway slaves, nay, sit rather free from distractions and listen. Now to tragic actor and now to the Scytherod. And not as those runaways do. For at the very moment when one of them is paying attention and praising the tragic actor, he takes a glance around, and then if someone mentions the word master, they are instantly all in a flutter and upset. It is disgraceful for men who are philosophers to contemplate the works of nature in this spirit. For what is a master? One man is not master of another man, but death and life and pleasure and hardship are his masters. So bring Caesar to me, if he be without these things, and you shall see how steadfast I am. But when he comes with them, thundering and lightening, and I am afraid of them, what else have I done but recognized my master, like the runaway slave? But so long as I have, as it were, only a respite from these threats, I too am acting like a runaway slave who is a spectator in a theatre, I bathe, I drink, I sing, but I do it all in fear and misery. But if I emancipate myself from my masters, that is, 
from those things which render masters terrifying. What further trouble do I have, what master any more? What then? Must I proclaim this to all men? No, but I must treat with consideration those who are not philosophers by profession, and say, this man advises for me that which he thinks good in his own case, therefore I excuse him. For Socrates excused the jailer who wept for him when he was about to drink the poison, and said, how generously he has wept for us. Does he, then, say to the jailer, this is why we sent the women away? No, but he makes this latter remark to his intimate friends, to those who were fit to hear it, that the jailer he treats with consideration like a child. Chapter 30. What aid ought we to have ready at hand in difficulties? When you come into the presence of some prominent man, remember that another looks from above on what is taking place, and that you must please him rather than this man. He, then, who is above asks of you, in your school what did you call exile and imprisonment and bonds and death and disrepute? I call them, things indifferent. What, then, do you call them now? Have they changed at all? No. Have you, then, changed? No. Tell me, then, what things are indifferent? Those that are independent of the moral purpose. Tell me also what follows. Things independent of the moral purpose are nothing to me. Tell me also what you thought were the good things. A proper moral purpose and a proper use of external impressions. And what was the end? To follow thee. Do you say all that even now? I say the same things even now. Then enter in, full of confidence and mindful of all this. And you shall see what it means to be a young man who has studied what he ought. When he is in the presence of men who have not studied. As for me, by the gods, I fancy that you will feel somewhat like this, why do we make such great and elaborate preparations to meet what amounts to nothing? Was this what authority amounted to? Was this what the vestibule, the chamberlains, the armed guards amounted to? Was it for all this that I listened to those long discourses? Why, all this never amounted to anything, but I was preparing for it as though it were something great. Book 2. Chapter 1. That confidence does not conflict with caution. Perhaps the following contention of the philosophers appears paradoxical to some, but nevertheless let us to the best of our ability consider whether it is true that we ought to do everything both cautiously and confidently at the same time. For caution seems to be in a way contrary to confidence, and contraries are by no means consistent. But that which appears to many to be paradoxical in the matter under discussion seems to me to involve something of this sort, if we demanded that a man should employ both caution and confidence in regard to the same things, then we would be justly charged with uniting qualities that are not to be united. But, as a matter of fact, what is there strange about the saying? For if the statements which have often been made and often proved are sound, namely that the nature of the good as well as of the evil lies in a use of the impressions of the senses, but the things which lie outside the province of the moral purpose admit neither the nature of the evil, nor the nature of the good, what is there paradoxical about the contention of the philosophers, if they say, where the things that lie outside the province of the moral purpose are involved, there show confidence, but where the things that lie within the province of the moral purpose are involved, there show caution? For if the evil lies in an evil exercise of the moral purpose, it is only in regard to matters of this kind that it is right to employ caution, but if the things which lie outside the province of the moral purpose and are not under our control are nothing to us, we ought to employ confidence in regard to them. And so we shall be at one and the same time both cautious and confident, yes, and, by Zeus, confident because of our caution. For because we are cautious about the things which are really evil, the result will be that we shall have confidence in regard to the things which are not of that nature. However, we act like deer, when the hinds are frightened by the feathers and run away from them, where do they turn, and to what do they fly for refuge as a safe retreat? Why, to the nets, and so they perish because they have confused the objects of fear with the objects of confidence. So it is with us also, where do we show fear? About the things which lie outside the province of the moral purpose. Again, in what do we behave with confidence as if there were no danger? In the things which lie within the province of the moral purpose. To be deceived, or to act impetuously, or to do something shameless. Or with base passion to desire something. Makes no difference to us, if only in the matters which lie outside the province of the will we succeed in our aim. But where death, or exile, or hardship, or ignominy faces us. There we show the spirit of running away, there we show violent agitation. 
therefore, as might be expected of those men who are in matters of the greatest concern, we transform our natural confidence into boldness, desperateness, recklessness, shamelessness, while our natural caution and self-respect we transform into cowardice and abjectness, full of fears and perturbations. For if a man should transfer his caution to the sphere of the moral purpose and the deeds of the moral purpose, then along with the desire to be cautious he will also at once have under his control the will to avoid, whereas, if he should transfer his caution to those matters which are not under our control and lie outside the province of the moral purpose, inasmuch as he is applying his will to avoid towards those things which are under the control of others, he will necessarily be subject to fear, instability, and perturbation. For it is not death or hardship that is a fearful thing. But the fear of hardship or death. That is why we praise the man who said not death is dreadful, but a shameful death. Our confidence ought, therefore, to be turned toward death, and our caution toward the fear of death, whereas we do just the opposite in the face of death we turn to flight, but about the formation of a judgment on death we show carelessness, disregard, and unconcern. But Socrates did well to call all such things bugbears. For just as masks appear fearful and terrible to children because of inexperience, in some such manner we also are affected by events, and this for the same reason that children are affected by bugbears. For what is a child? Ignorance. What is a child? Want of instruction. For where a child has knowledge, he is no worse than we are. What is death? A bugbear. Turn it about and learn what it is, see, it does not bite. The poultry body must be separated from the bit of spirit, either now or later, just as it existed apart from it before. Why are you grieved? Then. If it be separated now? For if it be not separated now, it will be later. Why? So that the revolution of the universe may be accomplished, for it has need of the things that are now coming into being, and the things that shall be, and the things that have been accomplished. What is hardship? A bugbear. Turn it about and learn what it is. The poor flesh is subjected to rough treatment, and then again to smooth. If you do not find this profitable, the door stands open, if you do find it profitable, bear it. For the door must be standing open for every emergency, and then we have no trouble. What, then, is the fruit of these doctrines? Precisely that which must needs be both the fairest and the most becoming for those who are being truly educated tranquility, fearlessness, freedom. For on these matters we should not trust the multitude, who say, only the free can be educated, but rather the philosophers, who say, only the educated are free. How is that? Thus, at this time is freedom anything but the right to live as we wish? Nothing else. Tell me, then, O oh men, do you wish to live in error? We do not. Well, no one who lives in error is free. Do you wish to live in fear, in sorrow, in turmoil? By no means. Well then, no man who is in fear, or sorrow, or turmoil, is free, but whoever is rid of sorrows and fears and turmoils, this man is by the selfsame course rid also of slavery. How, then, shall we any longer trust you, O dearest lawgivers? Do we allow none but the free to get an education? For the philosophers say, we do not allow any but the educated to be free, that is, God does not allow it. When, therefore, in the presence of the praetor a man turns his own slave about, has he done nothing? He has done something. What? He has turned his slave about in the presence of the praetor. Nothing more? Yes, he is bound to pay a tax of 5% of the slave's value. What then? Has not the man to whom this has been done become free? He has no more become free than he has acquired peace of mind. You, for example, who are able to turn others about, have you no master? Have you not as your master money, or a mistress, or a boy favourite, or the tyrant, or some friend of the tyrant? If not, why do you tremble when you go to face some circumstance involving those things? That is why I say over and over again, practice these things and have them ready at hand, that is, the knowledge of what you ought to face with confidence, and what you ought to face with caution that you ought to face with confidence that which is outside the province of the moral purpose, with caution that which is within the province of the moral purpose. But have I not read to you, and do you not know what I am doing? What have you been engaged upon? Trifling phrases. Keep your trifling phrases. Show me rather how you stand in regard to desire and aversion, whether you do not fail to get what you wish, or do not fall into what you do not wish. As for those trifling periods of yours, if you are wise, you will take them away somewhere and blot them out. What then? 
Did not Socrates write? Yes, who wrote as much as he. But how? Since he could not have always at hand someone to test his judgments, or to be tested by him in turn, he was in the habit of testing and examining himself, and was always in a practical way trying out some particular primary conception. That is what a philosopher writes, but trifling phrases, and said he, said I he leaves to others, to the stupid or the blessed, those who by virtue of their tranquility live at leisure, or those who by virtue of their folly take no account of logical conclusions. And now, when the crisis calls, will you go off and make an exhibition of your compositions, and give a reading from them, and boast, see, how I write dialogues. Do not so, man, but rather boast as follows, see how in my desire I do not fail to get what I wish. See how in my aversions I do not fall into things that I would avoid. Bring on death and you shall know, bring on hardships, bring on imprisonment, bring on disrepute. Bring on condemnation. This is the proper exhibition of a young man come from school. Leave other things to other people, neither let anyone ever hear a word from you about them. Nor, if anyone praises you for them, do you tolerate it, but let yourself be accounted a nobody and a know-nothing. Show that you know this only how you may never either fail to get what you desire or fall into what you avoid. Let others practice lawsuits, others' problems, others' syllogisms, do you practice how to die, how to be enchained, how to be racked, how to be exiled. Do all these things with confidence, with trust in him who has called you to face them and deemed you worthy of this position, in which having once been placed you shall exhibit what can be achieved by a rational governing principle when arrayed against the forces that lie outside the province of the moral purpose. And thus the paradox of which we were speaking will no longer appear either impossible or paradoxical, namely, that at the same time we ought to be both cautious and confident, confident in regard to those things that lie outside the province of the moral purpose and cautious in regard to those things that lie within the province of the moral purpose. Chapter 2. On Tranquility. Consider, you who are going to court, what you wish to maintain and wherein you wish to succeed, for if you wish to maintain freedom of moral purpose in its natural condition, all security is yours, every facility yours, you have no trouble. For if you are willing to keep guard over those things which are under your direct authority and by nature free, and if you are satisfied with them, what else do you care about? For who is master of them, who can take them away from you? If you wish to be self-respecting and honourable, who is it that will not allow you? If you wish not to be hindered nor compelled, what man will compel you to desire what does not seem to you to be desirable, to avoid what you do not feel should be avoided? Well, what then? The judge will do some things to you which are thought to be terrifying, but how can he make you try to avoid what you suffer? When, therefore, desire and aversion are under your own control. What more do you care for? This is your introduction, this the setting forth of your case, this your proof, this your victory, this your peroration, this your approbation. That is why Socrates, in reply to the man who was reminding him to make preparation for his trial, said, Do you not feel, then, that with my whole life I am making preparation for this? What kind of preparation? I have maintained, says he, that which is under my control. How then? I have never done anything that was wrong either in my private or in my public life. But if you wish to maintain also what is external, your paltry body and your petty estate and your small reputation, I have this to say to you, begin this very moment to make all possible preparation, and furthermore study the character of your judge and your antagonist. If you must clasp men's knees, clasp them, if you must wail, then wail, if you must groan, then groan. For when you subject what is your own to externals, then from henceforth be a slave, and stop letting yourself be drawn this way and that, at one moment wishing to be a slave, at another not, but be either this or that simply and with all your mind, either a free man or a slave, either educated or uneducated, either a spirited fighting cock or a spiritless one, either endure to be beaten until you die, or give in at once. Far be it from you to receive many blows and yet at the last give in. But if that is disgraceful, Begin this very moment to decide the question, where is the nature of good and evil to be found? Where truth also is. Where truth and where nature are, there is caution, where truth is, there is confidence, where nature is. Why, do you think that if Socrates had wished to maintain his external possessions he would have come forward and said, Enetus and Melitus are able indeed to kill me. But they cannot harm me? Was he so foolish as not to see that this course does not lead to that goal, but elsewhere? Why is it unreasonable, then, to add also a word of provocation? 
just as my friend Heraclitus, who had an unimportant lawsuit about a small piece of land in Rhodes, after he had pointed out the justice of his claim he went on to the peroration in which he said, but neither will I entreat you, nor do I care what your decision is going to be, and it is you who are on trial rather than I. And so he ruined his case. What is the use of acting like that? Merely make no entreaties, but do not add the words yes, and I make no entreaties, unless the right time has come for you, as it did for Socrates, deliberately to provoke your judges. If you, for your part, are preparing a peroration of that sort, why do you mount the platform at all, why answer the summons? For if you wish to be crucified, Wait and the cross will come, but if reason decides that you should answer the summons and do your best to have what you say carry conviction. You must act in accordance therewith, but always maintaining what is your own proper character. Looked at in this way it is also absurd to say, advise me. What advice am I to give you? Nay, say rather, enable my mind to adapt itself to whatever comes. Since the other expression is just as if an illiterate should say, tell me what to write when some name is set me to write. For if I say, write Dio, and then his teacher comes along and sets him not the name Dio, but Theo, what will happen? What will he write? But if you have practiced writing, you are able also to prepare yourself for everything that is dictated to you, if you have not practiced, what advice can I now offer you? For if circumstances dictate something different, what will you say or what will you do? Bear in mind, therefore, this general principle and you will not be at a loss for a suggestion. But if you gape open mouth at externals, you must need to be tossed up and down according to the will of your master. And who is your master? He who has authority over any of the things upon which you set your heart or which you wish to avoid. Chapter 3. To those who recommend persons to the philosophers. That is an excellent answer of Diogenes to the man who asked for a letter of recommendation from him, that you are a man, he says, he will know at a glance, but whether you are a good or a bad man he will discover if he has the skill to distinguish between good and bad, and if he is without that skill he will not discover the facts, even though I write him thousands of times. For it is just as though a drachma asked to be recommended to someone, in order to be tested. If the man in question is an assayer of silver, you will recommend yourself. We ought, therefore, to have also in everyday life the sort of thing that we have in the case of silver, so that I may be able to say, as the assayer of silver says, bring me any drachma you please, and I will appraise it. Now in the case of syllogisms I say, bring me any you please and I will distinguish for you between the one that is capable of analysis and the one that is not. How so? Because, I know how to analyze syllogisms myself, I have the faculty which the man must have who is going to appraise those who handle syllogisms properly. But in everyday life what do I do? Sometimes I call a thing good, and sometimes bad. What is the reason? The opposite of what was true in the case of syllogisms, namely, ignorance and inexperience. Chapter 4. To the man who had once been caught in adultery. As Epictetus was remarking that man is born to fidelity, and that the man who overthrows this is overthrowing the characteristic quality of man, there entered one who had the reputation of being a scholar, and who had once been caught in the city in the act of adultery. But, goes on Epictetus, if we abandon this fidelity to which we are by nature born, and make designs against our neighbor's wife, what are we doing? Why? What but ruining and destroying? Who? The man of fidelity, of self-respect, of piety. Is that all? Are we not overthrowing also neighborly feeling, friendship, the state? In what position are we placing ourselves? As what am I to treat you, fellow? As a neighbor, as a friend? Of what kind? As a citizen? What confidence am I to place in you? If you were a vessel so cracked that it was impossible to use you for anything, you would be cast forth upon the dunghills and even from there no one would pick you up, but if, although a man, you cannot fill a man's place, what are we going to do with you? For, assuming that you cannot hold the place of a friend, can you hold that of a slave? And who is going to trust you? Are you not willing, therefore, that you too should be cast forth upon some dunghill as a useless vessel, as a piece of dung? For all that will you say, nobody cares for me, a scholar. No, for you are an evil man, and useless. It is just as if the wasps complained that nobody cares for them. But all run away from them, and, if anyone can, he strikes them and knocks them down. You have such a sting that you involve in trouble and pain whomever you strike. What do you want us to do with you? There is no place where you can be put. What then, you say, are not women by nature common property? 
I agree. And the little pig is the common property of the invited guests, but when portions have been assigned, if it so pleases you, approach and snatch up the portion of the guest who reclines at your side, steal it secretly, or slip in your hand and glut your greed, and if you cannot tear off a piece of the meat, get your fingers greasy and lick them. A fine companion you would make at a feast, and a dinner guest worthy of Socrates. Come now, is not the theatre the common property of the citizens? When, therefore, they are seated there, go, if it so pleases you, and throw someone of them out of his seat. In the same way women also are by nature common property. But when the lawgiver, like a host at a banquet, has apportioned them, are you not willing like the rest to look for your own portion instead of filching away and glutting your greed upon that which is another's? But I am a scholar and understand Archidemus. Very well then, understand Archidemus and be an adulterer and faithless and a wolf or an ape instead of a man, for what is there to prevent you? Chapter 5. How are magnanimity and carefulness compatible? Materials are indifferent, but the use which we make of them is not a matter of indifference. How, therefore, shall a man maintain steadfastness and peace of mind, and at the same time the careful spirit and that which is neither reckless nor negligent? If he imitates those who play at dice. The counters are indifferent, the dice are indifferent, how am I to know what is going to fall? But to make a careful and skillful use of what has fallen, that is now my task. In like manner, therefore. The principal task in life is this, distinguish matters and weigh them one against another. And say to yourself, externals are not under my control, moral choice is under my control. Where am I to look for the good and the evil? Within me, in that which is my own. But in that which is another's never employ the words good or evil, or benefit or injury, or anything of the sort. What then? Are these externals to be used carelessly? Not at all. For this again is to the moral purpose an evil and thus unnatural to it. They must be used carefully, because their use is not a matter of indifference, and at the same time with steadfastness and peace of mind, because the material is indifferent. For in whatever really concerns us, there no man can either hinder or compel me. The attainment of those things in which I can be hindered or compelled is not under my control and is neither good nor bad, but the use which I make of them is either good or bad, and that is under my control. It is, indeed, difficult to unite and combine these two things the carefulness of the man who is devoted to material things and the steadfastness of the man who disregards them, but it is not impossible. Otherwise happiness were impossible. But we act very much as though we were on a voyage. What is possible for me? To select the helmsman, the sailors, the day, the moment. Then a storm comes down upon us. Very well. What further concern have I? For my part has been fulfilled. The business belongs to someone else, that is, the helmsman. But, more than that, the ship goes down. What, then, have I to do? What I can, that is the only thing I do, I drown without fear, neither shrieking nor crying out against God, but recognizing that what is born must also perish. For I am not eternal, but a man, a part of the whole, as an hour is part of a day. I must come on as the hour and like an hour pass away. What difference, then, is it to me how I pass away, whether by drowning or by a fever? For by something of the sort I must needs pass away. This is what you will see skillful ball players doing also. None of them is concerned about the ball as being something good or bad, but about throwing and catching it. Accordingly, form has to do with that, skill with that, and speed, and grace, where I cannot catch the ball even if I spread out my cloak, the expert catches it if I throw. Yet if we catch or throw the ball in a flurry or in fear, what fun is there left? And how can a man be steady, or see what comes next in the game? But one player will say throw. Another, don't throw. And yet another, don't throw it up. That, indeed, would be a strife and not a game. In that sense, then, Socrates knew how to play ball. How so? He knew how to play in the law court. Tell me, says he, Enitus, what do you mean when you say that I do not believe in God? In your opinion who are the demons? Are they not either the offspring of the gods or a hybrid race, the offspring of men and gods? And when Enitus had agreed to that statement Socrates went on, who, then, do you think, can believe that mules exist, but not asses? In so speaking he was like a man playing ball. And at that place and time what was the ball that he was playing with? Imprisonment, exile, drinking poison, being deprived of wife, leaving children orphans. These were the things with which he was playing. 
but nonetheless he played and handled the ball in good form. So ought we also to act, exhibiting the ball player's carefulness about the game, but the same indifference about the object played with, as being a mere ball. For a man ought by all means to strive to show his skill in regard to some of the external materials. Yet without making the material a part of himself, but merely lavishing his skill in regard to it, whatever it may be. So also the weaver does not make wool, but he lavishes his skill on whatever wool he receives. Another gives you sustenance and property and can likewise take them away, yes, and your poultry body itself. Do you accordingly accept the material and work it up? Then if you come forth without having suffered any harm, the others who meet you will congratulate you on your escape, but the man who knows how to observe such matters, if he sees that you have exhibited good form in this affair, will praise you and rejoice with you, but if he sees that you owe your escape to some dishonourable action, he will do the opposite. For where a man may rejoice with good reason, there others may rejoice with him. How, then, can it be said that some externals are natural, and others unnatural? It is just as if we were detached from them. For I will assert of the foot as such that it is natural for it to be clean. But if, if you take it as a foot, and not as a thing detached, it will be appropriate for it to step into mud and trample on thorns and sometimes to be cut off for the sake of the whole body, otherwise it will no longer be a foot. We ought to hold some such view also about ourselves. What are you? A man. Now if you regard yourself as a thing detached, it is natural for you to live to old age, to be rich, to enjoy health. But if you regard yourself as a man and as a part of some whole, on account of that whole it is fitting for you now to be sick, and now to make a voyage and run risks, and now to be in want, and on occasion to die before your time. Why, then, are you vexed? Do you not know that as the foot, if detached, will no longer be a foot, so you too, if detached, will no longer be a man? For what is a man? A part of a state, first of that state which is made up of gods and men, and then of that which is said to be very close to the other the state that is a small copy of the universal state. Must I, then, be put on trial now? Well, would you have someone else be sick of a fever now, someone else go on a voyage, someone else die, someone else be condemned? For it is impossible in such a body as ours, in this universe that envelops us, among these fellow creatures of ours, that such things should not happen, some to one man and some to another. It is your task, therefore, to step forward and say what you should, to arrange these matters as is fitting. Then the judge says, I adjudge you guilty. I reply, may it be well with you. I have done my part, and it is for you to see whether you have done yours. For the judge too runs a risk, do not forget that. Chapter 6. Of indifference in things. The hypothetical syllogism in itself is a matter of indifference, yet the judgment about it is not indifferent, but is either knowledge, or opinion, or delusion. In like manner, although life is a matter of indifference, the use which you make of it is not a matter of indifference. Therefore, when someone tells you, these things also are indifferent, do not become careless, and when someone exhorts you to be careful, do not become abject and overawed by material things. It is good also to know one's own training and capacity, so that where you have had no training you may keep quiet and not be annoyed if some other persons outshine you in those matters. For you in your turn will expect to outshine them in syllogisms, and if they are annoyed at that, you will console them by saying, I have learned this, and you have not. So also in a case where some acquired skill is needed, do not seek that which only practice can give, but leave that to those who have acquired the knack, and be content yourself to remain steadfast. Go and salute so and so. I salute him. How? In no abject spirit. But the door was shut in your face. Yes, for I have not learned how to crawl in at the window, but when I find the door closed, I must either go away or crawl in at the window. But go and do speak to him. I do so speak. In what manner? In no abject spirit. But you did not get what you wanted. Surely that was not your business, was it? Nay, it was his. Why, then, lay claim to that which is another's? If you always bear in mind what is your own and what is another's, you will never be disturbed. Therefore Chrysippus well says, as long as the consequences are not clear to me. I cleave ever to what is better adapted to secure those things that are in accordance with nature, for God himself has created me with the faculty of choosing things. But if I really knew that it was ordained for me to be ill at this present moment, I would even seek illness, for the foot also, if it had a mind, would seek to be covered with mud. For example, why do heads of grain grow? Is it not that they may also become dry? 
but when they become dry, is it not that they may also be harvested? Since they do not grow for themselves alone. If, therefore, they had feeling, ought they to pray that they should never at all be harvested? But never to be harvested at all is a curse for heads of grain. In like manner I would have you know that in the case of men as well it is a curse never to die, it is like never growing ripe, never being harvested. But, since we are ourselves those who must both be harvested and also be aware of the very fact that we are being harvested, we are angry on that account. For we neither know who we are, nor have we studied what belongs to man, as horsemen study what belongs to horses. But Chrysanthus, when he was on the point of striking the foe, refrained because he heard the bugle sound, Sounding the recall, it seemed so much more profitable to him to do the bidding of his general than to follow his own inclination. Yet no one of us is willing, even when necessity calls, to obey her readily, but what we suffer we suffer with fears and groans, and call it circumstances. What do you mean by circumstances, man? If you call circumstances your surroundings, all things are circumstances, but if you use the word of hardships, what hardship is involved when that weekly has come into being is destroyed? The instrument of destruction is a sword, or a wheel, or the sea, or a tile, or a tyrant. What concern is it to you by what road you descend to the house of Hades? They are all equal. But if you care to hear the truth, the road by which the tyrant sends you is the shorter. No tyrant ever took six months to cut a man's throat, but a fever often takes more than a year. All these things are a mere noise and a vaunting of empty names. I run the risk of my life in Caesar's presence. But do I not run a risk by living in Nicopolis, where there are so many earthquakes? And what risk do you yourself take when you cross the Adriatic? Do you not risk your life? But I also risk my opinion at court. Your own opinion? How so? Why, who can compel you to opine anything against your will? But do you mean some other man's opinion? And what kind of risk is it of yours that others should entertain false opinions? But I run the risk of banishment. What is banishment? To be somewhere else than in Rome? Yes. What then? Suppose I am sent to Gyra. If it is to your good, you will go, if not. You have a place to which you may go instead of Gyra where he too will go, whether he will or no, who is sending you to Gyra. Then why do you go up to Rome as though it were some great thing? It amounts to less than your preparation for it, so that a young man of parts may say, it was not worth so much to have listened to so many lectures, and to have written so many exercises, and to have sat so long at the side of a little old man, who was not worth very much himself. Only remember that distinction which is drawn between what is yours and what is not yours. Never lay claim to anything that is not your own. A platform and a prison is each a place, the one high, and the other low, but your moral purpose can be kept the same, if you wish to keep it the same, in either place. And then we shall be emulating Socrates, when we are able to write paeans in prison. But considering what has been our state hitherto, I wonder if we should have endured it. Had someone else said to us in prison. Would you like to have me read you paeans? Why bother me? Do you not know the trouble that I am in? What, is it possible for me in this condition? In what condition? Then? I am about to die. But will other men be immortal? Chapter 7. How should one employ divination? Because we employ divination when there is no occasion for it, many of us neglect many of the duties of life. For what can the diviner see that is of greater import than death, or danger, or illness, or in general such things as these? If, then, it becomes necessary for me to risk my life for my friend, and if it becomes my duty even to die for him, where do I find beyond that any occasion to employ divination? Have I not within me the diviner that has told me the true nature of good and of evil, that has set forth the signs characteristic of both of them? What further use have I, then, of entrails, or of birds? But when he says, it is expedient for you, do I accept it? Why, does he know what is expedient? Does he know what is good? Has he learned the signs characteristic of things good and things evil, as he has the signs characteristic of entrails? For if he knows the signs characteristic of these, he knows also those of things honourable and base, and right and wrong. Man, it is for you to tell me what is indicated by signs life or death, poverty or wealth, but whether these things are expedient or inexpedient, am I going to ask of you? Why don't you speak on points of grammar? Well then, on this matter, in which we mortals are all astray and in conflict with one another, you do speak. 
wherefore, that was an admirable answer which the woman gave who wished to send a boatload of supplies to Gratilla after she had been exiled. To a man who said, Domitian will confiscate them, she replies, I should rather have him confiscate them than myself fail to send them. What, then, induces us to employ divination so constantly? Cowardice, fear of the consequences. This is why we flatter the diviners, saying, Master, shall I inherit my father's property? Let us see, let us offer a sacrifice about that matter. Yes, master, as fortune wills. Then if the diviner says, you will inherit the property, we thank him as though we had received the inheritance from him. That is why they in their turn go on making mock of us. Well, what then? We ought to go to them without either desire or aversion, just as the wayfarer asks the man who meets him which of two roads leads to his destination, without any desire to have the right-hand road lead there any more than the left-hand road, for he does not care to travel one particular road of the two, but merely the one that leads to his destination. So also we ought to go to God as a guide, making use of him as we make use of our eyes, we do not call upon them to show us such and such things by preference, but we accept the impressions of precisely such things as they reveal to us. But as it is, we tremble before the bird auger, lay hold upon him, and appealing to him as if he were a god, we beg of him, saying, Master, have mercy, grant that I come off safe. You slave! What, do you want anything but what is best for you? Is anything else best for you than what pleases God? Why do you do all that in you lies to corrupt your judge, to mislead your counsellor? Chapter 8. What is the true nature of the good? God is helpful, but the good also is helpful. It would seem, therefore, that the true nature of the good will be found to be where we find that of God to be. What, then, is the true nature of God? Flesh? Far from it. Land? Far from it. Fame? Far from it. It is intelligence, knowledge, right reason. Here, therefore, and only here, shall you seek the true nature of the good. Surely you do not seek it at all in a plant, do you? No. Nor in an irrational creature? No. If, then, you seek it in that which is rational, why do you keep on seeking it somewhere else than in that which differentiates the rational from the irrational? Plants are incapable of dealing even with external impressions, for that reason you do not speak of the good in referring to them. The good requires, therefore, the faculty of using external impressions. Can that be all that it requires? For, if that be all, then you must assert that things good and happiness and unhappiness are to be found in the other animals as well as in man. But, as a matter of fact, you do not so assert, and you are right, for even if they have in the highest degree the faculty of using external impressions, still they do not have the faculty of understanding, at all events, their use of the external impressions. And with good reason, for they are born to serve others, and are not themselves of primary importance. The ass, for example, is not born to be of primary importance, is it? No, but because we had need of a back that was able to carry something. But, by Zeus, we had need that it should be able also to walk around, therefore it has further received the faculty of using external impressions, for otherwise it would not be able to walk around. And at about that stage there was an end. But if it, like man, had somehow received the faculty of understanding the use of its external impressions, it is also clear that consequently it would no longer be subject to us. Nor would it be performing these services, but would be our equal and our peer. Will you not, therefore, seek the true nature of the good in that quality the lack of which in all creatures other than man prevents you from using the term good of any of these? But what then? Are not those creatures also works of God? They are, but they are not of primary importance, nor portions of divinity. But you are a being of primary importance, you are a fragment of God, you have within you a part of him. Why, then, are you ignorant of your own kinship? Why do you not know the source from which you have sprung? Will you not bear in mind, whenever you eat, who you are that eat? And whom you are nourishing? Whenever you indulge in intercourse with women, who you are that do this? Whenever you mix in society, whenever you take physical exercise, whenever you converse, do you not know that you are nourishing God, exercising God? You are bearing God about with you, you poor wretch, and know it not. Do you suppose I am speaking of some external God, made of silver or gold? It is within yourself that you bear him, and do not perceive that you are defiling him with impure thoughts and filthy actions. Yet in the presence of even an image of God you would not dare to do anything of the things you are now doing. 
but when God himself is present within you, seeing and hearing everything, are you not ashamed to be thinking and doing such things as these, O oh insensible of your own nature, an object of God's wrath? Again, when we send a young man forth from the school to sundry activities, why are we afraid that he will do something amiss to miss? Have intercourse with women amiss. Be abased if dressed in rags or conceited if he has on fine clothes. This fellow does not know the God within him, this fellow does not know the companion with whom he is setting forth. Nay, can we allow him to say, O oh God, would that I had thee here? Have you not God there, where you are? And when you have him, do you seek for someone else? Or will he have other commands for you than these? Nay, if you were a statue of Phadias, his Athena, or his Zeus, you would have remembered both yourself and your artificer, and if you had any power of perception you would have tried to do nothing unworthy of him that had fashioned you, nor of yourself, and you would have tried not to appear in an unbecoming attitude before the eyes of men, but as it is, because Zeus has made you, do you on that account not care what manner of person you show yourself to be? And yet what comparison is there between the one artificer and the other? Or between the one work of art and the other? And what work of an artificer has forthwith within itself the faculties which its workmanship discloses? Is it not mere stone, or bronze, or gold, or ivory? And the Athena of Phadias, when once it had stretched out its hand and received the Nike upon it, stands in this attitude for all time to come, but the works of God are capable of movement, have the breath of life, can make use of external impressions, and pass judgment upon them. Do you dishonor the workmanship of this craftsman, when you are yourself that workmanship? Nay more, do you go so far as to forget, not only that he fashioned you, but also that he entrusted and committed you to yourself alone, and moreover, by forgetting, do you dishonor your trust? Yet if God had committed some orphan to your care, would you so neglect him? He has delivered your own self into your keeping, saying. I had no one more faithful than you, keep this man for me unchanged from the character with which nature endowed him. Reverent, faithful, high-minded, undismayed, unimpassioned, unperturbed. After that do you fail so to keep him? But men will say, where do you suppose our friend here got his proud look and his solemn countenance? Ah, but my bearing is not yet what it should be. For I still lack confidence in what I have learned and agreed to, I am still afraid of my own weakness. Just let me gain confidence and then you will see the right look in my eye and the right bearing, then, when the statue is finished and polished, I will show it to you. What do you think of it? A lofty air, say you? Heaven forbid. For the Zeus at Olympia does not show a proud look, does he? No, but his gaze is steady, as befits one who is about to say. No word of mine can be revoked or prove untrue. Of such character will I show myself to you faithful. Reverent, noble, unperturbed. You do not mean, therefore, immortal, or ageless, or exempt from disease. No, but one who dies like a god, who bears disease like a god. This is what I have, this is what I can do, but all else I neither have nor can do. I will show you the sinews of a philosopher. What do you mean by sinews? A desire that fails not of achievement, an aversion proof against encountering what it would avoid, an appropriate choice, a thoughtful purpose, a well-considered assent. This is what you shall see. Chapter 9. That although we are unable to fulfill the profession of a man, we adopt that of a philosopher. It is no simple task, this of fulfilling merely the profession of a man. For what is a man? A rational, mortal animal, someone says. To begin with, from what are we distinguished by the rational element? From the wild beasts. And from what else? From sheep and the like. See to it, then. That you never act like a wild beast, if you do. You will have destroyed the man in you, you have not fulfilled your profession. See to it that you never act like a sheep, if you do, the man in you is destroyed in this way also. Well, when do we act like sheep? When we act for the sake of the belly, or of our sex organs, or at random, or in a filthy fashion, or without due consideration, to what level have we degenerated? To the level of sheep. What have we destroyed? The reason. When we act pugnaciously, and injuriously, and angrily, and rudely, to what level have we degenerated? To the level of the wild beasts. Well, the fact is that some of us are wild beasts of a larger size, while others are little animals, malignant and petty, which give us occasion to say, let it be a lion that devours me. By means of all these actions the profession of a man is destroyed. For when is a complex thing preserved? When it fulfills its profession, consequently. 
the salvation of a complex thing is to be composed of parts that are true. When is a discrete thing preserved? When it fulfills its profession? When are flutes, a lyre, a horse, a dog preserved? What is there to be surprised at, then, if a man also is preserved in the same way and in the same way destroyed? Now deeds that correspond to his true nature strengthen and preserve each particular man, carpentry does that for the carpenter, grammatical studies for the grammarian. But if a man acquires the habit of writing ungrammatically, his art must necessarily be destroyed and perish. So modest acts preserve the modest man, whereas immodest acts destroy him, and faithful acts preserve the faithful man while acts of the opposite character destroy him. And again, acts of the opposite character strengthen men of the opposite character, shamelessness strengthens the shameless man, faithlessness the faithless, abuse the abusive, wrath the wrathful, a disproportion between what he receives and what he pays out the miserly. That is why the philosophers admonish us not to be satisfied with merely learning. But to add thereto practice also, and then training. For in the course of years we have acquired the habit of doing the opposite of what we learn and have in use opinions which are the opposite of the correct ones. If, therefore, we do not also put in use the correct opinions, we shall be nothing but the interpreters of other men's judgments. For who is there among us here and now that cannot give a philosophical discourse about good and evil? It will run like this, of things that be, some are good, others evil, and others indifferent, now good things are virtues and everything that partakes in the virtues, evil are the opposite, while indifferent are wealth, health, reputation. Then, if we are interrupted in the midst of our speech by some unusually loud noise, or if someone in the audience laughs at us, we are upset. Where, you philosopher, are the things you are talking about? Where did you get what you were just saying? From your lips, and that is all. Why, then, do you pollute the helpful principles that are not your own? Why do you gamble about matters of the very utmost concern? For to store away bread and wine in a pantry is one thing, and to eat them is another. What is eaten is digested, distributed, becomes sinews, flesh, bones, blood, a good complexion, easy breathing. What is stored away you can readily take and show whenever you please. But you get no good from it except in so far as you are reputed to possess it. For how much better is it to set forth these principles than those of other schools of thought? Sit down now and give a philosophical discourse upon the principles of Epicurus, and perhaps you will discourse more effectively than Epicurus himself. Why, then, do you call yourself a Stoic, why do you deceive the multitude, why do you act the part of a Jew, when you are a Greek? Do you not see in what sense men are severally called Jew, Syrian, or Egyptian? For example, whenever we see a man halting between two faiths, we are in the habit of saying, he is not a Jew, he is only acting the part. But when he adopts the attitude of mind of the man who has been baptized and has made his choice, then he both is a Jew in fact and is also called one. So we also are counterfeit Baptists, ostensibly Jews, but in reality something else, not in sympathy with our own reason, far from applying the principles which we profess. Yet priding ourselves upon them as being men who know them. So, so although we are unable even to fulfill the profession of man, we take on the additional profession of the philosopher so huge a burden. It is as though a man who was unable to raise ten pounds wanted to lift the stone of Ias. Chapter 10 how is it possible to discover a man's duties from the designations which he bears? Consider who you are. To begin with, a man, that is, one who has no quality more sovereign than moral choice, but keeps everything else subordinate to it, and this moral choice itself free from slavery and subjection. Consider, therefore, what those things are from which you are separated by virtue of the faculty of reason. You are separated from wild beasts, you are separated from sheep. In addition to this you are a citizen of the world, and a part of it, not one of the parts destined for service, but one of primary importance, for you possess the faculty of understanding the divine administration of the world. And of reasoning upon the consequences thereof. What, then, is the profession of a citizen? To treat nothing as a matter of private profit, not to plan about anything as though he were a detached unit, but to act like the foot or the hand, which, if they had the faculty of reason and understood the constitution of nature, would never exercise choice or desire in any other way but by reference to the whole. Hence the philosophers well say that if the good and excellent man knew what was going to happen, he would help on the processes of disease and death and maiming, because he would realize that this allotment comes from the orderly arrangement of the whole, and the whole is more sovereign than the part, and the state more sovereign than the citizen. 
but as it is, seeing that we do not know beforehand what is going to happen, it is our duty to cleave to that which is naturally more fit to be chosen, since we are born for this purpose. Next bear in mind that you are a son. What is the profession of this character? To treat everything that is his own as belonging to his father, to be obedient to him in all things, never to speak ill of him to anyone else, nor to say or do anything that will harm him, to give way to him in everything and yield him precedence, helping him as far as is within his power. Next know that you are also a brother. Upon this character also there is incumbent deference, obedience, kindly speech, never to claim as against your brother any of the things that lie outside the realm of your free moral choice, but cheerfully to give them up, so that in the things that do lie within the realm of your free moral choice you may have the best of it. For see what it is, at the price of a head of lettuce, if it so chance, or of a seat, for you to acquire his goodwill how greatly you get the best of it there. Next, if you sit in the town council of some city, Remember that you are a counsellor, if you are young. Remember that you are young, if old, that you are an elder, if a father, that you are a father. For each of these designations, when duly considered, always suggests the acts that are appropriate to it. But if you go off and speak ill of your brother, I say to you, you have forgotten who you are and what your designation is. Why, if you were a smith and used your hammer amiss, you would have forgotten the smith you were, but if you forget the brother you are, and become an enemy instead of a brother, will you seem to yourself to have exchanged nothing for nothing? And if, instead of being a man, a gentle and social being, you have become a wild beast, a mischievous, treacherous, biting animal, have you lost nothing? What, must you lose a bit of pelf so as to suffer damage, and does the loss of nothing else damage a man? Yet, if you lost your skill in the use of language or in music, you would regard the loss of it as damage, but if you are going to lose self-respect and dignity and gentleness, do you think that does not matter? And yet those former qualities are lost from some external cause that is beyond the power of our will, but these latter are lost through our own fault, and it is neither noble to have nor disgraceful to lose these former qualities, but not to have these latter, or having had them to lose them, is a disgrace and a reproach and a calamity. What is lost by the victim of unnatural lust? His manhood. And by the agent? Beside a good many other things he also loses his manhood no less than the other. What does the adulterer lose? He loses the man of self-respect that was, the man of self-control, the gentleman, the citizen, the neighbor. What does the man lose who is given to anger? Something else. Who is given to fear? Something else. No one is evil without loss and damage. Furthermore, if you look for your loss in pelf, all those whom I have just mentioned snuffer neither injury nor loss, nay, if it so chance. They even get gain and profit. When, through some of their deeds just mentioned, they also acquire pelf. But observe that if you make paltry pelf your standard law everything, not even the man who loses his nose will in your eyes have suffered an injury. Oh yes, he has, someone says, for his body is mutilated. Come now, and does the man who has lost his entire sense of smell lose nothing? Is there, then, no such thing as a faculty of the mind, the possession of which means gain to a man, and the loss, injury? What faculty do you mean? Have we not a natural sense of self-respect? We have. Does not the man who destroys this suffer a loss, is he not deprived of something, does he not lose something that belonged to him? Do we not have a natural sense of fidelity, a natural sense of affection, a natural sense of helpfulness, a natural sense of keeping our hands off one another? Shall, therefore, the man who allows himself to suffer loss in such matters, be regarded as having suffered neither injury nor loss? Well, what then? Am I not to injure the man who has injured me? First consider what injury is, and call to mind what you have heard the philosophers say. For if the good lies in moral purpose, and the evil likewise in moral purpose, see if what you are saying does not come to something like this, well, what then? Since so and so has injured himself by doing me some wrong, shall I not injure myself by doing him some wrong? Why, then, do we not represent the case to ourselves in some such light as that? Instead of that, where there is some loss affecting our body or our property, there we count it injury, but is there no injury where the loss affects our moral purpose? For the man who has been deceived or who has done some wrong has no pain in his head, or his eye, or his hip, neither does he lose his land. But these are the things we care for and nothing else, yet the question whether we are going to have a moral purpose characterized by self-respect and good faith, or by shamelessness and bad faith, does not so much as begin to disturb us. Except only in so far as we make it a topic of trivial discussion in the classroom. 
therefore, so far as our trivial discussions go, we do make some progress, but, apart from them, not even the very least. Chapter 11. What is the beginning of philosophy? The beginning of philosophy with those who take it up as they should, and enter in, as it were, by the gate, is a consciousness of a man's own weakness and impotence with reference to the things of real consequence in life. For we come into being without any innate concept of a right-angled triangle, or of a half-tone musical interval, but by a certain systematic method of instruction we are taught the meaning of each of these things, and for that reason those who do not know them also do not fancy that they do. But, on the other hand, who has come into being without an innate concept of what is good and evil, honourable and base, appropriate and inappropriate, and happiness. And of what is proper and falls to our lot. And what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Wherefore, we all use these terms and endeavour to adapt our preconceptions about them to the individual instances. He has done well, as he ought, or as he ought not, he has been unfortunate, or fortunate, he is a wicked man, or he is a just man who of us refrains from expressions of this kind. Who of us waits before he uses them until he has learned what they mean, as those who have no knowledge of lines or sounds wait before they use the terms relating to them. The reason is that we come into the world with a certain amount of instruction upon this matter already given us, as it were, by nature, and that starting with this we have added thereto our opinion. Yes, by Zeus, for do I in my own case not have by gift of nature knowledge of what is noble and base, do I not have a concept of the matter? You do. Do I not apply it to individual instances? You do. Do I not, then, apply it properly? There lies the whole question, and their opinion comes in. For men start with these principles upon which they are agreed, but then, because they make an unsuitable application of them, get into disputes. Since if, in addition to having the principles themselves, they really possessed also the faculty of making suitable application of the same, what could keep them from being perfect? But now, since you think that you can also apply your preconception suitably to the individual cases, tell me, whence do you get this gift? It is because I think so. But on this precise point someone else does not think so, and yet he too fancies that he is applying the principles properly, does he not? He does so fancy. Can both of you, then, be making suitable applications of your preconceptions in the matters upon which your opinions are at variance? We cannot. Can you, then, show us anything higher than your own opinion which will make it possible for us to apply our preconceptions better? And does the madman do anything else but that which seems to him to be good? Is this criterion, then, sufficient in his case also? It is not. Go, therefore, to something higher than your own opinion, and tell us what that is. Behold the beginning of philosophy. A recognition of the conflict between the opinions of men, and a search for the origin of that conflict, and a condemnation of mere opinion, coupled with scepticism regarding it, and a kind of investigation to determine whether the opinion is rightly held, together with the invention of a kind of standard of judgment, as we have invented the balance for the determination of weights, or the carpenter's rule for the determination of things straight and crooked. Is this the beginning of philosophy? Is everything right that every man thinks? Nay, how is it possible for conflicting opinions to be right? Consequently, not all opinions are right. But are our opinions right? Why ours, rather than those of the Syrians, why ours, rather than those of the Egyptians, why ours, rather than my own, or those of so and so? There is no reason why. Therefore, the opinion which each man holds is not a sufficient criterion for determining the truth. For also in the case of weights and measures we are not satisfied with the mere appearance, but we have invented a certain standard to test each. In the present case, then, is there no standard higher than opinion? And yet how can it possibly be that matters of the utmost consequence among men should be undeterminable and undiscoverable? Therefore, there is some standard. Then why do we not look for it and find it, and when we have found it thenceforth use it unswervingly, not so much as stretching out our finger without it? For this is something, I think, the discovery of which frees from madness those who use only opinion as the measure of all things, so that thenceforward, starting with certain principles that are known and clearly discriminated, we may use in the judgment of specific cases an organically articulated system of preconceived ideas. What subject has arisen that we wish to investigate? Pleasure. Subject it to the standard, put it into the balance. Should the good be the sort of thing that we can properly have confidence and trust in? It should. Can we properly have confidence, then, in something that is insecure? No. Pleasure contains no element of security, does it? 
No. Away with it, then, and throw it out of the balance, and drive it far away from the region of things good. But if you are not endowed with keen eyesight and if one balance is not enough for you, bring another. Can one properly feel elated over the good? Yes. Can one properly feel elated, then, over the moment's pleasure? See that you do not say that it is proper, if you do, I shall no longer regard you as a proper person even to have a balance. And so are matters judged and weighed, if we have the standards ready with which to test them, and the task of philosophy is this to examine and to establish the standards, but to go ahead and use them after they have become known is the task of the good and excellent man. Chapter 12. Upon the Art of Argumentation. What a man ought to learn before he will know how to conduct an argument has been precisely defined by the philosophers of our school, but as to the proper use of what we have learned we are still utterly inexperienced. At all events, give to any one of us you please some layman with whom to carry on an argument, he will find no way of dealing with him, but after moving the man a little, in case the latter thwarts him, our man gives up trying to handle him. And thereafter either reviles him. Or laughs him to scorn, and remarks, he is a mere layman, it is impossible to do anything with him. But the real guide, whenever he finds a person going astray, leads him back to the right road, instead of leaving him with a scornful laugh or an insult. So also do you show him the truth and you will see that he follows. But so long as you do not show him the truth, do not laugh him to scorn, but rather recognize your own incapacity. How did Socrates act? He used to force the man who was arguing with him to be his witness, and never needed any other witness. That is why he could say, I can dispense with all the others, and am always satisfied to have my fellow disputant for a witness, and the votes of the rest I do not take, but only that of my fellow disputant. For he used to make so clear the consequences which followed from the concepts, that absolutely Evervone realized the contradiction involved and gave up the battle. And so does the man who feels envy rejoice in it. Not at all, but he experiences pain rather than joy. By the contradiction in terms he has moved the other party to the argument. Very well, does envy seem to you to be feeling of pain at evils? And yet what envy is there of evils? Consequently, he has made his opponent say that envy is a feeling of pain at good things. Very well, would a man feel envy about matters that did not concern him in the least? Not at all. And so he filled out and articulated the concept, and after that went his way, he did not start in by saying, define envy for me, and then, when the other had defined it, remark, that is a bad definition you have made, for the definition term does not fit the subject defined. Those are technical terms, and for that reason wearisome to the layman and hard for him to follow, and yet we are unable to dispense with them. But as to terms which the layman could himself follow, and so, by the assistance of his own external impressions, be able to accept or reject some proposition we are absolutely unable to move him by their use. The result is that, recognizing this incapacity of ours, we naturally refrain from attempting the matter, those of us, I mean, who are at all cautious. But the rash multitude of men, when once they have let themselves in for something of this sort, get confused themselves and confuse others, and finally, after reviling their opponents and being themselves reviled, they walk away. Now this was the first and most characteristic thing about Socrates, that he never got wrought up during an argument, never used any term of abuse or insolence, but endured the abuse of others, and put an end to strife. If you wish to know how great was the faculty he had in this field, read the Symposium of Xenophon, and you will see how many cases of strife he settled. Therefore, and with good reason, among the poets also very high praise has been accorded to the following sentiment, soon doth he shrewdly make an end of a quarrel though weighty. Well, what then? Nowadays this activity is not a very safe one, and especially so in Rome. For the man who engages in it will clearly be under obligation not to do it in a comer but he must go up to some rich person of consular rank. If it so chance, and ask him, you there, can you tell to whose care you have entrusted your horses? I can, indeed, answers the man. Is it, then, some chance comer, a man who knows nothing about the care of horses? Not at all. And what then? Can you tell me to whom you have entrusted your gold, or your silver, or your clothing? I have not entrusted these, either, to a chance comer, and have you ever thought about entrusting your body to someone to look after it? Why, certainly. And, of course, he too is a man of special skill in the art of physical training, or medicine, is he not? Yes, indeed. Are these your most valuable possessions, or have you something else that is better than all of them? Just what do you mean? 
that, by Zeus, which utilizes these other things, and puts each of them to the test, and exercises deliberation? Ah so, you are talking about my soul, are you? You have understood me aright. For it is precisely this that I am talking about. By Zeus, I regard this as far and away the most valuable of all my possessions. Can you, then, tell in what way you have taken care of your soul? For it is not to be supposed that as wise a man as yourself and one so honoured in the city is recklessly and at random allowing the very best of his possessions to go to ruin through neglect. Certainly not. But have you yourself taken care of that possession? Did you learn how to take care of it from somebody else, or did you discover how yourself? Then comes the danger that first he will say, what is that to you, good sir? Are you my master? And after that, if you persist in annoying him, that he will lift his fist and give you a blow. This was a pursuit that I too was very fond of once upon a time, before I fell to my present estate. Chapter 13. Of Anxiety. When I see a man in anxiety, I say to myself, what can it be that this fellow wants? For if he did not want something that was outside of his control, how could he still remain in anxiety? That is why the Scytherode when singing all alone shows no anxiety, but does so when he enters the theatre, even though he has a very beautiful voice and plays the kithara admirably, for he does not wish merely to sing well, but also to win applause, and that is no longer under his control. Accordingly, where he has skill, there he shows confidence. Set before him any layman that you please, and the musician pays no attention to him, but in a matter of which he has no knowledge, and which he has never studied, there he is in anxiety. What is the meaning of this? Why, he simply does not know what a crowd is, or the applause of a crowd, to be sure, he has learned how to strike the lowest and the highest strings on the kithara, but what the praise of the multitude is, and what function it has in life, that he neither knows nor has studied. Hence he must needs tremble and turn pale. Now then, I cannot say that the man is not a Scytherode, when I see anyone in a state of fear, but I can say something else of him, and, indeed, not one thing only, but a number of things. And first of all, I call him a stranger and say, this man does flot nowhere in the world he is, but though he has been living here so long a time, he is ignorant of the laws of the city and its customs. What he is allowed to do and what he is not allowed to do. Nay more, he has never even called in a lawyer to tell him and explain to him what are the usages conformable with law, yet he does not write a will without knowing how he ought to write it or else calling in an expert, nor does he just casually affix his seal to a bond or give a written guarantee, but without the services of a lawyer he exercises desire and aversion and choice and design and purpose. How do I mean without the services of a lawyer? Why, he does not know that he is wishing for things that are not vouchsafed him, and wishing to avoid the inevitable, and he does not know either what is his own or what is another's. Did he but know, he would never feel hindered, never constrained, would not be anxious. How could he? Is any man in fear about things that are not evil? No. What then? Is he in fear about things that are evil, indeed, but that are in his own power to prevent? Not at all. If, then, things indifferent are neither good nor bad, but all matters of moral purpose are under our control, and no man can either take them away from us, or bring upon us such of them as we do not wish, what room is there left for anxiety? Yet we are anxious about our wretched body, about our trifling estate, about what Caesar will think, but are anxious about none of the things that are within us. We are not anxious about not conceiving a false opinion, are we? No, for that is under my control or about making a choice contrary to nature. No, not about this, either. Then, whenever you see a man looking pale, just as the physician judging from the complexion says, this man's spleen is affected, and this man's liver, so do you also say, this man's desire and aversion are affected, he is not getting along well, he is feverish. For there is nothing else that changes a man's complexion, or makes him tremble, or his teeth to chatter, or to shift from knee to knee and rest on either foot. That is why Zeno was not anxious when he was about to meet Antigonus, for over none of the things that Zeno regarded highly did Antigonus have power, and what Antigonus did have power over Zeno cared nothing about. But Antigonus was anxious when he was about to meet Zeno, and very naturally so, for he wanted to please him, and that lay outside of his control, yet Zeno did not care about pleasing him, any more than any other artist cares about pleasing one who has no knowledge of his art. Do I care to please you? What do I gain thereby? For do you know the standards according to which man is judged by man? Have you been concerned to know what a good man is? And what an evil man, and how each becomes what he is? 
Why, then, are you not a good man yourself? How do you make out, he answers, that I am not a good man? Why, because no good man grieves or groans, no good man laments, no good man turns pale and trembles, or asks, how will he receive me? How will he listen to me? You slave. He will receive you and listen to you as seems best to him. Why, then, are you concerned about things that are not your own? Now is it not his own fault if he gives a bad reception to what you have to say? Of course. Is it possible for one man to make the mistake and yet another suffer the harm? No. Why, then, are you anxious over what is not your own? That is all very well, but I am anxious over how I shall speak to him. What, are you not privileged to speak to him as you please? Yes, but I am afraid that I shall be disconcerted. You are not afraid of being disconcerted when you are about to write the name Dio, are you? No, not at all. What is the reason? Is it not that you have practiced writing? Yes, of course. What then? If you were about to read something, would you not feel the same way about it? Quite the same. What is the reason? Why, because every art has an element of strength and confidence inside its own field. Have you, then, not practiced speaking? And what else did you practice in your school? Syllogisms and arguments involving equivocal premises. To what end? Was it not to enable you to conduct an argument skillfully? And does not skillfully mean seasonably and securely and intelligently, and, more than that, without making mistakes and without embarrassment, and, in addition to all this, with confidence? Surely. Well then, if you are on horseback and have ridden out upon the plain against a man who is on foot, are you in anxiety, assuming that you are in practice and the other is not? Yes, that is all very well, but Caesar has authority to put me to death. Then tell the truth, wretch, and do not brag, nor claim to be a philosopher, nor fail to recognize your masters, but as long as you let them have this hold on you through your body, follow everyone that is stronger than you are. But Socrates used to practice speaking to some purpose Socrates, who discoursed as he did to the tyrants, to his judges, and in the prison. Diogenes had practiced speaking Diogenes, who talked to Alexander as he did, to Philip, to the pirates, to the man who had bought him. Leave such matters, to those who are seriously interested in them, to the brave, but do you walk away to your own concerns and never depart from them again, go into your corner and sit down, and spin syllogisms and propound them to others, in thee the state hath found no leader true. Chapter 14. To Nazo. Once when a certain Roman citizen accompanied by his son had come in and was listening to one of his readings, Epictetus said, this is the style of my teaching, and then lapsed into silence. But when the other requested to know what came next, he replied, instruction in the technique of any art is boring to the layman who has had no experience in it. Now the products of the arts show immediately their use towards the purpose for which they are made, and most of them possess also a certain attractiveness and charm. For example, to stand by and watch the process by which a shoemaker learns his trade is, indeed, not pleasant. Yet the shoe is useful and not an unpleasant thing to look at either. And the process of education in the case of a carpenter is especially tiresome to the layman who happens to be watching, but the work which the carpenter does shows the use of his art. You will find the same much more true in the case of music, for if you are standing by when someone is taking a lesson, the process of instruction will strike you as the most unpleasant of all, yet the results of music are sweet and pleasing to the ear of the layman. So also in our own case, we picture the work of the philosopher to be something like this, he should bring his own will into harmony with what happens, so that neither anything that happens happens against our will, nor anything that fails to happen fails to happen when we wish it to happen. The result of this for those who have so ordered the work of philosophy is that in desire they are not disappointed, and in aversion they do not fall into what they would avoid, that each person passes his life to himself, free from pain, fear, and perturbation, at the same time maintaining with his associates both the natural and the acquired relationships, those namely of son, father, brother, citizen, wife, neighbor, fellow traveler, ruler, and subject. Something like this is our picture of the work of the philosopher. The next thing after this is that we seek the means of achieving it. We see, then, that the carpenter becomes a carpenter by first learning something, the helmsman becomes a helmsman by first learning something. May it not be, then, that in our case also it is not sufficient to wish to become noble and good, but that we are under the necessity of learning something first. We seek, then, what this is. Now the philosophers say that the first thing we must learn is this, that there is a God, 
and that he provides for the universe, and that it is impossible for a man to conceal from him, not merely his actions, but even his purposes and his thoughts. Next we must learn what the gods are like, for whatever their character is discovered to be. The man who is going to please and obey them must endeavor as best he can to resemble them. If the deity is faithful, he also must be faithful, if free, he also must be free, if beneficent, he also must be beneficent, if high-minded, he also must be high-minded, and so forth, therefore, in everything he says and does, he must act as an imitator of God. Where, then, ought I to start? If you enter upon this task, I will say that in the first place you ought to understand the meaning of terms. So you imply that I do not now understand the meaning of terms? You do not. How comes it, then, that I use them? Why, you use them as the illiterate use written speech, as the cattle use external impressions, for use is one thing, and understanding another. But if you think you understand terms, propose any term you please, and let us put ourselves to the test, to see whether we understand it. But it is unpleasant to be subjected to an examination when one is already somewhat advanced in years, and, if it so chance, has served his three campaigns. I realize that myself. For now you have come to me like a man who stood in need of nothing. But what could anyone even imagine you to be in need of? You are rich, you have children, possibly also a wife, and many slaves, Caesar knows you, you have many friends in Rome, you perform the duties incumbent upon you, and when a man has done you either good or harm you know how to pay him back in kind. What do you still lack? If, therefore, I show you that what you lack are things most necessary and important for happiness, and that hitherto you have devoted your attention to everything but what was appropriate for you to do, and if I had the Kalafan, saying, You know neither what God is, nor what man is, nor what good, nor what evil is if I say that you are ignorant of these other matters you may possibly endure that, but if I say that you do not understand your own self, how can you possibly bear with me, and endure and abide my questioning? You cannot do so at all but immediately you go away offended. And yet what harm have I done you? None at all, unless the mirror also does harm to the ugly man by showing him what he looks like, unless the physician insults the patient, when he says to him, man, you think there is nothing the matter with you, but you have a fever, fast today and drink only water, and no one says, what dreadful insolence. Yet if you tell a man, your desires are feverish, your attempts to avoid things are humiliating, your purposes are inconsistent, your choices are out of harmony with your nature, your conceptions are hit or miss and false, why, immediately he walks out and says, he insulted me. Our position is like that of those who attend a fair. Cattle and oxen are brought there to be sold, and most men engage in buying and selling, while there are only a few who go merely to see the fair, how it is conducted, and why, and who are promoting it, and for what purpose. So it is also in this fair of the world in which we live, some persons, like cattle, are interested in nothing but their fodder, for to all of you that concern yourselves with property and lands and slaves and one office or another, all this is nothing but fodder. And few in number are the men who attend the fair because they are fond of the spectacle. What, then, is the universe, they ask, and who governs it? No one? Yet how can it be that, while it is impossible for a city or a household to remain even a very short time without someone to govern and care for it, nevertheless this great and beautiful structure should be kept in such orderly arrangement by sheer accident and chance? There must be, therefore, one who governs it. What kind of a being is he, and how does he govern it? And what are we, who have been created by him, and for what purpose were we created? Do we, then, really have some contact and relation with him or none at all? That is the way these few are affected, and thenceforward they have leisure for this one thing only. To study well the fare of life before they leave it. With what result, then? They are laughed to scorn by the crowd, quite as in the real fare the mere spectators are laughed at by the traffickers, yes, and if the cattle themselves had any comprehension like ours of what was going on, they too would laugh at those who had wonder and admiration for anything but their fodder. Chapter 15 to those who cling obstinately to the judgments which they have once formed. Some men, when they hear the following precepts, that one ought to be steadfast, and that the moral purpose is naturally free and not subject to compulsion, while everything else is liable to interference and compulsion, subject to others and not our own. Some men, I say, fancy that whenever they have formed a judgment they ought to stand by it immovably. And yet the first requirement is that the judgment formed be a sound one. 
For I want vigor in the body, but it must be the vigor of the body in a state of health and physical exercise, whereas, if you show me that you possess the vigor of a madman, and boast about it, I will say to you, man, look, for someone to cure you. This is not vigor, but feebleness. The following is another way in which the minds of those are affected who hear these precepts amiss. For example, a friend of mine for no reason at all made up his mind to starve himself to death I learned about it when he was already in the third day of his fasting, and went and asked what had happened. I have decided, he answered. Very well, but still what was it that induced you to make up your mind? For if your judgment was good, see, we are at your side and ready to help you to make your exit from this life, but if your judgment was irrational, change it. I must abide by my decisions. Why, man, what are you about? You mean not all your decisions, but only the right ones. For example, if you are convinced at this moment that it is night, do not change your opinion, if that seems best to you, but abide by it and say that you ought to abide by your decisions. Do you not wish to make your beginning and your foundation firm, that is, to consider whether your decision is sound or unsound, and only after you have done that proceed to rear thereon the structure of your determination and your firm resolve? But if you lay a rotten and crumbling foundation, you cannot rear thereon even a small building, but the bigger and the stronger your superstructure is the more quickly it will fall down. Without any reason you are taking out of this life, to our detriment, a human being who is a familiar friend, a citizen of the same state, both the large state and the small, and then, though in the act of murder. And while engaged in the destruction of a human being that has done no wrong. You say that you must abide by your decisions. But if the idea ever entered your head to kill me, would you have to abide by your decisions? Well, it was hard work to persuade that man, but there are some men of today whom it is impossible to move. So that I feel that I now know what I formerly did not understand the meaning of the proverb, a fool you can neither persuade nor break. God forbid that I should ever have for a friend a wise fool. There is nothing harder to handle. I have decided, he says. Why yes, and so have madmen, but the more firm their decision is about what is false, the more hellebore they need. Will you not act like a sick man, and summon a physician? I am sick, sir, help me. Consider what I ought to do, it is my part to obey you. So also in the present instance. I know not what I ought to be doing, but I have come to find out. Thus one should speak. No, but this is what one hears, talk to me about anything else. But on this point I have made my decision. Anything else indeed. Why, what is more important or more to your advantage than to be convinced that it is not sufficient for a man merely to have reached decisions, and to refuse to change? These are the sinews of madness, not health. If you force me to this, I would gladly die. What for, man? What has happened? I have decided. It was fortunate for me that you did not decide to kill me. Or again, another says, I take no money for my services. Why so? Because I have decided. Rest assured that there is nothing to prevent you from some day turning irrationally to taking money for your services, and that with the same vehement with which you now refuse to take it, and then saying again, I have decided, precisely as in a diseased body, suffering from a flux, the flux inclines now in this direction and now in that. Such is also the sick mind, it is uncertain which way it is inclined, but when vehemence also is added to this inclination and drift, then the evil gets past help and past cure. Chapter 16. That we do not practice the application of our judgments about things good and evil. Wherein lies the good? In moral purpose. Wherein lies evil? In moral purpose. Wherein lies that which is neither good nor evil? In the things that lie outside the domain of moral purpose. Well, what of it? Does any one of us remember these statements outside the classroom? Does any one of us when by himself practice answering facts in the way he answers these questions? So it is day, is it? Yes. What then? Is it night? No. What then? Is the number of the stars even? I cannot say. When you are shown money, have you practiced giving the proper answer, namely, that it is not a good thing? Have you trained yourself in answers of this kind, or merely to answer sophisms? Why, then, are you surprised to find that in the fields in which you have practiced you surpass yourself, but in that in which you have not practiced you remain the same? For why is it that the orator, although he knows that he has composed a good speech, has memorized what he has written and is bringing a pleasing voice to his task, is still anxious despite all that? Because he is not satisfied with the mere practice of oratory. 
What, then, does he want? He wants to be praised by his audience. Now he has trained himself with a view to being able to practice oratory, but he has not trained himself with reference to praise and blame. For when did he ever hear anyone say what praise is, what blame is? And what is the nature of each? What kinds of praise are to be sought, and what kinds of blame are to be avoided? And when did he ever go through this course of training in accordance with these principles? Why, then, are you any longer surprised because he surpasses all others in the field in which he has studied, but in that in which he has not practiced he is no better than the multitude? He is like a citharode who knows how to play to the harp, sings well, has a beautiful flowing gown, and still trembles when he comes upon the stage, for all that has gone before he knows, but what a crowd is he does not know, nor what the shouting and the scornful log lighter of a crowd are. Nay, he does not even know what this anxiety itself is, whether it is something that we can control, or beyond our powers, whether he can stop it or not. That is why, if he is praised, he goes off the stage all puffed up, but if he is loglid to scorn, that poor windbag of his conceit is pricked and flattens out. We too experience something of the same kind. What do we admire? Externals. What are we in earnest about? About externals. Are we, then, at a loss to know how it comes about that we are subject to fear and anxiety? Why, what else can possibly happen, when we regard impending events as things evil? We cannot help but be in fear, we cannot help but be in anxiety. And then we say, O oh Lord God! How may I escape anxiety? Fool, have you not hands? Did not God make them for you? Sit down now and pray for sooth that the mucus in your nose may not run. Nay, rather wipe your nose and do not blame God. What then? Has he given you nothing that helps in the present case? Has he not given you endurance, has he not given you magnanimity, has he not given you courage? When you have such serviceable hands as these do you still look for someone to wipe your nose? But these virtues we neither practice nor concern ourselves with all. Why, show me one single man who cares how he does something, who is concerned, not with getting something, but with his own action. Who is there that is concerned with his own action while he is walking around? Who, when he is planning, is concerned with the plan itself, and not with getting what he is planning about? And then if he gets it, he is all set up and says, yes, indeed, what a fine plan we made. Did I not tell you, brother? That? If there was anything at all in my views, it was impossible for the plan to fall out otherwise? But if the plan goes the other way, he is humble and wretched, and cannot even find any explanation of what has happened. Who of us ever called in a seer for a case of this kind? Who of us ever slept in a temple for enlightenment about our action? Who? Show me but one, that I may see him, the man that I have long been looking for, the truly noble and gifted man, be he young or old, only show him. Why, then, do we wonder any longer that, although in material things we are thoroughly experienced, nevertheless in our actions we are dejected, unseemly, worthless, cowardly, unwilling to stand the strain, utter failures one and all? For we have not troubled ourselves about these matters in time past, nor do we even now practice them. Yet if we were afraid, not of death or exile, but of fear itself, then we should practice how not to encounter those things that appear evil to us. But as it is, we are fiery and fluent in the schoolroom, and if some trivial question about one of these points comes up, we are able to pursue the logical consequences, yet drag us into practical application, and you will find us miserable shipwrecked mariners. Let a disturbing thought come to us and you will find out what we have been practicing and for what we have been training. As a result, because of our lack of practice, we are ever going out of our way to heap up terrors and to make them out greater than they actually are. For example, whenever I go to sea, on gazing down into the deep or looking around upon the expanse of waters and seeing no land, I am beside myself, fancying that if I am wrecked I shall have to swallow this whole expanse of waters, but it does not occur to me that three pints are enough. What is it, then, that disturbs me? The expanse of sea? No, but my judgment. Again, when there is an earthquake. I fancy that the whole city is going to fall upon me, what? Is not a little stone enough to knock my brains out? What, then, are the things that weigh upon us and drive us out of our senses? Why, what else but our judgments? For when a man goes hence abandoning the comrades, the places, and the social relations to which he is accustomed, what else is the burden that is weighing him down but a judgment? Children, indeed, when they cry a little because their nurse has left, forget their troubles as soon as they get a cookie. Would you, therefore, have us resemble children? 
No. By Zeus. For I claim that we should be influenced in this way, not by a cookie, but by true judgments. And what are these? The things which a man ought to practice all day long, without being devoted to what is not his own, either comrade, or place, or gymnasia, nay, not even to his own body, but he should remember the law and keep that before his eyes. And what is the law of God? To guard what is his own, not to lay claim to what is not his own, but to make use of what is given him, and not to yearn for what has not been given, when something is taken away, to give it up readily and without delay, being grateful for the time in which he had the use of it all this if you do not wish to be crying for your nurse and your mammy. For what difference does it make what object a man has a weakness for and depends upon? In what respect are you superior to the man who weeps for a maid, if you grieve for a trivial gymnasium, a paltry colonnade, a group of youngsters? And that way of spending your time? Someone else comes and grieves because he is no longer going to drink the water of Durse. What, is the water of the Marcian aqueduct inferior to that of Durse? Nay, but I was accustomed to that water. And you will get accustomed to this in turn. And then, if you become addicted to something of this kind, weep for this too in turn, and try to write a line after the pattern of that of Euripides, to Nero's baths and Marcian founts once more. Behold how tragedy arises, when everyday events befall fools. When, then, shall I see Athens once more and the Acropolis? Poor man, are you not satisfied with what you are seeing every day? Have you anything finer or greater to look at than the sun, the moon, the stars, the whole earth, the sea? And if you really understand him that governs the universe, and bear him about within you, do you yet yearn for bits of stone and a pretty rock? When, therefore, you are about to leave the sun and the moon, what will you do? Will you sit and cry as little children cry? What was it you did at school? What was it you heard and learned? Why did you record yourself as a philosopher when you might have recorded the truth in these words, I studied a few introductions, and did some reading in Chrysippus, but I did not even get past the door of a philosopher. Since what part have I in that business in which Socrates, who died so nobly, and so nobly lived, had a part? Or in that in which Diogenes had a part? Can you imagine one of these men crying or fretting because he is not going to see such and such a man, or such and such a woman, or to live in Athens or in Corinth, but, if it so happen, in Susa or in Ecbatana? What, does he who is at liberty to leave the banquet when he will, and to play the game no longer, keep on annoying himself by staying? Does he not stay, like children, only as long as he is entertained? Such a man would be likely, forsooth, to endure going into exile for life or the exile of death if this were his sentence. Are you not willing, at this late date, like children, to be weaned and to partake of more solid food, and not to cry for mammies and nurses' old wives' lamentations? But if I leave, I shall cause those women sorrow? You cause them sorrow? Not at all, but it will be the same thing that causes sorrow to you yourself bad judgment. What, then, can you do? Get rid of that judgment, and... If they do well, they will themselves get rid of their judgment, otherwise, they will come to grief and have only themselves to thank for it. Man, do something desperate, as the expression goes, now if never before, to achieve peace, freedom, and mindedness. Lift up your neck at last like a mouse escaped from bondage, be bold to look towards God and say, Use me henceforward for whatever thou wilt, I am of one mind with thee, I am thine, I crave exemption from nothing that seems good in thy sight, where thou wilt, led me, in what raiment thou wilt, clothe me. Wouldst thou have me to hold office, or remain in private life, to remain here or go into exile, to be poor or be rich? I will defend all these thy acts before men, I will show what the true nature of each thing is. Nay, you will not, sit rather in the house as girls do and wait for your mammy until she feeds you. If Heracles had sat about at home, what would he have amounted to? He would have been Eurystheus and no Heracles. Come, how many acquaintances and friends did he have with him as he went up and down through the whole world? Nay, he had no dearer friend than God. That is why he was believed to be a son of God, and was. It was therefore in obedience to his will that he went about clearing away wickedness and lawlessness. But you are no Heracles, you say, and you cannot clear away the wickedness of other men. Nay, nor are you even a Theseus, to clear away the ills of Attica merely. Very well, clear away your own then. From just here, from out your own mind, cast not procrusts and siren, but grief, fear, desire, envy, joy at others' ills, cast out greed, effeminacy, incontinency. 
these things you cannot cast out in any other way than by looking to God alone, being specially devoted to Him only, and consecrated to His commands. But if you wish anything else, with lamentation and groaning you will follow that which is stronger than you are, ever seeking outside yourself for peace, and never able to be at peace. For you seek peace where it is not, and neglect to seek it where it is. Chapter 17 How ought we adjust our preconceptions to individual instances? What is the first business of one who practices philosophy? To get rid of thinking that one knows, for it is impossible to get a man to begin to learn that which he thinks he knows. However, as we go to the philosophers we all babble hurly-burly about what ought to be done and what ought not. Good and evil, fair and foul, and on these grounds assign praise and blame, censure and reprehension, passing judgment on fair and foul practices, and discriminating between them. But what do we go to the philosophers for? To learn what we do not think we know. And what is that? General principles. For some of us want to learn what the philosophers are saying, thinking it will be witty and shrewd, others, because they wish to profit thereby. But it is absurd to think that when a man wishes to learn one thing he will actually learn something else, or, in short, that a man will make progress in anything without learning it. But the multitude are under the same misapprehension as was Theopompus, the orator, who actually censures Plato for wishing to define every term. Well, what does he say? Did none of us before your time ever use the words, good, or, just? Or, without understanding what each of these terms severally mean? Did we merely utter them as vague and empty sounds? Why, who tells you, Theopompus, that we did not have a natural conception of each term, that is, a preconceived idea of it? But it is impossible to adjust our preconceived ideas to the appropriate facts without having first systematized them and having raised precisely this question what particular fact is to be classified under each preconception. Suppose, for example, that you make the same sort of remark to the physicians, why, who among us did not use terms healthy and a diseased before Hippocrates was born? Or were we merely making an empty noise with these sounds? For, of course, we have a certain preconception of the idea healthy. But we are unable to apply it. That is why one Gerson says, keep abstaining from food, and another, give nourishment, again. One says, cut a vein, and another says, use the cupping glass. What is the reason? Is it really anything but the fact that a person is unable properly to apply the preconceived idea of healthy to the specific instances? So it stands here also, in the affairs of life. Who among us has not upon his lips the words good and evil, advantageous and disadvantageous? For who among us does not have a preconceived idea of each of these terms? Very well, is it fitted into a system and complete? Prove that it is. How shall I prove it? Apply it properly to specific facts. To start with, Plato classifies definitions under the preconception the useful, but you classify them under that of the useless. Is it, then, possible for both of you to be right? How can that be? Does not one man apply his preconceived idea of the good to the fact of wealth, while another does not? And another to that of pleasure, and yet another to that of health? Indeed. To sum up the whole matter. If all of us who have these terms upon our lips possess no mere empty knowledge of each one severally, and do not need to devote any pains to the systematic arrangement of our preconceived ideas, why do we disagree, why fight, why blame one another? And yet what need is there for me to bring forward now our strife with one another and make mention of that? Take your own case, if you apply properly your preconceived ideas, why are you troubled, why are you hampered? Let us pass by for the moment the second field of study that which has to do with our choices and the discussion of what is our duty in regard to them. Let us pass by also the third that which has to do with our assents. I make you a present of all this. Let us confine our attention to the first field, one which allows an almost palpable proof that you do not properly apply your preconceived ideas. Do you at this moment desire what is possible in general and what is possible for you in particular? If so, why are you hampered? Why are you troubled? Are you not at this moment trying to escape what is inevitable? If so, why do you fall into any trouble, why are you unfortunate? Why is it that when you want something it does not happen, and when you do not want it, it does happen? For this is the strongest proof of trouble and misfortune. I want something, and it does not happen, and what creature is more wretched than I? I do not want something, and it does happen, and what creature is more wretched than I? Media, for example, because she could not endure this, came to the point of killing her children. 
In this respect at least hers was the act of a great spirit. For she had the proper conception of what it means for anyone's wishes not to come true. Very well, then, says she, in these circumstances I shall take vengeance upon the man who has wronged and insulted me. Yet what good do I get out of his being in such an evil plight? How can that be accomplished? I kill my children. But I shall be punishing myself also. Yet what do I care? This is the outbursting of a soul of great force. For she did not know where the power lies to do what we wish that we cannot get this from outside ourselves, nor by disturbing and arranging things. Give up wanting to keep your husband, and nothing of what you want fails to happen. Give up wanting him to live with you at any cost. Give up wanting to remain in Corinth. And, in a word, give up wanting anything but what God wants. And who will prevent you, who will compel you? No one, any more than anyone prevents or compels Zeus. When you have such a leader as Zeus and identify your wishes and your desires with his, why are you still afraid that you will fail? Give to poverty and to wealth your aversion and your desire, you will fail to get what you wish, and you will fall into what you would avoid. Give them to health, you will come to grief, so also if you give them to offices, honours, country, friends, children, in short to anything that lies outside the domain of moral purpose. But give them to Zeus and the other gods, entrust them to their keeping, let them exercise the control, let your desire and your aversion be ranged on their side and how can you be troubled any longer? But if you show envy, wretched man, and pity, and jealousy, and timidity, and never let a day pass without bewailing yourself and the gods. How can you continue to say that you have been educated? What kind of education, man, do you mean? Because you have worked on syllogisms, and arguments with equivocal premises? Will you not unlearn all this, if that be possible, and begin at the beginning, realizing that hitherto you have not even touched the matter, and for the future, beginning at this point, add to your foundations that which comes next in order provision that nothing shall be that you do not wish, and that nothing shall fail to be that you do wish? Give me but one young man who has come to school with this purpose in view, who has become an athlete in this activity, saying, as for me, let everything else go, I am satisfied if I shall be free to live untrammeled and untroubled, to hold up my neck in the face of facts like a free man, and to look up to heaven as a friend of God, without fear of what may possibly happen. Let one of you show me such a person, so that I can say to him, enter, young man, into your own. For it is your destiny to adorn philosophy. Yours are these possessions, yours these books, yours these discourses. Then, when he has worked his way through this first field of study and mastered it like an athlete, let him come to me again and say, I want, it is true, to be tranquil and free from turmoil, but I want also, as a God-fearing man, a philosopher and a diligent student, to know what is my duty towards the gods, towards parents, towards brothers, towards my country, towards strangers. Advance now to the second field of study, this also is yours. Yes, but I have already studied this second field. What I wanted was to be secure and unshaken, and that not merely in my waking hours, but also when asleep, and drunk, and melancholy mad. Man, you are a god, great are the designs you cherish. No, that is not the way it goes, but someone says, I wish to know what Chrysippus means in his treatise on the lyre. If that is your design, go hang, you wretch. And what good will knowing that do you? With sorrow you will read the whole treatise, and with trembling you will talk about it to others. This is the way you also, my hearers, behave. You say, shall I read aloud to you, brother, and you to me? Man, you write wonderfully. And again, you have a great gift for writing in the style of Xenophon, you for that of Plato, you for that of Antisthenes. And then, when you have told dreams to one another, you go back to the same things again, you have exactly the same desires as before, the same aversions, in the same way you make your choices, your designs, and your purposes, you pray for the same things and are interested in the same things. In the second place, you do not even look for anybody to give you advice, but you are annoyed if you are told what I am telling you. Again, you say, he is an old man without the milk of human kindness in him, he did not weep when I left, nor say, I fear you are going into a very difficult situation, my son, if you come through safely, I will light lamps. Is this what a man with the milk of human kindness in him would say? It will be a great piece of good luck for a person like you to come through safely. A thing worth lighting lamps to celebrate. Surely you ought to be free from death and free from disease. It is this conceit of fancying that we know something useful. That, as I have said, we ought to cast aside before we come to philosophy, as we do in the case of geometry and music. 
otherwise we shall never even come near to making progress, even if we go through all the introductions and the treatises of Chrysippus, with those of Antipater and Archidemus thrown in. Chapter 18. How must we struggle against our external impressions? Every habit and faculty is confirmed and strengthened by the corresponding actions, that of walking by walking, that of running by running. If you wish to be a good reader, read, if you wish to be a good writer, write. If you should give up reading for thirty days one after the other, and be engaged in something else, you will know what happens. So also if you lie in bed for ten days, get up and try to take a rather long walk, and you will see how wobbly your legs are. In general, therefore, if you want to do something, make a habit of it, if you want not to do something, refrain from doing it. And accustom yourself to something else instead. The same principle holds true in the affairs of the mind also, when you are angry, you may be sure, not merely that this evil has befallen you, but also that you have strengthened the habit, and have, as it were, added fuel to the flame. When you have yielded to someone in carnal intercourse, do not count merely this one defeat, but count also the fact that you have fed your incontinence, you have given it additional strength. For it is inevitable that some habits and faculties should, in consequence of the corresponding actions, spring up, though they did not exist before, and that others which were already there should be intensified and made strong. In this way, without doubt, the infirmities of our mind and character spring up, as the philosophers say. For when once you conceive a desire for money, if reason be applied to bring you to a realization of the evil, both the passion is stilled and our governing principle is restored to its original authority, but if you do not apply a remedy, your governing principle does not revert to its previous condition, but, on being aroused again by the corresponding external impression, it bursts into the flame of desire more quickly than it did before. And if this happens over and over again, the next stage is that a callousness results and the infirmity strengthens the avarice. For the man who has had a fever, and then recovered, is not the same as he was before the fever, unless he has experienced a complete cure. Something like this happens also with the affections of the mind. Certain imprints and wheels are left behind on the mind, and unless a man erases them perfectly, the next time he is scourged upon the old scars, he has wheels no longer but wounds. If, therefore, you wish not to be hot-tempered, do not feed your habit, set before it nothing on which it can grow. As the first step, keep quiet and count the days on which you have not been angry. I used to be angry every day, after that every other day. Then every third, and then every fourth day. If you go as much as thirty days without a fit of anger, sacrifice to God. For the habit is first weakened and then utterly destroyed. Today I was not grieved, and so the next day, and thereafter for two or three months, but I was on my guard when certain things happened that were capable of provoking grief. Know that things are going splendidly with you. Today when I saw a handsome lad or a handsome woman I did not say to myself, would that a man might sleep with her, and her husband is a happy man, for the man who uses the expression happy of the husband means happy is the adulterer also, I do not even picture to myself the next scene the woman herself in my presence, disrobing and lying down by my side. I pat myself on the head and say. Well done, Epictetus, you have solved a clever problem, one much more clever than the so-called master, but when the wench is not only willing, but nods to me and sends for me. Yes. And when she even lays hold upon me and snuggles up to me, if I still hold aloof and conquer, this has become a solved problem greater than the liar, and the quiescent. On this score a man has a right to be proud indeed, but not about his proposing the master problem. How, then, may this be done? Make it your wish finally to satisfy your own self, make it your wish to appear beautiful in the sight of God. Set your desire upon becoming pure in the presence of your pure self and of God. Then when an external impression of that sort comes suddenly upon you, says Plato, go and offer an expiatory sacrifice, go and make offering as a suppliant to the sanctuaries of the gods who avert evil, it is enough if you only withdraw to the society of the good and excellent men, and set yourself to comparing your conduct with theirs, whether you take as your model one of the living, or one of the dead. Go to Socrates and mark him as he lies down beside Alcibiades and makes light of his youthful beauty. Bethink yourself how great a victory he once won and knew it himself, like an Olympic victory, and what his rank was, counting in order from Heracles, so that, by the gods, one might justly greet him with the salutation, Hail, wondrous man! For he was victor over something more than these rotten boxers and pancratiasts, and the gladiators who resemble them. If you confront your external impression with such thoughts, you will overcome it, and not be carried away by it. 
but, to begin with, be not swept off your feet, I beseech you, by the vividness of the impression, but say, wait for me a little, O impression, allow me to see who you are, and what you are an impression of, allow me to put you to the test. And after that, do not suffer it to lead you on by picturing to you what will follow. Otherwise, it will take possession of you and go off with you wherever it will. But do you rather introduce and set over against it some fair and noble impression? And throw out this filthy one. And if you form the habit of taking such exercises, you will see what mighty shoulders you develop, what sinews, what vigor, but as it is, you have merely your philosophic quibbles, and nothing more. The man who exercises himself against such external impressions is the true athlete in training. Hold, unhappy man, be not swept along with your impressions. Great is the struggle, divine the task, the prize is a kingdom, freedom, serenity, peace. Remember God, call upon him to help you and stand by your side, just as voyagers, in a storm, call upon the Dioscuri. For what storm is greater than that stirred up by powerful impressions which unseat the reason? As for the storm itself, what else is it but an external impression? To prove this, just take away the fear of death, and then bring on as much thunder and lightning as you please, and you will realize how great is the calm, how fair the weather, in your governing principle. But if you be once defeated and say that by and by you will overcome. And then a second time do the same thing, know that at last you will be in so wretched a state and so weak that by and by you will not so much as notice that you are doing wrong. But you will even begin to offer arguments in justification of your conduct, and then you will confirm the truth of the saying of Hesiod, forever with misfortunes dire must he who loiters cope. Chapter 19. To those who take up the teachings of the philosophers only to talk about them. The master argument appears to have been propounded on the strength of some such principles as the following. Since there is a general contradiction with one another between these three propositions, to wit, 1, everything true as an event in the past is necessary, and, 2, an impossible does not follow a possible, and, 3, what is not true now and never will be, is nevertheless possible. Diodorus, realizing this contradiction, used the plausibility of the first two propositions to establish the principle, nothing is possible which is neither true now nor ever will be. But one man will maintain, among the possible combinations of two at a time, the following, namely. 3. Something is possible. Which is not true now and never will be, and, 2. An impossible does not follow a possible, yet he will not grant the third proposition, 1. Everything true as an event in the past is necessary, which is what Cleanthus and his group, whom Antipater has stoutly supported, seem to think. But others will maintain the other two propositions, 3. A thing is possible which is not true now and never will be, and, 1. Everything true as an event in the past is necessary, and then will assert that, an impossible does follow a possible. But there is no way by which one can maintain all three of these propositions, because of their mutual contradiction. If, then, someone asks me, but which pair of these do you yourself maintain? I shall answer him that I do not know, but I have received the following account, Diodorus used to maintain one pair, Panthoids and his group, I believe, and Cleanthus another, and Chrysippus and his group the third. What, then, is your opinion? I do not know. And I was not made for this purpose to test my own external impression upon the subject, to compare the statements of others, and to form a judgment of my own. For this reason I am no better than the grammarian. When asked, who was the father of Hector? He replied, Priam. Who were his brothers? Alexander and Daphobus. And who was their mother? Hecuba. This is the account that I have received. From whom? From Homer, he said. And Hellanicus also, I believe, writes about these same matters, and possibly others like him. And so it is with me about the master argument, what further have I to say about it? But if I am a vain person, I can astonish the company, especially at a banquet, by enumerating those who have written on the subject. Chrysippus also has written admirably on this topic in the first book of his treatise on things possible. And Cleanthus has written a special work on the subject, and Archidemus. Antipater also has written. Not only in his book on things possible. But also a separate monograph in his discussion of the master argument. Have you not read the treatise? I have not read it. Then read it. And what good will it do him? He will be more trifling and tiresome than he is already. You, for example, what have you gained by the reading of it? What judgment have you formed on the subject? Nay, you will tell us of Helen, and Priam, and the island of Calypso which never was and never will be. 
and in the field of literary history, indeed, it is of no great consequence that you master the received account without having formed any judgment of your own. But in questions of conduct we suffer from this fault much more than we do in literary matters. Tell me about things good and evil. Listen, the wind that blew me from the Trojan shore brought me to the Siconians. Of things some are good, others bad, and yet others indifferent. Now the virtues and everything that shares in them are good, while vices and everything that shares in vice are evil, and what falls in between these, namely, wealth, health, life, death, pleasures, pain, are indifferent. Where do you get that knowledge? Hellanicus says so in his History of Egypt. For what difference does it make whether you say this, or that Diogenes says so in his treatise on ethics, or Chrysippus, or Cleanthus? Have you, then, tested any of these statements and have you formed your own judgment upon them? Show me how you are in the habit of conducting yourself in a storm on board ship. Do you bear in mind this logical distinction between good and evil when the sail crackles, and you have screamed and some fellow passenger, untimely humorous, comes up and says, tell me, I beseech you by the gods, just what you were saying a little while ago. Is it a vice to suffer shipwreck? Is there any vice in that? Will you not pick up a piece of wood and cudgel him? What have we to do with you, fellow? We are perishing and you come and crack jokes. And if Caesar sends for you to answer an accusation, do you bear in mind this distinction? Suppose someone approaches you when you are going in pale and trembling, and says, why are you trembling, fellow? What is the affair that concerns you? Does Caesar inside the palace bestow virtue and vice upon those who appear before him? Why do you also make mock of me and add to my other ills? But yet, philosopher, tell me, why are you trembling? Is not the danger death, or prison, or bodily pain, or exile, or disrepute? Why, what else can it be? Is it a vice at all, or anything that shares in vice? What was it, then, that you used to call these things? What have I to do with you, fellow? My own evils are enough for me and in that you are right. For your own evils aren't enough for you your baseness, your cowardice. The bragging that you indulged in when you were sitting in the lecture room why did you pride yourself upon things that were not your own? Why did you call yourself a Stoic? Observe yourselves thus in your actions and you will find out to what sect of the philosophers you belong. You will find that most of you are Epicureans, some few peripatetics, but these without any backbone, for wherein do you in fact show that you consider virtue equal to all things else, or even superior? But as for a Stoic, show me one if you can. Where, or how? Nay, but you can show me thousands who recite the petty arguments of the Stoics. Yes, but do these same men recite the petty arguments of the Epicureans any less well? Do they not handle with the same precision the petty arguments of the peripatetics also? Who, then, is a Stoic? As we call a statue Phaedian that has been fashioned according to the art of Phaedias, in that sense show me a man fashioned according to the judgment which he utters. Show me a man who though sick is happy, though in danger is happy, though dying is happy. Though condemned to exile is happy. Though in disrepute is happy. Show him. By the gods, I would fain see a Stoic. But you cannot show me a man completely so fashioned, then show me at least one who is becoming so fashioned, one who has begun to tend in that direction, do me this favour, do not begrudge an old man the sight of that spectacle which to this very day I have never seen. Do you fancy that you are going to show me the Zeus or the Athena of Phaedias, a creation of ivory and gold? Let one of you show me the soul of a man who wishes to be of one mind with God, and never again to blame either God or man, to fail in nothing that he would achieve. To fall into nothing that he would avoid, to be free from anger, envy and jealousy but why use circumlocutions? A man who has set his heart upon changing from a man into a God, and although he is still in this paltry body of death, does nonetheless have his purpose set upon fellowship with Zeus. Show him to me. But you cannot. Why, then, do you mock your own selves and cheat everybody else? And why do you put on a guise that is not your own and walk about as veritable thieves and robbers who have stolen these designations and properties that in no sense belong to you? And so now I am your teacher, and you are being taught in my school. And my purpose is this to make of you a perfect work, secure against restraint, compulsion, and hindrance, free, prosperous, happy, looking to God in everything both small and great, and you are here with the purpose of learning and practicing all this. Why, then, do you not complete the work, if it is true that you on your part have the right kind of purpose and I on my part, in addition to the purpose? Have the right kind of preparation? What is it that is lacking? 
when I see a craftsman who has material lying ready at hand, I look for the finished product. Here also, then, is the craftsman, and here is the material, what do we yet lack? Cannot the matter be taught? It can. Is it, then, not under our control? Nay, it is the only thing in the whole world that is under our control. Wealth is not under our control, nor health, nor fame, nor, in a word, anything else except the right use of external impressions. This alone is by nature secure against restraint and hindrance. Why, then, do you not finish the work? Tell me the reason. For it lies either in me, or in you, or in the nature of the thing. The thing itself is possible and is the only thing that is under our control. Consequently, then, the fault lies either in me, or in you, or, what is nearer the truth, in us both. What then? Would you like to have us at last begin to introduce here a purpose such as I have described? Let us let bygones be bygones. Only let us begin, and, take my word for it, you shall see. Chapter 20. Against Epicureans and Academics. The propositions which are true and evident must of necessity be employed even by those who contradict them, and one might consider as perhaps the strongest proof of a proposition being evident the fact that even the man who contradicts it finds himself obliged at the same time to employ it. For example, if a man should contradict the proposition that there is a universal statement which is true, it is clear that he must assert the contrary, and say, no universal statement is true. Slave, this is not true, either. For what else does this assertion amount to then, if a statement is universal, it is false? Again, if a man comes forward and says, I would have you know that nothing is knowable, but that everything is uncertain, or if someone else says, believe me, and it will be to your advantage, when I say, one ought not to believe a man at all, or again. Someone else. Learn from me, man, that it is impossible to learn anything, it is I who tell you this and I will prove it to you. If you wish, what difference is there between these persons and whom shall I say? Those who call themselves academics. O men, say the academics, give your assent to the statement that no man assents to any statement, believe us when we say that no man can believe anybody. So also Epicurus, when he wishes to do away with the natural fellowship of men with one another, at the same time makes use of the very principle that he is doing away with. For what does he say? Be not deceived. Men, nor led astray, nor mistaken, there is no natural fellowship with one another among rational beings, believe me. Those who say the contrary are deceiving you and leading you astray with false reasons. Why do you care, then? Allow us to be deceived. Will you fare any the worse, if all the rest of us are persuaded that we do have a natural fellowship with one another, and that we ought by all means to guard it? Nay, your position will be much better and safer. Man, why do you worry about us, why keep vigil on our account, why light your lamp, why rise betimes, why write such big books? Is it to keep one or another of us from being deceived into the belief that the gods care for men, or is it to keep one or another of us from supposing that the nature of the good is other than pleasure? For if this is so, off to your couch and sleep, and lead the life of a worm, of which you have judged yourself worthy, eat and drink and copulate and defecate and snore. What do you care how the rest of mankind will think about these matters? Or whether their ideas be sound or not? For what have you to do with us? Come, do you interest yourself in sheep because they allow themselves to be shorn by us, and milked, and finally to be butchered and cut up? Would it not be desirable if men could be charmed and bewitched into slumber by the Stoics and allow themselves to be shorn and milked by you and your kind? Is not this something that you ought to have said to your fellow Epicureans only and to have concealed your views from outsiders, taking special pains to persuade them, of all people, that we are by nature born with a sense of fellowship, and that self-control is a good thing, so that everything may be kept for you? Or ought we to maintain this fellowship with some, but not with others? With whom, then, ought we to maintain it? With those who reciprocate by maintaining it with us, or with those who are transgressors of it? And who are greater transgressors of it than you Epicureans who have set up such doctrines? What, then, was it that roused Epicurus from his slumbers and compelled him to write what he did? What else but that which is the strongest thing in men nature, which draws a man to do her will though he groans and is reluctant? For, says she, since you hold these antisocial opinions, write them down and bequeath them to others and give up your sleep because of them and become in fact yourself the advocate to denounce your own doctrines. Shall we speak of arrests as being pursued by the Furies and roused from his slumbers? But are not the Furies and the Avengers that beset Epicurus more savage? They roused him from sleep and would not let him rest, 
but compelled him to herald his own miseries, just as madness and wine compel the golly. Such a powerful and invincible thing is the nature of man. For how can a vine be moved to act, not like a vine, but like an olive, or again an olive to act, not like an olive, but like a vine? It is impossible, inconceivable. Neither. Then, is it possible for a man absolutely to lose the affections of a man, and those who cut off their bodily organs are unable to cut off the really important thing their sexual desires? So with Epicurus, he cut off everything that characterizes a man, the head of a household, a citizen, and a friend, but he did not succeed in cutting off the desires of human beings, for that he could not do, any more than the easygoing academics are able to cast away or blind their own sense perceptions, although they have made every effort to do so. Ah, what a misfortune! A man has received from nature measures and standards for discovering the truth. And then does not go on and take the pains to add to these and to work out additional principles to supply the deficiencies, but does exactly the opposite, endeavouring to take away and destroy whatever faculty he does possess for discovering the truth. What do you say, philosopher? What is your opinion of piety and sanctity? If you wish, I shall prove that it is good. By all means, prove it, that our citizens may be converted and may honour the divine and at last cease to be indifferent about the things that are of supreme importance. Do you, then, possess the proofs? I do, thank heaven. Since, then, you are quite satisfied with all this, hear the contrary, the gods do not exist, and even if they do, they pay no attention to men, nor have we any fellowship with them, and hence this piety and sanctity which the multitude talk about is a lie told by impostors and sophists, or, I swear, by legislators to frighten and restrain evilders. Well done. Philosopher. You have conferred a service upon our citizens. You have recovered our young men who were already inclining to despise things divine. What then? Does not all this satisfy you? Learn now how righteousness is nothing, how reverence is folly, how a father is nothing, how a son is nothing. Well done, philosopher. Keep at it, persuade the young men, that we may have more who feel and speak as you do. It is from principles like these that our well-governed states have grown great. Principles like these have made Sparta what it was. These are the convictions which Lycurgus wrought into the Spartans by his laws and his system of education, namely that neither is slavery base rather than noble, nor freedom noble rather than base. Those who died at Thermopylae died because of these judgments regarding slavery and freedom. And for what principles but these did the men of Athens give up their city? And then those who talk thus marry and beget children and fulfill the duties of citizens and get themselves appointed priests and prophets. Priests and prophets of whom? of gods that do not exist. And they themselves consult the Pythian priestess in order to hear lies and to interpret the oracles to others. Oh what monstrous shamelessness and imposture! Man, what are you doing? You are confuting your own self every day, and are you unwilling to give up these frigid attempts of yours? When you eat, where do you bring your hand? To your mouth, or to your eye? When you take a bath, into what do you step? When did you ever call the pot a plate, or the ladle a spit? If I were slave to one of these men, even if I had to be soundly flogged by him every day, I would torment him. Boy, throw a little oil into the bath. I would have thrown a little fish sauce in, and as I left would pour it down on his head. What does this mean? I had an external impression that could not be distinguished from olive oil, indeed, it was altogether like it. I swear by your fortune. Here, give me the grawl. I would have filled a side dish with vinegar and fish sauce and brought it to him. Did I not ask for the grawl? Yes, master, this is grawl. Is not this vinegar and fish sauce? How so, any more than grawl? Take and smell it, take and taste it. Well, how do you know, if the senses deceive us? If I had had three or four fellow slaves who felt as I did, I would have made him burst with rage and hang himself, or else change his opinion. But as it is, such men are toying with us, they use all the gifts of nature, while in theory doing away with them. Grateful men indeed and reverential, why, if nothing else, at least they eat bread every day, and yet have the audacity to say, we do not know if there is a Demeter, or a Core, or a Pluto, not to mention that, although they enjoy night and day, the changes of the year and the stars and the sea and the earth and the cooperation of men. They are not moved in the least by any one of these things, but look merely for a chance to belch out their trivial problem, and after thus exercising their stomach to go off to the bath. 
but what they are going to say, or what they are going to talk about, or to whom, and what their hearers are going to get out of these things that they are saying, all this has never given them a moment's concern. I greatly fear that a noble-spirited young man may hear these statements and be influenced by them, or, having been influenced already, may lose all the germs of the nobility which he possessed, that we may be giving an adulterer grounds for brazening out his acts, that some embezzler of public funds may lay hold of a specious plea based upon these theories, that someone who neglects his own parents may gain additional aftruntery from them. What, then, in your opinion is good or bad, base or noble? This or that? What then? Is there any use in arguing further against any of these persons? Or giving them a reason, or listening to one of theirs, or trying to convert them? By Zeus, one might much rather hope to convert a filthy degenerate than men who have become so deaf and blind. Chapter 21. Of Inconsistency. Some of their faults men readily admit, but others not so readily. Now no one will admit that he is foolish or unintelligent, but, quite the contrary, you hear everyone say, I wish I had as much luck as I have sense. But they readily admit that they are timid, and say, I am a bit timid, I admit, but in general you will not find me to be a fool a man will not readily admit that he is incontinent, not at all that he is unjust, and will never admit that he is envious or meddlesome, but most men will admit that they are moved by pity. What is the reason for this? The principal reason is confusion of thought and an unwillingness to admit a fault in matters which involve good and evil, but, apart from that, different people are affected by different motives. And, as a rule, they will never admit anything that they conceive to be disgraceful, timidity, for example, they conceive to be an indication of a prudent disposition, and the same is true of pity, but stupidity they conceive to be a slave's quality altogether, also they will never plead guilty to offences against society. Now in the case of most errors, the principal reason why men are inclined to admit them is because they conceive that there is an involuntary element in them, as, for instance, in timidity and pity. And if a man ever does, grudgingly, admit that he is incontinent, he adds that he is in love, expecting to be excused as for an involuntary act. But in justice they do not at all conceive of as involuntary. In jealousy there is also, as they fancy, an element of the involuntary, and therefore this too is a fault which men grudgingly admit. When such are the men we live among so confused, so ignorant both of what they mean by evil and what evil quality they have, or whether they have one, or, if so, how they come to have it, or how they will get rid of it among such men I wonder whether it is not worth while for us also to watch ourselves, each one asking himself the questions, is it possible that I too am one of these people? What conceit am I cherishing regarding myself? How do I conduct myself? Do I for my part act like a wise man? Do I for my part act like a man of self-control? Do I for my part ever say that I have been educated to meet whatever comes? Have I the consciousness, proper to a man who knows nothing, that I do know nothing? Do I go to my teacher, like one who goes to consult an oracle, prepared to obey? Or do I, too, like a sniffling child, go to school to learn only the history of philosophy and to understand the books which I did not understand before, and, if chance offers, to explain them to others? Man, at home you have fought a regular prize fight with your slave. You have driven your household into the street. You have disturbed your neighbor's peace, and now do you come to me with a solemn air. Like a philosopher, and sitting down pass judgment on the explanation I gave of the reading of the text and on the application, forsooth, of the comments I made as I babbled out whatever came into my head. You have come in a spirit of envy, in a spirit of humiliation because nothing is being sent you from home, and you sit there while the lecture is going on, thinking, on your part, of nothing in the world but how you stand with your father or your brother. You reflect, what are my people at home saying about me? At this moment they are thinking that I am making progress in my studies, and they are saying he will know everything when he comes back home, I did want, at one time, I suppose, to learn everything before going back home, but that requires a great deal of hard work, and nobody sends me anything, and at Nicopolis they have rotten accommodations at the baths, and my lodgings are bad, and the school here is bad. And then people say, nobody gets any good from going to school. Well, who goes to school who, I repeat with the expectation of being cured. Who with the expectation of submitting his own judgments for purification? Who with the expectation of coming to a realization of what judgments he needs? Why, then, are you surprised, if you carry back home from your school precisely the judgments you bring to it? For you do not come with the expectation of laying them aside, or of correcting them, or of getting others in exchange for them. Not at all, nor anything like it. 
look rather to this at least whether you are getting what you came for. You want to be able to speak fluently about philosophic principles. Well, are you not becoming more of an idle babbler? Do not these petty philosophic principles supply you with material for making exhibitions? Do you not resolve syllogisms, an argument with equivocal premises? Do you not examine the assumptions in the liar syllogism and in hypothetical syllogisms? Why, then? Are you still vexed? If you are getting what you came for? Yes, but if my child or my brother dies, or if I must die, or be tortured, what good will such things do me? But was it really for this that you came? Is it really for this that you sit by my side? Did you ever really light your lamp, or work late at night, for this? Or when you went out into the covered walk did you ever set before yourself, instead of a syllogism, some external impression and examine this with your fellow students? When did you ever do that? And then you say, the principles are useless. To whom? To those who do not use them properly. For instance, isarves are not useless to those who rub them on when and as they ought, and poultices are not useless, jumping weights are not useless, but they are useless to some people, and, on the other hand, useful to others. If you ask me now, are our syllogisms useful? I will tell you that they are, and, if you wish, I will show how they are useful have they, then, help me at all. Man. You did not ask. Did you? Whether they are useful to you, but whether they are useful in general. Let the man who is suffering from dysentery ask me whether vinegar is useful, I will tell him that it is useful. Is it useful, then, to me? I will say, no. Seek first to have your discharge stopped, the little ulcers healed. So do you also, men, first cure your ulcers, stop your discharges, be tranquil in mind, bring it free from distraction into the school, and then you will know what power reason has. Chapter 22. Of Friendship. Whatever a man is interested in he naturally loves. Now do men take an interest in things evil? Not at all. Well, and do they take an interest in things which in no respect concern them? No, not in these, either. It remains, therefore, that men take an interest in good things only, and if they take an interest in them, they love them. Whoever, then, has knowledge of good things, would know how to love them too, but when a man is unable to distinguish things good from things evil, and what is neither good nor evil from both the others, how could he take the next step and have the power to love? Accordingly, the power to love belongs to the wise man and to him alone. How so? Says someone, for I am foolish myself, but yet I love my child. By the gods, I am surprised at you, at the very outset you have admitted that you are foolish. For something is lacking in you, what is it? Do you not use sense perception, do you not distinguish between external impressions, do you not supply the nourishment for your body that is suitable to it, and shelter, and a dwelling? How comes it, then, that you admit you are foolish? Because, by Zeus, you are frequently bewildered and disturbed by your external impressions, and overcome BV their persuasive character, and at one moment you consider these things good, and then again you consider them, though the very same, evil, and later on as neither good nor evil, and, in a word, you are subject to pain, fear, envy, turmoil, and change, that is why you are foolish, as you admit you are. And in loving are you not changeable? But as for wealth, and pleasure, and, in a word, material things, do you not consider them at one moment good, at another bad? And do you not consider the same persons at one moment good? And at another bad, and do you not at one moment feel friendly towards them, and at another unfriendly, and at one moment praise them, while at another you blame them? Yes, I am subject to exactly these emotions. What then? Do you think that the man who has been deceived about someone can be his friend? No, indeed. And can the man whose choice of a friend is subject to change show goodwill to that friend? No, neither can he. And the man who now reviles someone, and later on admires him? No, neither can he. What then? Did you never see dogs fawning on one another and playing with one another, so that you say, nothing could be more friendly? But to see what their friendship amounts to, throw a piece of meat between them and you will find out. Throw likewise between yourself and your son a small piece of land, and you will find out how much your son wants to bury you, the sooner the better, and how earnestly you pray for your son's death. Then you will change your mind again and say, what a child I have brought up. All this time he has been ready to carry me to my grave. Throw between you a pretty wench, and the old man as well as the young one falls in love with her, or, again, a bit of glory. 
And if you have to risk your life you will say what the father of Admetus did, thou joyous seeing daylight, dost suppose thy father joys not too? Do you imagine that he did not love his own child when it was small, and that he was not in agony when it had the fever, and that he did not say over and over again, if only I had the fever instead? And then, when the test comes and is upon him, just see what words he utters. Were not Aetiocles and Polyneuses born of the same mother and the same father? Had they not been brought up together, lived together, played together, slept together, many a time kissed one another? So that I fancy if anyone had seen them, he would have laughed at the philosophers for their paradoxical views on friendship. But when the throne was cast between them, like a piece of meat between the dogs, see what they say, Etio. Where before the wall dost mean to stand? Polly. Why ask thou this of me? Etio. I shall range myself against thee. Polly. Mine is also that desire. Such also are the prayers they utter. It is a general rule be not deceived that every living thing is to nothing so devoted as to its own interest. Whatever, then, appears to it to stand in the way of this interest, be it a brother, or father, or child, or loved one, or lover, the being hates, accuses, and curses it. For its nature is to love nothing so much as its own interest, this to it is father and brother and kinsman and country and God. When? For instance. We think that the gods stand in the way of our attainment of this, we revile even them, cast their statues to the ground, and burn their temples, as Alexander ordered the temples of Asclepius to be burned when his loved one died. For this reason, if a man puts together in one scale his interest and righteousness and what is honourable and country and parents and friends, they are all safe, but if he puts his interest in one scale, and in the other friends and country and kinsmen and justice itself, all these latter are lost because they are outweighed by his interest. For where one can say I and mine, to that side must the creature perforce incline, if they are in the flesh, there must the ruling power be, if they are in the moral purpose, there must it be, if they are in externals, there must it be. If, therefore, I am where my moral purpose is, then, and then only, will I be the friend and son and the father that I should be. For then this will be my interest. To keep my good faith. My self-respect, my forbearance, my abstinence, and my cooperation, and to maintain my relations with other men. But if I put what is mine in one scale, and what is honourable in the other, then the statement of Epicurus assumes strength, in which he declares that the honourable is either nothing at all, or at best only what people hold in esteem. It was through ignorance of this that the Athenians and Lacedaemonians quarrelled, and that the bands with both of them, and the great king with Greece, and the Macedonians with both of them, and in our days the Romans with the Gatai, and yet earlier than any of these, what happened at Ilium was due to this. Alexander was a guest of Menelaus, and if anyone had seen their friendly treatment of one another, he would have disbelieved any man who said they were not friends. But there was thrown in between them a morsel, a pretty woman, and to win her war arose. So now, when you see friends, or brothers, who seem to be of one mind, do not instantly make pronouncement about their friendship, not even if they swear to it, nor even if they say that they cannot be separated from one another. The ruling principle of the bad man is not to be trusted, it is insecure, incapable of judgment, a prey now to one external impression and now to another. Nay, do not make the same inquiry that most men do, asking whether two men are of the same parents, or were brought up together, or had the same school attendant, but this, and this only, where do they put their interest outside themselves, or in their moral purpose? If outside, call them not friends, any more than you would call them faithful, steadfast, courageous, or free, nay, call them not even human beings, if you are wise. For it is no judgment of human sort which makes them bite, that is revile, one another. And take to the desert, that is, to the marketplace, as wild beasts take to the mountains, and in courts of law act the part of brigands, nor is it a judgment of human sort which makes them profligates and adulterers and corruptors, nor is it any such thing which makes men guilty of any of the many other crimes which they commit against one another, it is because of one single judgment, and this alone because they put themselves and what belongs to themselves in the category of things, which lie outside the sphere of moral purpose. But if you hear these men assert that in all sincerity they believe the good to be where moral purpose lies, and where there is the right use of external impressions, then you need no longer trouble yourself as to whether they are son and father, or brothers, or have been schoolmates a long time and are comrades, but though this is the only knowledge you have concerning them, you may confidently declare them friends. Just as you may declare them faithful and upright. For where else is friendship to be found than where there is fidelity, respect, a devotion to things honourable and to naught beside?
but he has paid attention to me all these years, and did he not love me? How do you know, slave, whether he has paid attention to you just as he sponges his shoes, or curries his horse? How do you know but that, when you have lost your utility, as that of some utensil, he will throw you away like a broken plate? But she is my wife and we have lived together all these years. But how long did Eriphael live with Amphiaros, yes, and bore him children, and many of them? But a necklace came in between them. And what does a necklace signify? One's judgment about things like a necklace. That was the brutish element, that was what sundered the bond of love, what would not allow a woman to be a wife, a mother to remain a mother. So let every one of you who is eager to be a friend to somebody himself. Or to get somebody else for a friend. Eradicate these judgments, hate them, banish them from his own soul. When this is done, first of all, he will not be reviling himself, fighting with himself, repenting, tormenting himself, and, in the second place, in relation to his comrade, he will be always straightforward to one who is like him himself, while to one who is unlike he will be tolerant, gentle, kindly, forgiving, as to one who is ignorant or is making a mistake in things of the greatest importance, he will not be harsh with anybody, because he knows well the saying of Plato, that every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth. But if you fail to do this, you may do everything else that friends do drink together, and share the same tent, and sail on the same ship and you may be sons of the same parents, yes, and so may snakes. But they will never be friends and no more will you, as long as you retain these brutish and abominable judgments. Chapter 23 Of the Faculty of Expression Everyone would read with greater pleasure and ease the book that is written in the clearer characters. Therefore everyone would also listen with greater ease to those discourses that are expressed in appropriate and attractive language. We must not, therefore, say that there is no faculty of expression, for this is to speak both as an impious man and as a coward. As an impious man, because one is thereby disparaging the gifts received from God, as though one were denying the usefulness of the faculty of vision, or that of hearing, or that of speech itself. Did God give you eyes to no purpose, did he to no purpose put in them a spirit so strong and so cunningly devised that it reaches out to a great distance and fashions the forms of whatever is seen? And what messenger is so swift and so attentive as the eye? And did he to no purpose make also the intervening air so active and so intent that the vision passes through it as through some tense medium? And did he to no purpose create light, without the presence of which all else were useless? Man, be neither ungrateful for these gifts, nor yet forgetful of the better things, but for sight and hearing, yes and, by Zeus, for life itself and for what is conducive to it, for dry fruits, for wine, for olive oil, give thanks unto God, and at the same time remember that he has given you something better than all these things the faculty which can make use of them, pass judgment upon them, estimate the value of each. For what is that which, in the case of each of these faculties, shows what it is worth? Is it each faculty itself? Did you ever hear the faculty of sight say anything about itself? Or the faculty of vision? No, but they have been appointed as servants and slaves to minister to the faculty which makes use of external impressions. And if you ask, what each thing is worth, of whom do you ask? Who is to answer you? How, then? Can any other faculty be superior to this which both uses the rest as its servants? And itself passes judgment upon each several thing and pronounces upon it? For which one of them knows what it is and what it is worth? Which one of them knows when one ought to use it, and when not? What is the faculty that opens and closes the eyes, and turns them away from the things from which it should turn them, but directs them toward other things? The faculty of sight? No, but the faculty of moral purpose. What is the faculty that closes and opens the ears? What is that faculty by virtue of which men are curious and inquisitive, or again, unmoved by what is said? The faculty of hearing? No, it is none other than the faculty of moral purpose. When, then, this faculty sees that all the other faculties which surround it are blind and deaf, and unable to see anything but the very acts for which they have been appointed to serve and minister unto it, while it alone sees clearly and surveys, not only all the rest, determining what each is worth, but itself also. Is it likely to pronounce that anything else is supreme but itself? And what else can the open eye do but see? But whether it ought to see someone's wife and how, what faculty tells it? That of moral purpose. And what faculty tells a man whether he ought to believe what he has been told, or disbelieve, and, if he believes, whether he ought to be provoked by it or not? Is it not that of moral purpose? 
And this faculty of speech and of the adornment of language, if it really is a separate faculty, what else does it do, when discourse arises about some topic, but ornament and compose the words, as hairdressers do their hair? But whether it is better to speak than to keep silence, and to do so in this way, or in that, and whether this is appropriate or not appropriate, and the proper occasion and utility of each action what else tells us all this but the faculty of moral purpose? Would you? Then, have it come forward and condemn itself? What then, says an objector, if the matter stands like this, and it is possible for that which serves to be superior to what it serves the horse to the rider, or the dog to the hunter, or his instrument to the harper, or his servants to the king? Well, what faculty is it that uses the services of the rest in this way? Moral purpose. What is it that attends to everything? Moral purpose. What is it that destroys the whole man, sometimes by hunger, sometimes by a noose, sometimes by hurling him over a cliff? Moral purpose. Is there, then, anything stronger than this among men? Yet how can the things that are subject to hindrance be stronger than that which is unhindered? What are by their very nature capable of hindering the faculty of vision? Both moral purpose and things that lie outside its sphere. The same hinder vision, and so it is also with speech. But what is by its very nature capable of hindering moral purpose? Nothing that lies outside its sphere, but only itself when perverted. For this reason moral purpose becomes the only vice, or the only virtue. Therefore, since it is so great a faculty and has been set over everything else, let it come before us and say that the flesh is of all things the most excellent. Nay, even if the flesh itself called itself most excellent, one would not have tolerated such a statement. But now what is it, Epicurus, that makes such a declaration? That composed the treatise on the end, or the physics, or on the standard. That caused you to let your beard grow long? That wrote as it was dying, we are spending what is our last and at the same time a happy day? Was it the flesh or the moral purpose? Come, do you confess that you have something superior to the flesh, and you are not insane, either? Are you, in all truth, so blind and deaf? Well, what then? Does a man despise his other faculties? Far from it. Does a man say there is no use or advancement save in the faculty of moral purpose? Far from it. That is unintelligent, impious, ungrateful towards God. Nay, he is but assigning its true value to each thing. For there is some use in an ass, but not as much as there is in an ox, there is use also in a dog, but not as much as there is in a slave, there is use also in a slave, but not as much as there is in your fellow citizens, there is use also in these, but not as much as there is in the magistrates. Yet because some things are superior we ought not to despise the use which the others give. There is a certain value also in the faculty of eloquence, but it is not as great as that of the faculty of moral purpose. When, therefore, I say this, let no one suppose that I am bidding you neglect speech, any more than I bid you neglect eyes, or ears, or hands, or feet, or dress, or shoes. But if you ask me, what, then, is the highest of all things? What shall I say? The faculty of eloquence? I cannot, but rather that of moral purpose when it becomes a right moral purpose. For it is this which uses not only that faculty of eloquence but also all the other faculties both small and great, when this has been set right a man becomes good, when it has failed a man becomes bad, it is through this that we are unfortunate, and are fortunate, blame one another, and are pleased with one another, in a word, it is this which, when ignored, produces wretchedness. But when attended to produces happiness. But to do away with the faculty of eloquence and to say that in all truth it is nothing is the act not merely of a man ungrateful to those who have given it, but also cowardly. For such a person seems to me to be afraid that, if there really is a faculty of this kind, we may not be able to despise it. Such also are those who assert that there is no difference between beauty and ugliness. What? Could a man be affected in the same way by the sight of the recites and that of Achilles? Or by the sight of Helen and that of some ordinary woman? But these are the notions of foolish and boorish persons who do not know the nature of each several thing, but are afraid that if a man notices the superiority of the faculty in question he will immediately be carried away by it and come off worsted. Nay, the great thing is this, to leave each in the possession of his own proper faculty, and, so leaving him, to observe the value of the faculty. And to learn what is the highest of all things. And in every everything to pursue after this, to be zealous about this, treating all other things as of secondary value in comparison with it, though without neglecting these, as far as this is possible.
For we must take care of our eyes too, yet not as the highest thing, but we must take care of them for the sake of the highest, because this latter will not have its natural perfection unless it uses the eyes with reason and chooses one thing instead of another. What, then, generally takes place? Men act like a traveller on the way to his own country who stops at an excellent inn, and, since the inn pleases him, stays there. Man, you have forgotten your purpose, you were not travelling to this but through it. But this is a fine inn. And how many other inns are fine, and how many meadows yet simply for passing through. But your purpose is the other thing, to return to your country, to relieve the fear of your kinsmen, to do the duties of a citizen yourself. To marry. Bring up children, hold the customary offices. For you did not come into the world to select unusually fine places, I ween, but to live and go about your business in the place where you were born and were enrolled as a citizen. Something like this takes place also in the matter which we are considering. Since a man must advance to perfection through the spoken word and such instruction as you receive here, and must purify his own moral purpose and correct the faculty which makes use of external impressions, and since the instruction must necessarily be given by means of certain principles, and in a particular style, and with a certain variety and impressiveness in the form of these principles, some persons are captivated by all these things and stay where they are, one is captivated by style, another by syllogisms, another by arguments with equivocal premises, another by some other in of that sort. And staying there they moulder away as though they were among the sirens. Man, your purpose was to make yourself competent to use conformably with nature the external impressions that came to you, in desire not to fail in what you would attain, and in avoidance not to fall into what you would avoid, never suffering misfortune, never ill fortune, free, unhindered, unconstrained, conforming to the governance of Zeus, obeying this, well satisfied with this, blaming no one, charging no one, able to say with your whole heart the verses, beginning, lead thou. Me on, O Zeus, and destiny. And then, although you have this purpose, because some petty trick of style, or certain principles, catch your fancy, are you going to stay just where you are and choose to dwell there, forgetful of the things at home and saying this is fine? Well, who says that it is not fine? But only like a passageway, like an inn. For what is to prevent a man having the eloquence of Demosthenes and yet being unhappy? And what is to prevent him from analyzing syllogisms like Chrysippus? and yet being wretched, from sorrowing, envying, in a word, from being disturbed and miserable. Absolutely nothing. You see, then, that these were ends of no value, while your purpose was something else. When I speak thus to some people they think that I am disparaging the study of rhetoric or that of general principles. Yet I am not disparaging this, but only the habit of dwelling unceasingly on these matters and setting one's hopes in them. If a man does his hearers harm by presenting this view, set me down too as one of those who work harm. But when I see that one thing is highest and supreme, I cannot say the same of something else, in order to gratify you, my hearers. Chapter 24. To one of those whom he did not deem worthy. Someone said to him, I have often come to you, wishing to hear you and you have never given me an answer, and now, if it be possible, I beg you to say something to me. He answered, Do you think that, just as in anything else there is an art, so there is also an art in speaking, and that he who has this art will speak with skill? While he who does not have it will speak without skill? I do. Then he who by speaking benefits himself and is able to benefit others would be speaking with skill, while he who confers injury rather than benefit would be without skill in this art of speaking. You would find that some are injured and others benefited. And are all those who hear benefited by what they hear, or would you find that of them too some are benefited but others injured? Yes, that is true of them also, he said. Then in this case too are all those that show skill in listening benefited, but all those that do not show such skill are injured? He agreed. Is there, therefore, also a certain skill in listening, just as there is in speaking? So it seems. But, if you please, look at the matter from this angle also, whose part do you think it is to handle an instrument musically? The musicians. Very well, and whose part does it appear to you to be to make a statue properly? The sculptors. Does it appear to you to require no art to look at a statue with skill? This also requires art. If, then, to speak as one ought is the part of a skilled person, do you see that to hear with benefit to himself is also the part of the skilled person? Now as for perfection and benefit, if you please, let us drop the consideration of them for the present, since both of us are far removed from anything of that sort, but this I think everyone would admit, that the man who is going to listen to the philosophers needs at least a certain amount of practice in listening. Is it not so? 
What, then, shall I talk to you about? Tell me. What are you capable of hearing about? About things good and evil? Good and evil for what? Do you mean for a horse? No. Well then, for an ox? No. What then? For a man? Yes. Do we know, then, what a man is? What his nature is, what the concept of man is? And have we ears that are to any degree open with regard to this? Nay, have you a conception of what nature is, or can you in any measure follow me when I speak? But shall I use a demonstration for you? How can I? For do you really understand what a proof is, or how anything is demonstrated, or by what means? Or what things resemble demonstration, but are not demonstration? Do you know, for instance, what is true, or what is false, what follows what, what contradicts, or is out of agreement, or out of harmony with what? But am I to interest you in philosophy? How shall I set before you the contradiction in the ideas of the multitude, which leads them to disagree about things good and evil, advantageous and disadvantageous, when you do not know what contradiction itself is? Show me, then, what I shall accomplish by a discussion with you. Arouse in me an eagerness for it. Just as suitable grass when shown to the sheep arouses in it an eagerness to eat. Whereas if you set before it a stone or a loaf of bread, it will not be moved to eat, so we have certain moments of natural eagerness for speech also, when the suitable hearer appears, and when he himself stimulates us. But when the would-be hearer by our side is like a stone, or grass, how can he arouse desire in the breast of a man? Does the vine say to the husbandman, pay attention to me? Nay, but the vine by its very appearance shows that it will profit him to pay attention to it, and so invites him to devote his attention. Who is not tempted by attractive and wide-awake children to join their sports, and crawl on all fours with them, and talk baby talk with them? But who is eager to play with an ass, or to join its braying? For however small it may be, it is still nothing but a little ass. Why, then, have you nothing to say to me? There is only one thing I can say to you that the man who does not know who he is, and what he is born for, and what sort of a world this is that he exists in, and whom he shares it with, and does not know what the good things are and what are the evil, what the noble and what the base, and is unable to follow either reason or demonstration, or what is true and what is false, and cannot distinguish one from the other, and will manifest neither desire, nor aversion, nor choice, nor purpose in accordance with nature, will not assent, will not dissent, will not withhold judgment such a man, to sum it all up, will go about deaf and blind, thinking that he is somebody, when he real is nobody. What I do you think that this is something new? Has it not been true from the time when the human race began to be, that every mistake and every misfortune has been due to this kind of ignorance? Why did Agamemnon and Achilles quarrel? Was it not because they did not know what things are expedient and what are inexpedient? Does not one of them say that it is expedient to give Chrysace back to her father, while the other says that it is not expedient? Does not one of them say that he ought to get some other man's meed of honour, while the other says that he ought not? Is it not true that this made them forget who they were and what they had come for? Ho, oh, there, man, what have you come for? To get sweethearts or to fight? To fight with whom? The Trojans or the Greeks? The Trojans? Well, then, are you turning your back on Hector and drawing your sword against your own king? As for you, O best of men, are you turning your back on your duties as king, who has the charge of nations and sustained such mighty cares? And for the sake of a paltry damsel engage in a fist fight with the greatest warrior among your allies, a man whom you ought to honour and protect in every way? And do you sink below the level of an elegant high priest who treats the noble gladiators with all respect? Do you see the sort of thing that ignorance of what is expedient leads to? But I too am rich. You are not, then, richer than Agamemnon, are you? But I am also handsome. You are not, then, handsomer than Achilles, are you? But I have also a fine head of hair. And did not Achilles have a finer, and golden hair, too? And did he not comb it elegantly and dress it up? But I am also strong. You are not, then, able to lift as large a stone as Hector or Ias lifted, are you? But I am also noble-born. Your mother is not a goddess, is she, or your father of the seed of Zeus? What good, then, does all this do him when he sits in tears about the damsel? But I am an orator. And was not he? Do you not observe how he has dealt with Odysseus and Phoenix? The most skillful of the Greeks in eloquence, how he stopped their mouths. This is all I have to say to you, and even for this I have no heart. 
Why so? Because you have not stimulated me. For what is there in you that I may look at and be stimulated, as experts in horseflesh are stimulated when they see thoroughbred horses? At your poultry body? But you make it ugly by the shape which you give to it. At your clothes? There is something too luxurious about them, also. At your air, at your countenance? I have nothing to look at. When you wish to hear a philosopher, do not ask him, have you nothing to say to me? But only show yourself capable of hearing him, and you will see how you will stimulate the speaker. Chapter 25. How is logic necessary? When someone in his audience said, convince me that logic is necessary, he answered, do you wish me to demonstrate this to you? Yes. Well, then, must I use a demonstrative argument? And when the questioner had agreed to that, Epictetus asked him. How, then, will you know if I impose upon you? As the man had no answer to give, Epictetus said, Do you see how you yourself admit that all this instruction is necessary, if, without it, you cannot so much as know whether it is necessary or not? Chapter 26. What is the distinctive characteristic of error? Every error involves a contradiction. For since he who is in error does not wish to err, but to be right, it is clear that he is not doing what he wishes. For what does the thief wish to achieve? His own interest. Therefore, if thievery is against his interest, he is not doing what he wishes. Now every rational soul is by nature offended by contradiction, and so, as long as a man does not understand that he is involved in contradiction, there is nothing to prevent him from doing contradictory things, but when he has come to understand the contradiction, he must of necessity abandon and avoid it. Just as a bitter necessity compels a man to renounce the false when he perceives that it is false, but as long as the faucet does not appear. He assents to it as the truth. He, then, who can show to each man the contradiction which causes him to err, and can clearly bring home to him how he is not doing what he wishes, and is doing what he does not wish, is strong in argument, and at the same time effective both in encouragement and refutation. For as soon as anyone shows a man this, he will of his own accord abandon what he is doing. But so long as you do not point this out, be not surprised if he persists in his error, for he does it because he has an impression that he is right. That is why Socrates, because he trusted in this faculty, used to say, I am not in the habit of calling any other witness to what I say, but I am always satisfied with my fellow disputant, and I call for his vote and summon him as a witness, and he, though but a single person, is sufficient for me in place of all men. For Socrates knew what moves a rational soul, and that like the beam of a balance it will incline. Whether you wish or no. Point out to the rational governing faculty a contradiction and it will desist, but if you do not point it out, blame yourself rather than the man who will not be persuaded.